It's really wonderful to see everyone uh, in person and online. Uh, I'd just like to ask everybody to settle in uh, for our 2022 Arms Control Association annual meeting. We're about to get started. I am, as many of you know, Daryl Kimball, the executive director, and this is our first in-person event since 2019. And um, I know a number of us are in shock seeing other human beings, but you'll get over it. Um, and I hope you will enjoy it. We're, we're marking, of course, the Arms Control Association's 50th anniversary. A couple of program notes. Um, first of all, we're going to be asking you all to wear your masks um, while you're not uh, eating or drinking because we are a nuclear, uh, chemical, biological, uh, non-proliferation organization. We don't want any uh, uh, viruses proliferating either. Um, and uh, also, please turn off or mute your cell phones. Um, feel free to uh, uh, use social media throughout the day. We encourage that, but uh, try to, to uh, keep them quiet. Uh, we're going to get the program started today with a special video submission from a proven leader and a friend of the arms control and nonproliferation community, which is the first of several uh, today that is going to be augmenting our panel discussions and our keynote speakers today. So with that, um, please watch. Hello, and congratulations to the Arms Control Association on your 50th anniversary year. Working on arms control and nuclear weapons policy has never been easy. The details are highly technical, and the potential consequences of a miscalculation utterly catastrophic. These are issues that are rarely at the forefront of public debate and yet require constant, sustained work over years, even decades. Over the last 50 years, thanks to the determination and skill of diplomats, experts like you, and organizations like the ACA, arms control has come a long way. At times during the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union possessed roughly 30,000 nuclear weapons apiece a far cry from the much smaller stockpiles the U.S. and Russia have today. Over the decades, successive rounds of negotiations, confidence-building measures, and treaties and other agreements showed the world that progress on arms control and nuclear weapons is possible. But the challenges we face today are different from the challenges of the Cold War. Vladimir Putin's premeditated, unprovoked, unjustified, and utterly horrific war against Ukraine has had profound consequences for the security of Ukraine, for the security of Europe, and for the security of the entire world. As the United States and our allies and partners have surged support for Ukraine and imposed severe costs and consequences on the Russian Federation, Putin and senior members of his government have even threatened to use nuclear weapons against Ukraine, which would be an unthinkable escalation. The world is facing challenges related to nuclear arms well beyond Russia. The People's Republic of China has accelerated the buildup of their nuclear weapons capabilities. The DPRK has held an unprecedented number of missile launches this year. Negotiations are continuing for a mutual return to full implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran after the previous administration withdrew from that agreement. The United States continues to believe that arms control is necessary to safeguard the security of the United States, of our allies and partners, and indeed of the entire world. We continue to see arms control and deterrence as complementary and mutually reinforcing and as essential to global stability. But arms control agreements only work and work durably when both parties are taking steps to ensure mutual security. Before Putin's all-out invasion of Ukraine, the United States and Russia had held constructive meetings of the Strategic Stability Dialogue. Because of Putin's actions, we have suspended the SSD. Our last remaining nuclear arms control treaty with Russia, New START, which President Biden extended on his first day in office, will expire in 2026. It is a welcome sign that consistent with New START, Russia provided the United States with advance notice of their launch of the new Sarmat ICBM in April, ensuring that we were not taken by surprise. None of us knows what the future holds, but I know the Arms Control Association and its members 
are as deeply engaged in the difficult and vital work of finding solutions to the challenges we face today as you have always been. It will take all of us working together, government officials and diplomats, academic experts and scientists, activists and organizers to come up with new and innovative approaches to strengthen transparency and predictability, reduce risk, and forge the next generation of arms control agreements. Thank you for everything you do, and congratulations again to the ACA on this momentous anniversary. Thank you. And congratulations again to the ACA on this momentous anniversary. Thank you. Well, we're deeply appreciative to Deputy Secretary Sherman for that great um, opening for uh, the, the meeting today. I think she framed the issues, the challenges, uh, and the work that's ahead very, very well. And we, we greatly appreciate that from her. It is so good to see so many friends and colleagues once again. Um, it's really energizing uh, and inspiring and encouraging to be together as we talk about some of the most important and difficult challenges uh, we face uh, in the weapons-related security area. We gather today at uh, a difficult and dangerous time, a traumatic time in many ways. Our world faces a range of difficulties from the climate crisis, the pandemic, the epidemic of gun violence in the United States, the ongoing struggle for racial and social justice, as well as the threats to our democratic institutions. And from my perspective, we need to be mindful of all of these challenges and how they intersect and relate to how we as individuals and as a community pursue our lives and our work, and also how those of us at the Arms Control Association and in the broader arms control and nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation community seek to advance our work. And the work of the Arms Control Association, the mission of the organization, as outlined in our first newsletter in 1972, published in, in April 72, almost exactly 50 years ago, uh, as stated, is to promote support for and understanding the need for positive steps towards the limitation and elimination of armaments and other measures to reduce international tensions on the road toward world peace. And since then, the organization, working with allies and partners here in the United States and around the world, in government and in the non-governmental community, have successfully advanced many effective arms control solutions that have addressed some of the world's most dangerous weapons-related challenges, particularly nuclear weapons. <clears throat> and we can and will today uh, pause and mark and recognize and honor the accomplishments uh, of the organization and all the people who've worked for the Arms Control Association, which numbers 197 in the history of the organization, by the way. Um, but um, we also need to remember what we have ahead of us. Uh, we can't rest easy. We cannot be complacent. We cannot forget what is at stake. A great deal remains at stake. And as we start today, I think it's important to think about this meeting um, in 2022 as uh, uh, an opportunity to re rededicate ourselves to pursuing the strategies and ideas that are gonna be necessary to complete the mission uh, that the founders of the Arms Control Association uh, set out for itself back in 1972. So today's conference is designed to explore some of the big issues, uh, weapons-related peace and security challenges that we're gonna be facing, not just today or tomorrow, next week, but in the years ahead. And we hope that you will find this to be thought-provoking, inspiring, um, and uh, will stimulate uh, thinking about um, what each of you can do here in this room and out beyond in the world beyond. Um, so through the program, as we, we just noticed, uh, we'll be hearing several guest video contributions um, from special friends, uh, some people who used to be associated with the Arms Control Association, some of our, our, our friends and partners in the field. Uh, and before we begin our first panel discussion on the nuclear threat in the wake of Russia's war on Ukraine, we're gonna hear from two important allies and leaders from the other side of the world who have a unique understanding and message for the rest of us about the profound dangers and consequences 
of nuclear weapons. So once again, please watch. Greetings from Hiroshima. My name is Matsui Kazumi, and I am the mayor of Hiroshima and the president of Mayors for Peace. It gives me great pleasure to deliver this message to you on this very special occasion, the 50th anniversary of the Arms Control Association. Let me start by expressing my profound respect and heartfelt congratulations on the Association's many accomplishments over the past half a century. Your association has taken a significant role in fostering public awareness of nuclear disarmament and has led to its advancement. The current international state of affairs is extremely alarming. Russia's aggression against Ukraine brings with not only the escalated risk of the use of nuclear weapons, but also put nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament regime at risk. Systems which international society has made a tremendous effort to build. The world which humanity must strive to realize is one without nuclear weapons. Mayors for Peace is working to make this sentiment a global shared value by widely conveying the realities of the atomic bombings and the Hibakusha's desire for peace. To that end, in close partnership with our over 8,100 member cities in 166 countries and regions, we are currently doing our utmost to carry out initiatives that promote a culture of peace. In doing such, it is our sincere hope to further deepen our collaboration with your association's outreach activities for arms control and non-proliferation. We are convinced that doing so will certainly encourage national leaders to affect policy change for the abolition of nuclear weapons. I would like to take this opportunity to humbly ask you to continue to stand with us and act together for the total elimination of nuclear weapons and the realization of lasting world peace. In closing, I extend my best wishes for the further success of the Arms Control Association in the years ahead and the continued good health and prosperity of all in attendance. Thank you very much. 皆さん、こんにちは。長崎市長の田上富久です。平和市長会議の副会長として、また、被爆地長崎市民を代表して、アメリカ軍備管理協会の設立50周年を心よりお祝い申し上げます。核軍縮不拡散、軍備管理分野におけるシンクタンクとして、専門的見地からアメリカの安全保障に関する情報、分析の提供などに、長年取り組まれていることに深く敬意を表します。1945年8月9日午前11時2分、長崎の町は一発の原子爆弾により壊滅的な被害を受け、約15万人の人たちが死傷しました。かろうじて生き残った被爆者は、77年経った今なお言えることのない心と体の傷に苦しみながら、自らの体験を語り、核兵器のない世界の実現を訴え続けています。しかし、現在の核兵器をめぐる世界情勢は、ロシアによるウクライナ侵攻によって緊迫感を増しており、核兵器が再び使用されるリスクが非常に高まっています。現状に歯止めをかけ、核兵器のない世界への流れを立て直すためには、私たち市民社会の一人一人がこれまで以上に力を合わせて粘り強く声を上げることが必要です。各国政府が核兵器のない未来に向けて前向きな議論ができるよう国際世論を作ることこそが市民社会の大きな役割だと考えています。しかし市民社会には
、具体的な政策を作り上げていく力はありません。そこで、専門家の皆さんや、国連、政府などと連携することが必要になります。ダリル・ジー・キンボール会長をはじめ、アメリカ軍備管理協会の皆さんはいつも平和のために連携してくれる仲間だと思っています。長崎市は、核兵器廃絶と、世界高級平和に向けて歩み続ける決意ですので、志を同じくする力強い大切な仲間として、共に平和の輪を大きく広げていくことを心から願っています。最後に、アメリカ軍備管理協会の今後ますますのご発展を記念するとともに、私の信頼する友人であるダリル・ジー・キンボール会長をはじめ、関係者の皆様、そして、本日ご参加のすべての皆様のご検証とご多幸をお祈りして、私の挨拶といたします。Message from our two friends in Japan, and I would just note before we start our next panel that there's an important meeting happening in 2023. The G7 meeting will be held in Hiroshima, and I'm sure that will focus much more attention on the messages that Mayor Matsui and Mayor Tawe、um, have just delivered and would like to continue to deliver. So now we will begin our first session with three distinguished experts on the nuclear threat. In the wake of Russia's war on Ukraine. And we're very, very pleased to have with us Ambassador Elaine White, who is a veteran Costa Rican diplomat,、um, who is best known for serving as the president of the negotiations on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in 2017, guiding、uh, over 100 states towards the negotiation of that treaty, which will enjoy its first meeting of states' parties、uh, later this month in Vienna. Also, we have、uh, on, on the end, on the right,、uh, Professor Nina Tenwald with Brown University, who is a very accomplished scholar on nuclear matters, and she's particularly well known、uh, for her writings and, and thinking on the evolution of the taboo against nuclear weapons use, which is at the center of the discussion here in this panel. And also,、uh, we're very glad to have with us, all the way from Berlin, Germany, Oliver Meyer. Uh, who is currently the coordinator of the US German Russian Deep Cuts Commission, that is, deep cuts in nuclear arsenals,、um, and is one of Europe's leading experts on nuclear weapons issues. And I'm proud to say that Oliver was once our international representative in Europe、um, and continues to be a very close friend and, and partner. So, as we heard from、uh, Deputy Secretary of State、um, Wendy Sherman,、uh, part of Vladimir Putin's strategy to pursue a full scale War on Ukraine, as part of that, he's raised the specter of nuclear weapons use against any state that might try to interfere directly with Russia's invasion. And for those people who have not been focusing too much on the nuclear threat for the past 20 or 30 years, the war and Putin's threats are a startling reminder that although today's nuclear arsenals are smaller than they were during the height of the Cold War, they've not gone away. Nuclear deterrence still involves the threat of nuclear use. And the risks、uh, that nuclear weapons might be used might be relatively low in the, the mathematical sense, but、uh, low doesn't mean zero.、Uh, and we can see that public concern here in the United States is very high.、Uh, polls show that some eight in 10 Americans worry that the war in Ukraine could expand to other countries, which it could, that US forces might get involved in the fighting. And that Russia might use nuclear weapons. And President Biden's essay just two days ago in the New York Times clearly attempts to assuage those concerns, but in my view, not effectively enough. So we've got a number of questions here for our panelists to uh, unpack, uh, including you know, what is the risk of nuclear weapons use? What are the lessons that we can begin to draw? And what steps can be taken to reduce the nuclear danger now and in the years ahead? So, I'm, I'm going to、uh, start our panel discussion by asking each of our panelists some key issues and time allowing. We're going to take questions from the audience here that are on your table.、Um, the idea is for you to、uh, 
um, think about questions you might have, and my team will come and collect those towards the, uh, the end of this session and so we can factor those in. So first, I want to uh, go to Oliver Meyer. Uh, since Oliver, you traveled the longest, uh, I wanted to start <laughs> with you with uh, maybe uh, one of the most difficult questions we've all been trying to, to answer, which is in the wake of Russia's threats, Putin's threats, and as the war goes on, are we in a heightened state of alert? Why? And is the risk that Putin, uh, is there a risk that Putin might become desperate enough and use short range weapons in Ukraine, or is really the risk of a broader uh, NATO Russia war? I mean, how do you see these issues? Thanks, Daryl, and thanks for inviting me. Um, pleasure to be and an honor. We've collaborated, I think, over more than 20 years of trying to go back and uh, couldn't quite pin it down, but it's been a long time. And um, as we've heard from um, the video messages, um, the work the Arms Control Association has been doing is extremely valuable in terms of analysis and guidance, I think, also in terms of the ideas and proposals um, you put out. And um, you know, it's a guiding star, I think, for many of us in the field. So um, it's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with distinguished uh, colleagues. It's a particular pleasure um, to be here because I was able to bring my daughter along, Kira, um, who is uh, just graduating from high school um, um, this next month. Um, and um, yeah, it's a pleasure to also bring her along because um, you know this generation has a lot on its plate um, already. Um, global warming, epidemics, and um, they shouldn't need to worry about nuclear weapons use um, like we did when we graduated from high school. So um, yeah, it's, um, it's a good opportunity um, to be here um, and to discuss um, this issue. Um, coming to your question, um, I think the risk of nuclear weapons use is at least as high as it was in, over the last 30 years. Since the end of the Cold War, we can debate whether the nuclear, the Cuban Missile Crisis was more dangerous or not, but um, I think the point is that we are um, in a situation where the risk is very real and very high. Um, there are at least um, three factors um, that make it so dangerous. Um, it's the first time, I think, that we have a full-fledged invasion attack of a country um, that is coupled with very explicit um, nuclear threats um, in a way that we haven't seen before. So offensive deterrence really um, seen in practice for um, the first uh, time. This is a very long conflict, much longer than the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, that adds dangerous because the longer this war goes on, the greater the risk uh, will become, obviously. And we have a leadership in the Kremlin, unlike the past, which is very hard to read. And we don't know what's on um, Putin's uh, mind. So these three um, factors um, taken together make this extremely um, dangerous. And the core task, I think, has to be to strengthen the nuclear taboo and to prevent nuclear weapons use. I think that's the first main point. I would still think that the risk of unintentional use um, or unintentional escalation to the nuclear level of this conflict is higher than the risk of intentional use. Um, we see a development um, where um, the weapons that are being used are more capable, longer range, um, some dual use and dual capable systems, I should say, being used on the Russian side. That adds um, to risk. Um, and um, that, I think, um, makes it still more likely than the risk of intentional use that um, um, we would come to um, the first time of nuclear use over 75 years. That being said, there is a risk that nuclear weapons, that Russia might use nuclear weapons first um, intentionally. Um, there is a very strange mix of uh, um, you know, old type conventional war with very nationalistic rhetoric going on. Um, and that makes it very hard to read 
um, what's on um, Putin's mind um, when he gave his uh, declaration of war uh, speech um, on February 24th. He basically um, tried to, I was trying to look for the quote, but um, I find it in a minute, um, trying to scare off NATO intervention, um, but um, it wasn't quite clear what he meant. I think he may have also intended to deter the kind of NATO support um, that we see for Ukraine um, by uh, threatening to use nuclear weapons. So we're not quite sure where the red line is, and as the um, conflict evolves, um, he may come to conclude that it may be in his favor um, to use um, nuclear weapons. Very interesting reaction from Biden that you mentioned also two days ago and an article yesterday in the New York Times which raised the uh, possibility of, um, not only raised the possibility, as, as I understood, made the case that the U.S. might not respond um, by also using nuclear weapons to possible nuclear weapons use. I think that's the task we have to um, think about, the, uh, to raise this firewall between conventional and uh, nuclear weapons used to increase the distance between uh, conventional wars and nuclear wars. And uh, final point, maybe I'm not quite sure that the NATO summit at the end of the month will result in agreements that take us in that direction. I'm rather concerned that um, the um, linkages between conventional and nuclear deterrences may be strengthened. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. my personal lesson, we've asked about lessons, from the Ukraine war would be that um, the war has shown that um, we can support a country like Ukraine without resorting to nuclear threats. Um, and um, if I read the New York Times article yesterday, that's the direction the administration wants to move, which is um, from a nuclear arms control and disarmament perspective exactly the right direction. So I hope NATO will follow along this path and not move in an opposite direction. Yeah. All right. Thank you, a lot to think about there. Uh, Ambassador Elaine White, we, uh, we here in the United States often think that we're the center of the universe, but we're not. Uh, we think about these issues in terms of uh, people living, working in a nuclear weapon state, but uh, you and many other leaders of non-nuclear weapon states have been warning about raising the alarm bell about the risk of nuclear weapons use for a long time, uh, which is one of the very things that led to the negotiation of the treaty in the prohibition of nuclear weapons in 2017, which followed the humanitarian conferences on the impacts of nuclear weapons. I mean, how do you, and perhaps if you can, you can channel the thoughts of others in the non-nuclear weapon state world, um, you know, view Putin's nuclear threats um, in the context of this, this invasion? Um, I mean, what does it say to those countries that don't have nuclear weapons about uh, the assurances that have been given in the context of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and elsewhere, uh, and the promise to reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons. So how do you, how do you see this? Well, thank you. Hello. Good morning uh, to everybody. And let me first express my, also my congratulations to the Arms Control Association and for these 50 years of um, influence, hard work, and uh, shared objective towards a more stable and a prosperous world. Thank so you. keep on the, the good work. We are together there. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, uh, let me ask, um, uh, respond to that question in two, in two parts. We all know that the uh, non-nuclear weapon states have been uh, ringing the alarm uh, for over decades about the risk of nuclear weapons, but also have been very active in exerting leadership and agency and in trying to shape the agenda at least on five uh, different aspects. First, of, on, on the consequences of, of the use of nuclear weapons uh, based on, on, on evidence. Second, on, on the issues of risk, responsibility, and transparency in requesting in placing demands in, on the agenda and proposals and measures to reduce and eliminate the, the risk, either of accidental, unauthorized, or intentional detonations. On disarmament and on the balance, on a, on a balanced and just nuclear order. 
and means on the balanced implementation of the three pillars of the, of the NPT. Um, on the necessity, on the need to, um, to move towards nuclear disarmament, as has been the political, because of the uh, legal, political and humanitarian imperatives, but also because it is the political, uh, the political commitment uh, by the great powers, and we have taken the word, we have taken the word um, as a serious commitment, so we have expected for over um, many decades to see that political commitment and legal commitment become a reality, as is the case because legal obligations are for all of us in the international community to comply with. But uh, very importantly also the non-nuclear weapon states have been very strong in demanding the unequivocal and legally binding, binding uh, assurances by, non, by nuclear weapon states not to use or threat to use um, such weapons. Those assurances have been viewed by, by the non-nuclear states as one of the major requirements for achieving an adequate, adequate balance between our obligations and the obligations of uh, nuclear weapon states. The rules-based international order is definitely based on the reality that um, the rules are, are for us, for everybody to comply with. And I would like to reiterate in this moment in, in view of the second part of my, uh, my, my answer, the request by, uh, very specific request, request and demands from my own region, from Latin America, uh, uh, whose countries at the highest level of heads of state and government have um, reiterated uh, the call um, towards the negotiation and adoption <laughs> of universal and legally binding instruments on negative security assurances, but also on the need to withdraw the interpretive, interpretative uh, declarations from the protocols of the, of the Tlatelolco uh, Treaty. Notwithstanding the, uh, the, 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 the slow progress in, in meeting these demands and requests, the non-nuclear weapon states have reiterated the roadmap, institutional and legal roadmap and reiterated the, um, the status of being compliant with all um, legal obligations. And in that, with that um, legal and moral basis, requesting and demanding further steps uh, on the issue of um, nuclear disarmament. With those um, uh, background points, how do we see those threats precisely at the, moment, at the very moment leading up to the, to the invasion? First of all, they violate the legal foundations of the international system overall, not only of the Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter and the obligation to refrain uh, from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity and political in, or political independence of any state or in any other manner that is inconsistent with the UN Charter. It is also interesting, it, it looks like, to, like these threats at the moment they were issued try to somewhat limit the extent to which a member state of the United Nations can resort to the uh, inherent right to self and collective, uh, individual and collective self-defense as enshrined in Article 51 of the UN, of the UN Charter, and is a principle of international customary law. Um, but also, in, it breaches the Budapest Memorandum on security assurances uh, in connection with Ukraine's accession to the, to the NPT, and therefore weakens the credibility of that major power towards their, um, its um, security assurances, and undermines the overall aura of the purpose of the, of the NPT itself. And of course, it does undermine the sense of security of states that have uh, renounced nuclear weapons and that are in compliance with um, the obligations of um, non-proliferation and prohibition of nuclear weapons for over 
um, five decades. So it brings to the center stage uh, the discussion about the imperative of nuclear disarmament together with the discussion, the necessary discussion of the uh, security assurances for the non-nuclear weapon states as, a, as an inherent and fundamental uh, component of the equation of the nuclear, of the nuclear order. So you see a lot of problems, in other words. <laughs> um, that, that was a very thorough and good answer um, to these issues. Um, Professor Tannenwald, uh, you've literally written a book on the nuclear taboo, which I hope everybody has read at some point. I mean, Nina, let me just ask you to uh, address the question I asked Oliver, and then a another question I wanted to pitch to you. I mean, uh, the question I asked Oliver, of course, is, you know, are we in a heightened state of alert? Why? Uh, your thoughts about that? Um, but also, you know, putting this in what, what has happened over the last few weeks in historical perspective. I mean, Putin's threat wasn't the first that's ever been issued. It's not the first challenge to the nuclear taboo. I mean, how does it compare? How should we see this in historical context? Thank you, Daryl. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to be here and, and speak to this group. So yes, a little historical perspective. So during the Cold War, the US and Soviet Union uh, made nuclear threats against each other. That was a somewhat regular feature of the Cold War. After the Cold War, the patterns changed a bit. So there were actually more nuclear threats made after the end of the Cold War. This is in part because there were more nuclear armed states then. Uh, but the majority of these threats were made by India and Pakistan against each other and by the United States against countries who are perceived to be outside the international normative community as defined by the NPT, so Iraq and North Korea. So the United States actually made more nuclear threats after the end of the Cold War, although many of these were very veiled. The United States has not made nuclear threats against Russia since the end of the Cold War. Russia, however, has made nuclear threats against NATO. So that's the, the, his, the NATO countries and the West. So that is uh, the historical pattern. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, we, we consider the uh, greatest, I think, moment of nuclear danger. I do think the Cuban Missile Crisis was more dangerous than the current crisis because escalation was essentially one decision away. Right? If Khrushchev or Kennedy had made a different decision, there could have immediately been uh, uh, an escalatory uh, momentum. Uh, having said that, uh, the Ukraine war, as, as, as Oliver noted, is uh, a hot war. The, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis was, I call, uh, was, did not break out into fighting, fortunately. The Ukraine war is a hot war, and it will likely go on much longer. And in both the Cuban Missile Crisis and Ukraine, there is a, a risk of inadvertent escalation and miscalculation. And Putin has a track record of miscalculation. And so that is something that we uh, should worry about. I think the risk of nuclear use is um, low still, but it's not zero. And the longer the war goes on, the more the risk goes up. And uh, in part for arguments that people have made about if, if Putin gets backed into a corner uh, and out of frustration re reaches for a tactical nuclear weapon. So my view is that uh, the goal uh, should be to try to end the war as soon as possible. Now, uh, because I'm here to talk about norms, let me say something about um, sort of the normative status of nuclear threats. And uh, so one of the things that's really different, of course, about uh, Putin's nuclear threats is that they're um, very blatant. And as my colleagues have noted, they're being used to shield a conventional, a full-scale conventional aggression. The other thing that's different is that um, they are very explicit, and they are made every few days. Right? So over and over again, these very explicit threats. That is a very significant change from the patterns of the past, where the, fit, the threats are, tend to be very veiled over the course of the Cold War. They become very veiled. They become more subtle. And uh, there aren't so many of them in any given crisis. So that's what's quite different here. And that really ratchets up 
uh, the nuclear danger here. But let me say something about an opportunity for norm creation here, and this, uh, especially fans of the Ban Treaty may, may, may be interested in this, is that uh, one thing that the terrible atrocities of this war does, so the Russian military's terrible atrocities in Ukraine, the war crimes violations, the massive destruction of cities, um, it makes, it creates an opportunity to link uh, nuclear use to war crimes. That is, if you look at the devastation in Ukraine right now, caused by conventional weapons, it is not very difficult to imagine how much worse it would be if a nuclear weapon were used. And so there is a moment here for the norm entrepreneurs um, to, to create a narrative, to strengthen the narrative that a use of a nuclear weapon um, in a war like Ukraine would be a war crime, especially, of course, if it were used on a city. And I think that we are, you know, only a few steps away from uh, criminalizing the use of nuclear weapons. Not in law, I think that's going to take a while, but in the, in the perception, in the creation of a norm that use of nuclear weapons in most instances would be a criminal act. And as we have the discourse of war crimes in Ukraine right now, and you know, Putin is a war criminal, all that kind of stuff, you can connect that to a use of a nuclear weapon and a nuclear threat. And I think that is a, a discourse that we uh, should encourage. All right, very thought provoking. Um, <clears throat> well, as, you, as, as, as Professor Tannenwald just said, um, Unlike the Cuban Missile Crisis, this is a, a rolling crisis, um, and um, I think you said, you know, that the the risk of nuclear weapons employment may rise as this conflict goes on, uh, depending on how things go. So, I mean, with that in mind, I mean, let me let me ask you, Oliver, and then and then Ambassador White, and, and you know, if you want to jump in too. I mean, what do we need to be thinking about? What do policymakers need to be thinking about? Um, needs to be done in order to avoid the kind of escalation that could lead to the second and third level decision that, that Nina was talking about that could lead to nuclear weapons uh, use. And I would, before, before I, I um, let you answer, I mean, I would just note that if everybody saw it in President Biden's uh, guest essay in the New York Times yesterday, he reiterated quite clearly that it is not his intention for the US or NATO forces to become directly engaged with Russian forces in Ukraine. But best intentions don't always pan out in these kinds of things. So, I mean, what specifically, uh, you know, do US policymakers, NATO policymakers, Russian policymakers need to be doing to avoid that kind of, that kind of situation? I mean, from Europe, I'm sure this is top on your minds. Thanks, Daryl. Um, yeah, that's something we also discuss in the Deep Cuts Commission, as you know. Um, those of you who are not familiar with the commission um, that's been around for almost eight years now. It's a group of German, Russian, and US experts um, that um, is not only discussing the possibility of deep cuts, but also uh, looking at ways to reduce um, nuclear risks. Um, we also have a Young Deep Cuts Commission since last year. Um, two Young Deep Cuts Commission members um, are here. One is going to speak uh, later. Um, so um, that's also something that um, in the long term, because you mentioned the long term perspective, yes. I think is um, extremely important to bring um, new people into the field and um, to have this dialogue not only at the senior level, but also to bring um, new people in. And um, I can honestly say that's you know, a very energetic group of people. So um, that's a very important exercise um, to think about reducing nuclear risks. Uh, fortunately, we have funding from the German Federal Foreign Office, so um, that's, very, um, that's very useful. Um, one of the things we agree in the commission, and that I think is very important and has been mentioned before, um, is uh, finding ways to uh, replace um, New START. Um, with um, a new agreement or new agreements. That's one of the difficult questions, I think. Um, what parcels we're trying to uh, agree on in, in the context of possible talks. Um, um, I cannot really speak for all the commissioners, but I think that's one issue where, where we all, all agree on that um, both 
sides um, should uh, try to find a way back to the negotiating table in Geneva or elsewhere as quickly as uh, possible and um, um, for the reasons that most of you are aware of, not only to keep the restrictions but also to keep um, the verification and inspection regime in place, which is a way to interact um, and um, um, keep this dialogue also at a working level, which is extremely um, important. Um, so um, that's very important and it's good to hear not only Wendy Sherman this morning, but also um, uh, Bonnie Jenkins recently saying that um, the US is ready to resume talks um, at, you know, whenever, probably at least until the war, uh, when the war has ended, a peace process is underway. There are different ways of framing when that point in time um, might be. Let me just say we cannot take this view for granted. There are some in Europe, but I, I think also in Washington, who would argue that the period of arms control with Russia is over, um, that um, for the time being, and there's unspecified, um, we cannot speak uh, to Russia on this issues. Um, um, that's a very dangerous view, I think. Um, arms control is not something we do as a favor to the other side, but it's something that we all uh, profit from. And therefore, um, again, it's essential that we avoid unnecessary arms races. And one way to do that is to find a way to replace a uh, new start. And um, it's not much time, actually, even though 2026 sounds far away. Um, <coughs> We discussed a couple of other issues in the Deep Cuts Commission, um, and let me just throw out some of the ideas, uh, because we don't have so much time left, I think. Um, one of the ideas is to have a permanent channel of communication also between NATO and Russia. There are dialogues going on, but to institutionalize that, have maybe NATO-Russia Risk Reduction Center might be something uh, useful. We need more transparency on non-strategic weapons, uh, President Biden said there's no indication of Russia moving some of its non-strategic weapons in the context of the crisis, but we don't really know, and we need more transparency on that. Um, difficult to verify, of course, um, but there are um, uh, other solutions. Pavel Potvik, for example, has written a great paper also for the Deep Cuts Commission on verifying the absence of uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons and other nuclear weapons in certain locations. That would be valuable in itself. Before the war uh, broke out and Russia attacked Ukraine, um, uh, both sides, at least there was an overlap in terms of proposals um, on, on a moratorium on INF range systems in Europe or maybe uh, beyond. Um, that could be a building block um, and um, that could be uh, reconsidered uh, when uh, the strategic stability dialogue um, resumes. Um, and again, to iterate, you know, just repeat a point I made before, I think for NATO, I think it would be very important in its new strategic concept um, to um, not lower the threshold for the use of nuclear weapons also. There's no necessity to do that and moving in that direction <laughs> would be uh, very uh, difficult. And another topic that's going to come up in the NATO context and has come up is missile defenses. Yep. One of the biggest stumbling blocks for arms control um, over decades. Um, NATO right now um, has language in its uh, existing strategic concept that it will not use missile defense to target Russian strategic forces particularly. I think that's the intention. Uh, I hope that doesn't change because that will just add another uh, imperative um, for uh, increasing Russian um, strategic forces. So that's another way to build confidence and prevent unnecessary arms races. Let me stop there maybe. Yeah, and I would just note on missile defense, the Biden administration's missile defense review is still classified along with the nuclear posture review, so we still don't know. Uh, uh, the public doesn't know what the administration's view on missile defense is and how it relates to, to arms control. Um, and when does the, the NATO strategic review when is that finished? Just well, the summit is, I think, 25th and 26th. I'm not, I think right. that's, so it's, it's, uh, so it's the end of the month. So it's, it's, a, it's the first time, I think, where the nuclear posture review might follow NATO strategic concept. Um, we'll see how that plays out. All right. So um, a little earlier, Ambassador White, you were talking about the many ways in which Vladimir Putin's nuclear threats have violated uh, legal norms, including the UN Charter. Um, and 
in early March, I think it was March 2nd, there was a UN General Assembly resolution, 141 voting in favor, condemning the invasion in general. And there was a clause in there condemning the uh, decision by Putin to raise the nuclear alert levels, not the threat per se, but to raise the nuclear alert levels. So, I mean, you know, looking ahead over the next few months, also with respect to the upcoming uh, meeting of states parties of the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons on the or what, June 21 to 23, and then the nuclear non-proliferation treaty review conference beginning August 1, these opportunities, I mean, how can the international community, which of course is not some vague thing, it's actual people, it's actual governments, I mean, how can these leaders respond to this unprecedented situation, you know, or is that, that clause and that resolution going to be enough to send the message to Vladimir Putin that this is not something we should be doing? I mean, what, what are your thoughts about what can be done as a practitioner? What, what's the menu that you would, you would offer? Yes, this is, this is a very, of course, unprecedented um, moment. Uh, is, it is creating a dangerous uh, momentum and situation and a sentiment that it is much more dangerous to be a non-nuclear weapon state um, in terms of the, of the um, powerlessness, um, the feeling of powerlessness and the misperception in some, in some publics. For instance, there has been a lot of discussion about the, um, the, uh, the fact that Ukraine um, became a non-nuclear weapon state as in, in being portrayed as, as a as a historic mistake, and that this is something that we, uh, we think is a matter of, of concern. So, um, going back to the first to the to the normative, because I think it is fundamental to start with the with how we frame um, the the behavior of states in the international community. The uh, the resolution 11.1 uh, does provide the legal the legal framework. Uh, that very clearly specifies the uh, illegality and unlawfulness of, of all these um, of all these situations. So that aspect is um, is somewhat covered, and in the sense that also it is um, very clearly also recognizing the the sovereignty and, and political independence and territorial integrity of Ukraine within the international recognized internationally recognized borders, uh, but also the call to the resolution of the, of the crisis um, and uh, of this war by, by peaceful means. So that, that aspect is, is, um, is covered, but we need to ask ourselves how the, the different types of uh, countries in the international community are going to do damage control and take damage control measures uh, that's been done for by for uh, to the international to the international system uh, above all and in that case um, I strongly believe that the non-nuclear weapon states are going to continue with the path of, of, of compliance with uh, legal obligations and there is going to be an increased um, uh, commitment towards the um, signing and ratification of the treaty on the uh, on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, and then I, hopefully we are going to have a very successful uh, first meeting of state parties that is going to undertake, um, and most probably uh, we are going to see many expressions of the unequivocal uh, commitment and towards the reinforcement of, of uh, the legal obligations towards non-proliferation and disarmament overall and the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Um, but also, we need to, um, this moment in time, we are also to expect a agency leadership and restraint on the, on the, on the part of the, of the nuclear powers. And of course, many of the, of the statements um, in the media in the last days by President um, Biden um, and other officials are welcome in the sense of, of um, receiving this signal of restraint and uh, thoughtful consideration of every single step uh, in behaving in this, in this situation. Too. Because above all, the, uh, what, we, it, what it is difficult to understand from the nuclear deterrence uh, uh, doctrine is that 
in this linear, suppose linear uh, steps that follow escalation and potential nuclear use, what you want, when you ask yourself is where is human agency, where is a human and political leadership? In as the one that we saw, for instance, in the Cuban Missile, missile Crisis in the, in the 60s. So in this time and age, we also see and expect the same kind of agency, a rational behavior, restraint, and leadership in terms of uh, increasing the nuclear taboo, um, taking on board arms control uh, measures and initiatives uh, with all the, with all the, um, the, the, the components, the important components of, of, um, of, the, of, the, of the agenda that you have been mentioning, but also it is central to include in this uh, conversation, global conversation about the, the problem and the risk of nuclear weapons, what exact responses are going to be given to the increasing concerns of the non-nuclear weapon states and, and our security. And this is something that cannot be undermined in the agenda. And, and there is going to be definitely a call to increase the level of, of relevance of, this, of the nuclear security assurances. And of course, a call, a very strong call towards uh, nuclear disarmament overall, specific uh, measures for, uh, towards uh, risk management and reduction, transparency measures that also allow the rest of the international community to know exactly where we stand and what actions and responsible and accountability actions we can expect on the side of, of the nuclear weapon states um, in terms of, of their, their response and uh, their, uh, as, as you have also put it, their message and their communication to the rest of the world and to the next generations. Um, there are also concerns about other global, global issues that need to be resolved at the moment. There also, and this is something that we also have to think about, uh, the nuclear problem also in a, systemic, in a systemic manner, which also means that this international system has to sort out many different uh, global problems. And this crisis, as serious as it is, should not be distracting the international community from addressing the other uh, problems, the, um, decarbonization of the economy, uh, public health, global public health. Those are the issues that needed to be discussed and make progress in 2022. And there is, there is also the need to keep a balanced uh, approach towards the global agenda in the international system. So we, did not, we, do, we do need uh, to uh, not let ourselves be completely uh, taking ourselves off the track of making, uh, of reviving international corporations to solve the, the problems of, um, of uh, humanity mm -hmm. in global, uh, global cooperation to deal with the problems of humanity. A very rational and reasonable approach from uh, Costa Rica, which of course does not have nuclear weapons, a standing army, and um, so good advice. <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Nina Tenwald a question that is, is, is graduate school or above level because she can handle it, but it's, it's a question that comes up here. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ambassador White talked about how the Ukraine's history has led some to think that, well, Ukraine's problem now is due to the fact that it um, became a non-nuclear weapon state. Um, and of course, there are other nuclear uh, flashpoints around the world other than uh, Ukraine and Europe right now. So, I mean, looking more broadly, um, I mean, how, uh, Nina, do you think, what, what do we need to be thinking about to, 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 that needs to be done? Um, how is this crisis going to affect the, uh, the nuclear proliferation and nuclear use scenarios in other places, South Asia, Northeast Asia? Um, I mean, how do we reinforce the taboo in the years ahead in the wake of this in these other 
places. So I mean, if you could try to do that briefly, because I want to get to some of the questions from the audience. So that's why I said it was a, a tough question. <laughs> OK, very briefly. So I mean, obviously, the taboo, the nuclear taboo, is, is simply uh, one of the important norms in the global nuclear normative order. Uh, there are other important norms. And these are all under threat today, as you note, so nonproliferation disarmament and deterrence. I would define deterrence as a norm because a deterrence as opposed to war fighting with nuclear weapons and stable deterrence needs to be embedded in shared norms and institutions for it to be stable. So all of these norms are under threat. I think you're right. There are, there are other flashpoints. So we have uh, a looming arms race in East Asia. We have North Korea engaging in testing. So the testing norm uh, is under challenge. Uh, and we have um, uh, a situation in India and Pakistan where there seems to be, after the uh, 2019 Pawama crisis, a, a, a greater uh, willingness to uh, engage in the manipulation of risk uh, and to cross thresholds. And India and Pakistan have no real security dialogues going. So uh, there's a whole bunch of other areas in which um, nuclear use, uh, war, or uh, an escalation to nuclear use could happen. I mean, before the Ukraine crisis, I thought it was India and Pakistan. Uh, so what can we do? Let me just say uh, just a couple things about the nuclear taboo. Uh, I would like to see a lot more taboo talk in this war. Uh, taboo talk, by, the, by that I mean uh, references to the 77-year tradition of non-use, that there's a nuclear taboo, that violating it would be terrible. And what, you know, we have a lot of news articles about would Putin use a nuclear weapon, people speculating and thinking about the war gaming of that. Uh, somebody has to do that, but there's a way in which that, those repeated kinds of articles have a kind of goading effect in my view, right? If you, Putin were really manly and tough, he might just do this. Right? That's not what we want. So I thought that Biden's uh, New York Times article and uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg's comments the other day at the news conference where, he's, where he reminded Putin that uh, Russia had joined the P5 statement, uh, reiterating the Reagan-Gorbachev statement that nuclear war cannot be won and should never be fought. There should be much, much more of that. That should be the first response to any reporter's questions, is that Putin has committed himself to this, reiterated this. We know it's terrible, right? that kind of taboo talk. But more generally, obviously, uh, nonproliferation norms are are going to be under threat. And I think here that the, um, it very much depends on how the war uh, turns out. So if Ukraine basically survives the war, it is not dismembered, uh, then I think uh, the states might conclude that uh, one can uh, respond to this kind of aggression effectively with conventional weapons. If Ukraine, if Ukraine is totally dismembered and broken up and Russia takes it over, then I think states may likely interpret this, the, the, interpret this lesson that, that they need nuclear weapons. And of course, this is especially going to affect Japan and South Korea, right, where we already see pressures. We already see um, you know, statements. Um, there's conservative support for acquisition of nuclear weapons in both um, South Korea and Japan. So. Uh, I think the primary goal of US policy toward these regions has to be to prevent war. And it requires a dialogue between, among the East Asian countries, Japan, South Korea, North Korea. Uh, I do not think North Korea is going to become denuclearized anytime soon. That needs to be a long-term goal. But the emphasis needs to be on the, the unacceptability of war. US policy should be to prevent war in East Asia to prevent war in India and Pakistan. Uh, that has to be the primary goal. So we do not want new tactical nuclear weapons deployed in Asia or in Europe. There should be a new norm. We can establish a norm. No new deployments. That would be going in the wrong direction. Rather, uh, the discussions with the allies should be about uh, political and military cohesion, political support, that is more important, with an emphasis on diplomacy. But we need to reinforce the, the taboo. We need to stigmatize nuclear threats. And one thing, I'll, this is my last point, one thing is that when you have a blatant violation of a norm like Putin is doing now with these, these blatant nuclear threats, 
it creates an opportunity to strengthen the norm, that everybody can see how horrible and how inappropriate and how irresponsible this is. And that provides an opportunity to then strengthen the norm and to stigmatize it. So there may be political support in the General Assembly, for example, to pass resolutions or in other forms, right? To, to, to up the talk, the discourse about the unacceptability of nuclear threats and stigmatizing leaders who make those kinds of threats. So w one question that is coming from the, the audience, uh, Nina, that relates to norms, and I want to ask you to just address this directly, um, uh, is that, as you just said, Vladimir Putin doesn't care about certain international norms. Uh, he's shown that he's ordered his forces to do things that violate certain other norms. So I mean, w we keep talking here about the need to reinforce the nuclear taboo. Um, uh, there has been a nuclear taboo for 77 years. What you know, makes us think that this uh, can be effective? Or maybe what the audience might be mishearing is that, I mean, this isn't the only solution here to preventing nuclear use. But I mean, how do you respond to the, to, to, the, to the question, well, norms don't matter with a guy who doesn't care? So that's a, that's a great question. And obviously, when you look at all the discourse, the genocide discourse, um, in Ukraine, I mean, the, 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 the atrocities and so on, and some of the genocide discourse coming out of Russia, you can easily think, well, someone, you know, a, a leader who's willing to carry out genocide might not be inhibited uh, about using a nuclear weapon. So that is, that is a concern, and that's something we, we should be concerned about. At the same time, uh, I think that Putin knows, and Putin's generals know and his military know that use of a nuclear weapon by Putin would be a disaster. I mean, he would, he would become an instant pariah uh, and there would be global opprobrium and widespread condemn condemnation. It would not benefit Russia. And, uh, and so all those, Putin knows that, you know, Russian, Russian leaders, elites know that it would be a disaster and it would leave it would not benefit Russia, it would leave Russia worse off. And those points also we can continue to make uh, to Russia. Um, those points should, you know, those should be part of the talking points that reminding Putin why there is, would be no good outcome from using nuclear weapons. All right, we have a couple other questions here. I wanna, I wanna pitch these to our other panelists here. Um, maybe this is for Oliver. I mean, we have a couple of questions about um, what specific actions and scenarios might lead to intentional or unintentional nuclear use in the context of the ongoing war in Ukraine? Um, I mean, uh, so one question is, uh, why would, um, why would um, Putin potentially use nuclear weapons in a conflict with NATO? I mean, what does the, the Russian nuclear policy actually say? Um, and We've heard U.S. intelligence officials say that so far Russia has not removed its tactical nuclear weapons from central storage, but is there any risk that uh, there might be some loss of Russian operational control of, uh, by, by Putin, that is, uh, and some, someone lower on the chain might decide to use these weapons? How would you respond quickly to those two questions? Well, let me first take uh, Nina's advice and um, point out um, that um, you know, this would be um, a totally irresponsible course of action. Um, and um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm worried and actually sometimes a bit frightened um, by um, the certainty by which, uh, with which some pundits and also some analysts put aside nuclear risks, and more so than in the beginning of the war, I think, um, at least in, in Europe and in Germany, but I think also here, um, there are um, a number of pieces now which uh, basically say, well, you know, we've managed this for three months now. Um, we can be pretty sure that uh, we've got this under control, um, either making the argument that Putin is a rational actor um, and will not use this because he must fear the consequences and nuclear weapons will have little military use, um, or because he's so irrational that no matter what we do, 
and what our support for Ukraine is. It will not affect Russian nuclear thinking anyway. So this kind of overdetermined argument here um, that makes it very difficult mm -hmm. uh, to counter. But the risks um, are real. Yeah, I mean, there are um, um, a range of scenarios um, where um, it might uh, appear to the Russian leadership um, to um, improve their position the most discussed scenarios, of course, that if the war um, continues to go against um, Russia and um, we don't know where it's going. I mean, let's just reemphasize that point. You know, there's a great deal of uncertainty and speculation here, uh, but he might hope to turn the tide by demonstrating um, a resolve by either testing or maybe even um, 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 demonstrating nuclear use um, either militarily or over some unpopulated area or something like that. Um, I think, you know, the, the response that was outlined in the New York Times article makes clear that even in such a scenario, there are ways to, to strengthen the taboo without resuming to, to nuclear use. Unintentional um, use, I mean, we've seen um, military action in the west of Ukraine with long-range systems, um, attacks against Lviv um, and yeah. other um, cities that are far removed with long-range systems. If these go off target, I think you know one of the uses uh, was I think all, almost on the same day that an Indian cruise missile accidentally veered into Pakistan. It's not difficult to imagine um, uh, similar things going on, particularly if they're dual-capable systems and you don't know uh, what kind of system is coming coming away. We've seen a sinking of the Moskva. Um, a major battleship, um, imagine that going the other way and an accidental ship sinking of, of a U.S. Uh, battleship um, in the Black Sea. I mean, there are scenarios where you think, you know, things can get, can get quickly out of it, particularly because the Russian signaling is, is extremely confusing. You've seen a statement, I think, on the same day, actually, by the Russian ambassador in in London excluding the possibility of use of non-strategic weapons. At the same time, you have members of the Russian Duma ranting about uh, using nuclear weapons on Germany and other countries. Um, presumably, they're not doing this just in their own capacity. So this also makes it extremely dangerous because we have not this tradition of uh, it's very difficult to read nuclear signals um, coming from Russia at the moment. All right, uh, dangerous times, as we said. Um, I'm going to ask one question of each of you, and I'd like to ask you to answer briefly because we're running out of time. And then we've got one final question I'm going to answer in 15 seconds uh, before we go. To, we shift to the next part of our program. So um, we've often been told that we should, you know, uh, nuclear weapons use is unthinkable, but we're thinking about it. Um, how would each of you recommend to? Jens Stoltenberg or Joe Biden, how he should respond if there were nuclear weapons use by Russia in Ukraine uh, or a demonstration test, or if Russia used nuclear weapons first in a conflict with NATO. Um, uh, and keeping in mind, of course, that if Russia used nuclear weapons against NATO, there's a high risk that we're going to have, uh, and if there's retaliation with nuclear weapons, escalation. So, Nina Tenwald, what would you say to the president? Well, I think uh, he's already made what I think is the correct decision, which is that retaliation should not be in kind, so that the U.S. has overwhelming conventional superiority and can respond conventionally. And if we're trying to maintain a norm here, right, or we're trying to maintain the, a taboo, and we don't want to engage in the behavior we're trying to stigmatize. And there's a parallel here with chemical weapons. So if, if Russia used chemical weapons in Ukraine, the United States would not respond with a chemical strike. We'd respond conventionally. And so, so we should respond um, with, with overwhelming conventional force. But there are lots of things that we could do. Oliver. I absolutely agree. In addition, I think, you know, immediately go to the UN and um, try to um, get an agreement first in the Security Council and then there's this now new way to move directly to the General Assembly if there's a Russian veto uh, to make sure that Russia is not only a rogue state but a pariah state. Um, and um, well, it would be very difficult even for the 35 states that supported Russia on March 2nd 
um, to support Russia in that instance. So you would isolate Russia um, also at a, at a global level, and that would be, I think, also another way of, of uh, strengthening uh, the norm and, um, and making clear that this is um, totally unacceptable. Ambassador White? I would tell them on behalf of most citizens of the world uh, to have a very wide and solid uh, op basket of options of non-nuclear responses to um, any such scenario. We know that that, uh, that planning has been, uh, planning, sorry, that consideration, that reflection has been, has been made, so reiterating the, the need to resort to as many um, uh, as possible uh, legal uh, measures that are non-nuclear responses. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we have one other question. I'm going to try to answer it very quickly, and then um, we're going to close. Um, one question that's come up. Uh, it was referred to uh, by Wendy Sherman, the expiration of the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty on February 5, 2026. All of you mentioned this too. The question is, what are the chances uh, for deeper cuts in strategic nuclear weapons now, given the situation, the expiration of New START? That's actually a very good question for Assistant Secretary of State Mallory Stewart, who's going to be our keynote speaker. But um, I would just note um, that we have been living for 50 years with some kind of US, Soviet, Russian uh, bilateral arms control agreement, the first one um, negotiated by the man who would become a board member of the Arms Control Association, Gerard Smith. Uh, it was concluded on May 26, 1972. Mm -hmm. So we, none of us really here, except for a, a few distinguished individuals here, have been living in a world without bilateral arms control. And it would be, it's difficult to see uh, how it gets any better without it. So I think it remains in the interest of the US and Russia to find a way to maintain, at the very least, the limits established by New START. There are multiple ways to do this, formal negotiated agreements, which look unlikely at the moment, uh, but also uh, unilateral reciprocal measures uh, to respect the central limits of New START. So I hope uh, the team at the State Department, the White House, and in Russia are thinking hard about this and considering what's at stake. But um, we are out of time for this first panel discussion. Before we move on, I want to thank our panelists for taking on some really tough issues. Uh, this has been, for me, an enriching discussion. I hope you all agree. So please thank me, or join me, in thanking uh, Ambassador White, Oliver Meyer, and Nina Tanawal. And we are going to have another guest video right now um, uh, before we shift over to our next session. Um, so uh, please take a look at that as we make our transition. Thank you. Congratulations and thanks. Congratulations and thanks to Daryl and his colleagues and the board of the Arms Control Association for 50 years of great service. So I first came to ACA uh, as an intern, fresh out of college, uh, straight from, from Tufts to, to DC. Um, and it was uh, the most incredible introductory experience to the nuclear, nuclear policy field uh, that I could have ever imagined. Um, and I, I loved it so much. Uh, I came back for more uh, after briefly leaving for the Brookings Institution. Uh, I, I came back as soon as I could uh, to the Open Research Assistant position uh, at ECA. Arms control is like speed limits on highways. They reduce the probability and the death and destruction of collisions. It's like an open hand reached out for a shake rather than a fist drawn back for a punch. And it's like an all clear bell after an alarm at school, letting us know that the worst fears are not going to be realized today. It's good for people, but not glamorous, not muscular, not enriching, and not sexy, but really good for people. What is so incredible to, to me about ACA, uh, and I know that countless people can speak to ACA's uh, policy impact and the real difference that the work of the staff have made on, on making the world a better place. 
Um, but what, what's really, I think, uh, strikes me about ACA is the potential to shape the next generation of leaders uh, on arms control and, and nuclear policy. Um, this is something I witnessed, you know, firsthand as someone who was introduced to the field through ACA. Uh, I learned an enormous amount. I often say, you know, ACA was my master's degree uh, in nuclear policy. Uh, most of what I learned on nuclear policy was from ACA, as well as, you know, not just the facts and figures, but really how to make a difference. Um, and looking around uh, at, at my colleagues, interns and research assistants who were at ACA uh, with me when I was there, uh, I think it's really cool to see where we've, we've all gone from, you know, the International Atomic Energy Agency to the State Department uh, to, to Congress. Um, so I think it's just a, a really unique and special uh, launching pad to, to train the next generation of, of hopefully leaders in the field. The Arms Control Association for 50 years has been the go-to source of information, analysis, and advocacy about arms control. If the Arms Control Association didn't exist, it would be missed and then reinvented because civilization needs arms control and arms control needs the Arms Control Association. Um, I mean, I think I, I would really go back to to how it has developed and, and shaped uh, young people for generations to come um, to, to make a difference. I think ACA is really uh, unique as a, a think tank, but also an advocacy organization in Washington, DC that cares uh, you know, just as much about getting the most uh, accurate and uh, comprehensive information uh, and, and policy information out there. Uh, as you know, how much it cares about really changing things uh, and making the world a better and safer place. Uh, and I think the you know, no matter what you know, specific nuclear policy issue it's working on for ACA, it's the combination of uh, you know, hard hitting facts uh, with uh, real advocacy to make a difference uh, that makes it stand out. I mean, what, what a remarkable legacy of 50 years uh, as, you know, as a relative newcomer to the field, I feel like I don't have, uh, you know, much of a place to, to speak to the entire history of ACA. Um, but, you know, just, uh, of course, congratulations to the entire team. Uh, you know, I think that's something else that's really special about ACA is uh, not only the work that's done, but also the people who do it. Um, and as someone again, who, who entered the field through ACA, I couldn't have asked for a better team of um, role models and mentors uh, that I still, you know, look up to immensely. Um, and so, you know, to everyone who I worked with and maybe who I didn't work with, um, yeah, just huge congratulations. And I hope you take some time to, to celebrate uh, this moment. Congratulations to the Arms Control Association on 50 years of hard work in the public interest.
We're about to get started. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kelsey Davenport, and I'm the Director for Nonproliferation Policy at the Arms Control Association. Thank you so much for joining us today for our annual meeting and our 50th anniversary celebration. Uh, personally, I hope we can put the Arms Control Association out of business so we don't have to come back to celebrate the 100th anniversary, uh, but, but we'll see. Uh, and it really is this question of sort of looking to the future that's guiding today's panel topic, restoring nonproliferation and disarmament guardrails. And for the next hour, we're going to look at future challenges to the broader nonproliferation and disarmament regime uh, and really see how the NPT and its related instruments can respond to those challenges to meet the array of nuclear threats that we're seeing. Uh, because really, if we look at the regime writ large, you know, we're facing a complex array of challenges. From a rise in nuclear threats that we heard about in the last panel, uh, concern about the emergence of new nuclear states, uh, and you know, a, a pillar of, of the arms control uh, architecture, you know, US-Russian arms control, and the future of that really being at risk. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today to discuss these questions and more. You know, I couldn't be more pleased with the panel that we've gathered. Uh, you have your full bios in their program, so I'm just going to read their titles. Uh, but we're going to start today with Tom Countryman. Tom is the former Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Nonproliferation. Uh, we're also going to hear from Jamie Kwong. She is a Stanton Pre-Doctoral Fellow at the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, and we're going to hear from Eric Brewer, a senior director of the Nuclear Materials Security Program at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. So Tom, I'd like to start with you. you know, US Russian arms control has really been a crucial element of the broader arms control and disarmament regime. And you know, we heard from Wendy Sherman in the video just how much we've accomplished in terms of arsenal reduction since the height of the Cold War. And, and it would seem that President Biden uh, really puts a high priority on this topic. I mean, one of his first actions in office was, of course, to extend New START. Uh, he resumed strategic stability talks with Moscow. Uh, so again, it, it, it seems quite clear that he views this as a priority. But given you know, the Russian invasion in Ukraine, you know, what can we expect from strategic stability dialogue in the future? Is there a possibility of resumption? Uh, and, and really, you know, can we see future arms control between the US and Russia given current geopolitics? Uh, well, thank you, Kelsey. First, let me say, uh, congratulations to you and Daryl and the entire team on 50 years of effective and inspiring work. And ACA is effective in part because it is inspiring. And I'm really happy to be together again in person with members and supporters. I've been a guest at these annual meetings. I've been a host at these annual meetings. I'm back to being a guest because I'm momentarily employed by the Department of State in helping to prepare for the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in August and assisting Ambassador Scheinman in that task. Um, now, your question, Kelsey, uh, you'll get a better answer from Assistant Secretary Stewart when she speaks later today. But I know you're all the impatient types. That's why you're in the arms control business. <laughs> so instead of waiting for the ideal answer, I'll give you a half decent answer. And it has to start with why it is not possible at this moment to continue the strategic stability dialogue that commenced with some promise between Moscow and Washington. It's not only that Russia's action in Ukraine has put a dent in all three pillars of the non-proliferation treaty. Irresponsible talk about nuclear weapons use, uh, outright threats of nuclear weapons use, means that the important statement that five presidents made in January was immediately undermined by one of them before the end of February. And that can't be ignored. Uh, in a, the, on the non-proliferation pillar, uh, there are some who argue that this creates incentive 
for other states to pursue nuclear weapons programs. I think that concern is overstated, but the fact that it's being discussed means that the effect is real. And on peaceful uses, having active combat in a country with 15 operating nuclear reactors is a challenge to the concept of peaceful uses of nuclear energy we haven't faced before. But there's something bigger than even the effect on the non-proliferation treaty. And that is the truly unprecedented nature of a 21st century country reverting to 17th century behavior and treating power as a means to extend one's territorial control over its neighbor. This is a more fundamental challenge to the rules-based order in the world. I think it is more fundamental than the way many have put it as an argument between democracy and autocracy. Uh, it is a reason that there cannot be, at this moment, simply business as usual, even on a topic as crucial as strategic stability between the two powers. You're absolutely correct that President Biden is committed to this. We've never had a president come into office with such a long history and a deep interest in nuclear policy and in arms control. And he is fully aware of the need to get back onto that path. Uh, the, I think it's also important that, in my opinion, we've never had a president who cared so much what allies and partners and other countries think, and who has made a more intensive effort to consult with allies and non-allied friends on all manner of issues. Uh, so I think there should be no doubt about the determination of his administration to get back on track with arms control with the Russian Federation and to find the right path to open that dialogue with China as well, uh, for which we don't have a precedent and a history. When we get there, I think the goals have already been well articulated. We have to not only continue limitations on strategic delivery vehicles, which has been the main thing that we have discussed. We have to address the question of unconventional and, in my view, irrational uh, weapon systems and delivery systems that have been developed on the Russian side. We have to find a way to talk about so-called non-strategic nuclear weapons, although I've never met a nuclear weapon that isn't strategic. Uh, and we have to be able to put on the table as well and discuss the questions that concern the Russian Federation. There is inevitably a give and a take in any negotiation of this type. I think we will get back there, but I hope that at the base I've made clear there's a damn good reason we can't do it next week. Well, I certainly take your point that, that we can't do it next week, uh, but in a few months, the question of arms control, the, what's perceived as a slow pace of disarmament, frustration over the lack of progress on Article 6, you know, all of that is going to come up you know, if the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference is actually finally held. I'm not sure I'm going to believe it until I see it at this point, uh, in, in August. So, you know, how is the United States going to approach that review conference? How are you going to answer for this real frustration about the lack of progress on Article 6? Yeah. Um, well, first let's talk about the general approach. And one of the silver linings to the health crisis of the last couple of years is that due to delay of the conference and the advent of, of uh, web video technology, uh, we have consulted more widely with more states party to the treaty than the U.S. has ever done before previous review conferences. And I think that we've been clear to all that we are looking for a positive outcome, a successful outcome at the treaty, 
that we will engage seriously, study every question, discuss openly what is good and what is less acceptable, uh, and we'll work towards an outcome, whether it's a single document, as has been the case at some review conferences, or a set of documents, at, that has been the case at other review conferences, that accomplishes a few goals. First, it reflects a genuine, honest review of what has and hasn't worked in the treaty, where we've accomplished goals and where we have failed. Second, that it points a way forward with meaningful, achievable steps in all three pillars. But third, and since February, we have to think about something else as well. Does it speak exactly to the problems that we have as a result of Russia's action? Obviously, we're not going to have in a consensus document a condemnation of Russia. But can we talk about the ways that it has driven a tank into those three pillars uh, and find the right language uh, to prevent that uh, or to discourage such behavior and do something to rectify things. Some of that is more easily done. We can talk, for example, on the second pillar about the need to discourage any new state from leaving the treaty and pursuing a weapons program. And that depends both in part in talking about Article 10, the withdrawal clause of the treaty, and in the strongest possible statements from all leaders that we will oppose any new weapons program by a new country, no matter which country it is. That's important. On the third pillar, we can talk about positive security assist assurances. We can talk about the ways that the members of the treaty, the state's party, are committed to addressing nations that suffer radiological risk due to military action against their country. The hard part is in the first pillar, what you say about how the Russian action has damaged not just the credibility of the five, although to be fair, it only damages the credibility of one of the N5 uh, grouping, but has it demeaned the power of security assurances, whether they are legally binding or otherwise? Uh, and that's what we ought to be concerned about. And here I'd like to pick up on what Professor Tannenwald said, that the blatant violation of a taboo, the immediate undermining of an otherwise very positive statement by the five nuclear weapon states, creates an opportunity to strengthen the taboo. And here I have heard many folks, including some in this room, saying the obvious opportunity to strengthen that taboo and make a strong statement is at the review conference. I agree that's logical. It is not, however, realistic. Because so far, I have not seen a reaction from the rest of the world to the threats that Russia has made. I've heard a lot of NATO leaders say, this is unacceptable. But I have not heard the presidents or foreign ministers from countries outside of NATO say, this is outrageous. Now, whether that's from a misguided notion that they have to be neutral and not offend Moscow, that's one issue. But the failure to stand up for principles at the highest level of government leads me to have no confidence that folks several layers down in those governments are going to be able to agree on a meaningful statement in New York, nor will it have the same power coming out of a review conference as it could have if, say, 50 or 100 foreign ministers signed a very simple statement saying nothing about Moscow or Kyiv but simply saying these kinds of threats are unacceptable in the 21st century. Since I don't see that happening, 
and I see too many countries willing to sacrifice crucial principles of the world order out of a, I think, misjudgment of what geopolitics demands makes me a little bit pessimistic about addressing that well at the conference. But all of that said on your second part of your question was specifically Article 6. Uh, our commitment to Article 6 is strong. It was not restated during the previous administration, but the Biden administration has restated it. We know that it involves arms control negotiations. We also believe strongly that it includes risk reduction measures that are incumbent not just in a bilateral context, but among the five nuclear weapon states, and that must involve the non-nuclear weapon states as well. Risk reduction is not a substitute for disarmament, but it is the more urgent question, given the development of the last three months. And it, therefore, requires the most urgent action from the review conference. So those are just a couple of points about Article 6, but no one should doubt that the United States recognizes the legally binding obligation to continue to pursue arms reduction and eventual elimination of nuclear arsenals. So thank you, Tom, for kind of giving us sort of the U.S. perspective about what we might see at the review conference. Uh, Jamie, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. When the review conference was scheduled for January, it already promised to be acrimonious. And now, for the various reasons that Tom laid out related to the Russian invasion, you know, it promises to be an even more trying conference. Uh, so, you know, Tom laid out what he thinks might be possible. I'd love to get your perspective. You know, what could we realistically hope to achieve at the review conference? And what, in your mind, would make it a success? I know we have to look kind of beyond just the final document as an indicator of success. So what are you going to be looking for? Sure. Well, firstly, thank you so much, Kelsey, and to the Arms Control Association for inviting me to speak today. It's an honor to be a part of the 50th, 50th anniversary celebration. Um, so I think these are a really important set of questions, and I'll kind of broadly touch on a couple scene setting points that hopefully we can dive into some more. But I think ultimately, firstly, we can expect atmospherics are going to be really bad. The Iran nuclear deal is in flux. North Korea is likely going to test a seventh nuclear weapon. We have these strange relations amongst the P5. The TPNW first meeting of states parties will be a month before the RevCon. And as we've discussed, of course, we have Russia's invasion of an NPT compliant non-nuclear weapon state. And I think this war in particular has really hardened people's positions on nuclear issues. And this is something I've talked quite a lot about with my KCL colleague, Amelia Morgan. But for example, you have on the one hand, nuclear weapon states saying, look, this is why we need deterrence. This is why we need nuclear weapons. Versus you have TPNW supporters, let's say, saying, look, this is why deterrence is risky. This is why we need to get rid of these weapons. So I think all of this will express itself at the RevCon through lots of finger pointing, nasty rights of reply, maybe even delegates walking out during each other's speeches. And so to take quite a cynical approach, I think the prospects for progress are quite low, especially on the disarmament pillar. But that said, fundamentally, no one wants to break the NPT, right? Everybody recognizes it plays a critical role in the global disarmament and nonproliferation architecture. And so I think there's an obvious opportunity to state that quite clearly at the RevCon, uh, and hopefully at high political levels as well. But what else can we realistically expect beyond that kind of low-hanging fruit? Well, I think it's important to think along kind of a spectrum of ambition and really think quite critically about how ambitious we should strive to be in August. And so on the lower end, for example, I think we can expect that there will be language to acknowledge the TPNW, right? I think even nuclear weapon states have come to the point where, you know, there's a recognition we need to do so. However, the question still remains, what exactly will that look like? Kind of moving up in ambition, I think we can certainly expect a continued commitment uh, to cooperation amongst the P3, US, UK, uh, France. But I think there's also an opportunity here for China to demonstrate its commitment to continued cooperation amongst the nuclear weapon states while dialogue with Russia remains uh, unfeasible. Obviously, that will be quite politically challenging for Beijing, but I think it could draw on some of their attempts to demonstrate their leadership in this space. 
And then finally, on the more ambitious end, and what I'd really consider success, is if states' parties use the RevCon to adopt a forward-looking approach and really set up a successful 2025 review cycle. You know, this gets to Tom's point as well, that we really should be looking forward, right? The, the 10th RevCon is not the end all of the NPT. And so I think there's opportunities to really think about what are realistic opportunities for medium term progress. And I agree that risk reduction is really a critical one there. So as you said, risk reduction is a space where we might be able to see some progress. Uh, but I think you know, there might also be room in some of the multilateral initiatives that support the NPT, you know, <laughs> such as the Stockholm Initiative, such as the P5 process. You know, in a piece you wrote for Carnegie in January, you referred to these as NPT adjacent, a term that I, I, I thought was, was very descriptive. Uh, so can we look to these types of initiatives for opportunities to reduce risk? And, and just given the challenges facing the NPT, you know, is the future in these forums as we look to, to advance arms control and disarmament objectives? Sure, yeah. So I think these NPT adjacent forums are critical, right? And kind of for three interrelated reasons. You know, first and foremost, they help to maintain dialogue, especially when the atmospherics are as challenging as they are. Uh, secondly, they're doing a lot of important legwork uh, to kind of set ourselves up for that future success uh, that I mentioned. And thirdly, and somewhere I think there's more room uh, to, to improve on, is there's great opportunities for coordination and collaboration amongst them, including kind of a division of labor. But of course, I think that all of this work still does need to feed back into the RevCon and the NPT more broadly. Because as challenging as RevCons can be, at the end of the day, that is the gathering where all states' parties can really exercise their voice on these issues. But I really think that the bigger question here is, what exactly do we mean by risk reduction? And so Heather Williams wrote a really interesting piece on this recently, but you know, we have a lot of current discussions on risk reduction measures that are really focusing on how can we address misperception, inadvertent escalation, and the like. And I think that's really important and something we should be striving towards. But as the last panel kind of addressed, what happens when a nuclear weapon state is purposely increasing nuclear risks? What are we supposed to do then? And so I think that suggests at the most fundamental level, we really need a serious discussion of what risks are we striving to reduce. And kind of in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and stop there, but I'm happy to go into more detail about the, the individual groupings and their risk reduction efforts and ways ahead. Um, so that is a good cue to remind the audience that if you have questions, please feel free to write them in the cards on your table, hold them up. My colleagues will be circulating uh, to pick them up. Um, but now I want to move to the nonproliferation side of, of, of things. And you know, we've seen a number of states make threats to pursue nuclear weapons in, in recent years. Uh, and just in December, you know, Foreign Affairs did a survey of experts asking if we'd see the number of nuclear armed states you know, rise in the next 10 years. And I would say expert opinion was fairly mixed. Uh, and since then, you know, we've seen the invasion of, of Ukraine, and that's raised questions about the value of nuclear weapons. Uh, the nuclear deal with Iran, you know, whether or not that's going to be restored, that still sort of remains unresolved. So Eric, you know, moving on to you, I mean, do you think the risk of proliferation is rising? And if so, you know, what factors do you see driving states to more seriously consider nuclear weapons? Uh, thank you, Kelsey. Um, first of all, thank you to, to having me here today to you and to the Arms Control Association. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and <clears throat> I answered that question. Uh, I was one of the people who answered that question for foreign affairs. And I think my answer was neutral with a high degree of confidence. But I debated between that and yes, there would be proliferation with a low degree of confidence. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of actually probably unpack that a little bit uh, in the remainder of this question. Um, but I, you know, the bottom line is that yes, I do think the risks of proliferation are rising. Um, but of course, the question of whether or not a country or any country really crosses that nuclear threshold, I think depends on a lot of things and, and, and it's not a given. Um, I think the greater risk is that rather than a whole sort of slew of new nuclear weapons possessing states, uh, we end up in a world where more countries uh, either advance or, or develop the ability to build and deliver nuclear weapons, in a, you know, kind of should they choose to do so as a hedge. And we live in this world of, of more hedgers. And the reason why I'm worried about that is because I think when you take a look at kind of the trend lines and the factors that we all look at and assess when 
countries, uh, whether or not countries are going to proliferate, a lot of those are moving in, in the wrong direction. And we've talked about some of those today, but I'll, I'll talk about a few more. Uh, the first is that, uh, you know, I think there's, there's growing nuclear weapons threats, which we've covered today, uh, and worsening regional security environments. And that's kind of, you know, it's not determinative of proliferation, but it certainly kind of, you know, sows the seeds for some of those risks as countries take a look around and, and look at the environment that they're living in. I mean, almost, uh, almost all nuclear weapon states are increasing their nuclear arsenals, uh, Russia, China, North Korea. Um, a lot of countries in those regions are also worried about those countries' conventional capabilities. And in the Iran case, we now have an Iran that's, you know, uh, just less, probably less than a week or a week, about a week away from being able to produce enough material for a weapon. And so I think that's another, another threat that's out there. Uh, and so I think that's something we need to factor into these assessments. And I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say that Europe is high on my list as an area that I look at for, for proliferation concerns. Um, NATO is probably the most cohesive and, and strongest it's been in a while today. But there has been some alarming signals, and I think there was a really good article that was written in the bulletin recently uh, by Alex Linoska and Lauren Sukin, who looked at, they did a survey of a, of a series of Eastern European countries. And not only did they find strong support for NATO in a lot of them, but of a few, they actually found strong support for national nuclear weapons programs. Uh, and I think in Poland was one where it was about two-thirds. Uh, favored uh, or would support developing a, a national nuclear weapons program. So that's something, again, not determinative. It's not, you know, popular support is not a political decision to produce. Uh, and so I don't want to overstate that. But, you know, it's something I think we need to, to keep our eye on when we talk about these erosions of, of nonproliferation norms. Uh, looking at Asia, I mean, I think there's countries, the countries in the region are becoming increasingly concerned about the growing North Korean nuclear threat. Uh, I think the the threat uh, posed by China as well, and some of the, the, the um, aggressive postures of China. And uh, again, I would point to another um, study that's been done by um, uh, Carl uh, Friedhoff, Toby Dalton, and Lamy Kim uh, that, again, uh, surveyed uh, uh, South Koreans, and they found 70% support nuclear weapons. Now, that number is not like higher than we've seen in the past, necessarily, but what they did find that's particularly alarming is that when uh, survey participants were asked you know, uh, would it change your opinion if, if you were sanctioned or if the U.S. withdrew troops from the peninsula? They said no. It didn't really move the needle for them. So I think when we look at the utility of some of these tools and I think the, the factors that are actually driving or inhibiting nuclear weapons proliferation, I think that's another factor we have to look at, and that's a, and that's a worrying development. And in the Middle East, I already talked about, you know, the risk of Iran developing nuclear weapons. And I think, again, a nuclear Iran, but also Iran that's sort of on the cusp, I think is is quite worrying um, when it comes to uh, concerns about proliferation in the region and countries like Saudi Arabia potentially hedging or, or doing otherwise. Uh, the second you know, kind of trend line that I worry about, and it sounds a little weird saying this now, but this was certainly, I think, a debate and, and a real issue of concern in the Trump administration, which is that I do think that countries remain concerned about uh, US credibility and the credibility of US security commitments. And I think, again, you know, NATO is, is probably stronger than it's ever been. The Biden administration has done uh, an excellent job and I think deserves a lot of credit for repairing U.S. alliances in Asia and improving those relationships. But I think this is a longer term question for a lot of countries. And it's not just, you know, about security commitments per se, but it's about the broader question of U.S. leadership in the world. Mm -hmm. And is the United States going to continue to support and defend the international system? that it helped create and lead. And these are you know, longer term questions that I think drive these concerns. And I think the reason why they're worrying is because if you look at you know, history and what's driven countries to pursue or consider nuclear weapons, uh, a big part of it has been, uh, at least for those countries that receive US protection, whether or not they, they, they buy into that, view it credible, you know, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Japan, Germany, and others. So I think that's another uh, area that, that bears watching. Um, and the, the, the final point that I'll highlight here is, um, you know, and it's one that is kind of hard to, to get our heads around, but I think there's also uh, a concern, or at least I have a concern, that we may be entering into an era where nonproliferation as, as, a, as a goal is taking a backseat to some other strategic objectives that we have. And, you know, this isn't to say we don't care about nonproliferation or we don't prioritize it. I think we do but as a consequence or an outcome of, of other choices, right? And we've seen instances of this uh, throughout history, right? We've, we've had periods where we've gone through and cases where we've gone through where other issues have trumped nonproliferation, Israel, Pakistan are, are two clear-cut examples. Um, but I think in this case, uh, you know, it's perhaps our, our prioritization of strategic competition of kind of, you know, readying for competition with China uh, and Russia and doing more to 
uh, enable our allies and partners to, to do more for their own defense. And of course, there's, a, there's definitely a pull element of that as well, uh, that they, that they want to do more. Uh, but I think in some instances, some of those choices are uh, in tension with nonproliferation goals. And I'll just highlight two here, but we can talk about more of these later. I mean, I think the, uh, the ending of the, the limits on South Korea's missile program in May of last year, um, which has you know, allowed South Korea to develop longer range um, uh, solid propellant missiles. And I think was, as mentioned earlier, um, although not directly related to this, they're developing a conventionally armed SLBM capability. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, AUKUS um, and the nuclear powered submarine arrangement under that, which, uh, you know, I think we have to move forward on that very carefully in a way that sets positive non-proliferation precedents because it could go in the other direction as well and set some negative precedents that could make it easier for, for other countries to, um, to divert material for nuclear weapons or to embark on, on enrichment programs to, to fuel uh, notional uh, nuclear reactors for, for submarines. Uh, and so I'm really pleased to see that the, the, that the participants in that arrangement have recognized that and are prioritizing nonproliferation as an element of that because I do, I do think it's important. Um, and you know, none of this is to say, you know, I want to be clear that I'm not arguing we shouldn't prioritize China as, as, a, as a major challenge or threat or that you know, we shouldn't have done AUKUS or we shouldn't have done some of these other things. All I'm saying is that I think we need to be more deliberate uh, and, and I think probably both inside and outside of government to think about uh, the, the consequences, the nonproliferation consequences of some of these decisions and think about how to, to best mitigate them. Thanks, Eric. I mean, I, I certainly agree with you on the risks. Well, actually, I, I think I agreed with everything you said. But to highlight <laughs> a few things. To <laughs> <laughs> well, I, okay, I did disagree on one thing. I answered the Foreign Affairs Survey as well, and I think I said no, but low confidence. So we had some, some divergence there. Uh, but I certainly agree with you on, you know, want to highlight, you know, the risk of new states engaging in hedging activity, the tension between nonproliferation priorities and, and, and other priorities. And I think that raises the question then, well, is the U.S. playbook adequate for guarding against some of these hedging concerns? I mean, you mentioned AUKUS, you mentioned South Korea. You know, we now have Iran rich, enriching to 60%. I mean, that raises concerns about whether or not higher levels of enrichment will become a norm. Uh, so my, my question is, you know, are there steps that you think the United States and the international community could be taking to better prevent proliferation, to try to guard against um, some of this hedging? Um, or do you think you know, the current playbook is, is adequate? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and the way that I've been trying to think about this is kind of along, along these lines. It's, you know, um, what is the future proliferation environment going to look like and where will threats stem from? Is it going to look like the past 30 years, roughly, um, where threats primarily stem from so-called rogue states, Iran, North Korea, Syria, you know, uh, Libya, um, Iraq, um, you know, in an environment where uh, countries are hiding, trying to hide their capabilities, where uh, it's a unipolar era, where the U.S. Can, has, a, has a lot of ability to um, drive the, the discussion and drive the agenda, and for those who don't want to go along, you know, pull them along kicking and screaming, perhaps, in some cases. Um, uh, is it going to look like that environment where, you know, the, the kind of the name of the game for U.S. policy is, as you sort of described, um, coercive diplomacy and trying to kind of um, pressure countries to, and leaders to make uh, a change in, in assessments about their programs and be willing to put constraints on them? Is it going to look like that? Or is it going to look like, I don't know, maybe the 30-ish years before that, right, where proliferation challenges stemmed you know, not just from so-called rogue states, but from a variety of different other types of countries, allies, partners, countries that don't fit neatly into one category or the other, uh, eras where, you know, um, the United States power and, and influence is not unrivaled and not unchallenged. And I would argue it's probably not going to fit either of those worlds precisely, and obviously that's a bit of an artificial distinction, but I think it, I'm worried it's going to look more like the former, the, the pre-Cold War era, than the, than the last 30 years. And I'm worried that we're not thinking about that, we're not quite prepared for that type of world where some of these other tools that we've developed and, and honed and, and used over the past 30 years, and the other one I didn't talk about, some of the more counter-proliferation-oriented counter tools, you know, sabotage, interdictions, and, and so on, um, those aren't going to be as useful uh, in this coming era, right? And I think 
If we look back uh, again in the 1970s and 1980s, where we had challenges of proliferation from countries like Taiwan and South Korea, you know, it, it was a serious effort to, to unwind those programs, as, as I'm sure many of you know, and have probably you know, lived through in some cases, right? It was, it was a real challenge to take those back. It took decades. And it took the United States putting some pretty severe uh, consequences on the table uh, as part of those efforts, including removing US troops, including uh, ending uh, civil nuclear cooperation. And so I think it's an open question whether we would be able to or would be willing to put some of those consequences on the table today if we ever encountered similar types of situations. And not, there's, of course, a debate as well as to whether we should. Uh, and I think the other, the other area that has me um, you know, concerned about this in terms of tools is that perhaps our most valuable tool, uh, which has been diplomacy and, and our ability to uh, negotiate and, and uh, conclude and sustain arms control and nonproliferation agreements is coming under strain. Uh, in the future, and I, I worry part of that's because of the U.S. domestic political scene right now, uh, and what's uh, the, the types of agreements that are that are sort of sought after, and and the maximalist nature of some of those agreements, uh, but also I think uh, concern of parties who would enter into these these agreements about the U.S. ability to sustain commitments, and the concern that you know those commitments could dissolve uh, over the course of, of one election, um, and and the the second part of that I think is um, you know. U.S. cooperation with Russia and China on nonproliferation, I think, is going to become harder. Um, I don't think it's one of those issues that we can uh, kind of just assume will be walled off from the other tensions and from this sort of more competitive environment. I think uh, we're going to have to make a real deliberate effort to sustain that, and that's something that I believe we should do. Uh, just a couple sort of concluding sort of recommendations on how do we manage this environment? I think I would go back to what I said at the outset, which is one, I think we need to have a bigger debate, a bigger discussion, and a strategy discussion about what is this environment going to look like and what does the United States, our allies, and the international community need to do to manage that. Um, on Iran, in particular, uh, you know, this, this, uh, the real concern that Iran could remain at this threshold capability or develop nuclear weapons, I think, means, you know, we need to try and return to the JCPOA as soon as possible or figure out another way, another agreement to limit Iran's program um, because of the concerns that that could be incredibly damaging to the nonproliferation regime and uh, potentially lead to follow-on proliferation. And I think on top of that, which we can talk about more in the q and I think we also have to pivot to focusing on an agreement, uh, a regionally driven set of solutions uh, that can likewise provide limits on certain nuclear activities and added transparency. Um, and so I'm probably over time, so I'll, I'll just stop there and we can discuss the rest during Q&A. Well, if you were over time, I did not notice because excellent comments. Uh, so I know I'm going to turn to questions from the floor. I already have a few. Um, if you um, have more questions, please feel free to write them on the cards on your table. And then if you hold them up, uh, my colleagues, uh, Gabriella and Leanne, will be circulating to collect them. Uh, so thank you to those of you who have already submitted questions. Uh, I'm going to start with one about the P5. Uh, so what do you see as possible at the review conference specifically by the P5 collectively? Um, something that could be done without normalizing Russian behavior. And there's a specific question here about whether or not a reiteration of the Reagan-Gorbachev formulation uh, would be like a cynic, would that be a cynical exercise uh, given Russian nuclear threats? Uh, so, Tom, Jamie, I don't know if you would like to weigh in on that um, action that the P5 might be able to take collectively. Um, I don't know, and, and I say that with high confidence. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, the P5 did some great work, I think, between 2009 and 2000. 15, did very little of value until last year, and we had a reasonably good meeting of the group in December in Paris, and it led to a number of statements intended for discussion at the RevCon, including a declaration by four presidents and a prime minister that nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And while most of the world focused on that sentence, I urge everyone to read the entire one-page statement because it has much else of value, including an explicit statement that nuclear weapons are for defensive purposes only. And that should matter 
as well in the current environment. The same considerations uh, about Russia's uh, not just violation but detonation of important international norms means that if we can't do the higher priority strategic stability dialogue at this moment, it's a lot harder to do the lower priority, although lower visibility, P5 process. So I can't predict at this point whether the P5 will have something meaningful to say as a group at the review conference other than the important statements we made in December and January uh, that are already put forward. Now, by the way, the United States yesterday assumed the chairmanship of this group for the next year or so. Um, one of the things that we'd like to do is to talk about the N5 rather than the P5 uh, to distinguish the particular role of nuclear weapon states under the NPT from the particular role of the permanent members of the UN Security Council. But I also recognize that uh, interchangeably we'll be saying P5 and N5 for a while. The, uh, the fun thing about the, the five is the negotiation of a joint statement on any topic. And what you end up with is a lowest common denominator statement, which sometimes is still pretty good, better than no statement at all. The good news, or again, a silver lining of the current situation, is that the three, France, United Kingdom, and the United States, can say some meaningful things, and their lowest common denominator is going to be not nearly as low as the common denominator at five. So I think that you will see some useful statements from the three, some useful initiatives. There is uh, certainly, I think, an imperative on, uh, for the three of us to distinguish ourselves from the irresponsible behavior of a nuclear weapon state that we've seen. Uh, and since China was mentioned, I, I think it is uh, useful to maintain the distinction between the irresponsible behavior by a nuclear power in the case of Russia and to remind ourselves we have not seen that same level of irresponsibility from China, although we have other criticisms of them. I'll stop there. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. I think, you know, a great opportunity for the P3 to demonstrate their cooperation and, you know, efforts to continue this intersectional progress. Perhaps they could host kind of a smaller version of the doctrine side event uh, that originally the P5 had committed towards, which I really just don't see as politically feasible in August. Um, you know, something to think about as well is, you know, if you can't be operating in this, this grouping, are there opportunities for, you know, these individual nuclear weapon states to be making unilateral reaffirmations? Um, I certainly would agree that doing so in concert carries a bit more weight. Uh, but again, while the politics are hard, is that an opportunity? Of course, the question then comes up, you know, should we still be questioning the credibility of these commitments when we're seeing one of the nuclear weapon states invading a non-nuclear weapon state? Um, and just to add one more thing kind of outside of the RevCon itself, I think uh, the P5's commitment after the December meeting to create a young professionals network is a great opportunity to demonstrate their commitment to supporting you know, cooperation and coordination amongst the P5 at the, T, uh, the track two level. Um, and you know, really encouraging the next gen to be continuing these conversations when they're not quite feasible at the track 1.5 or track one levels, I think is a great way to demonstrate a continued commitment to looking forward. And I think that group has its first meeting next week. Yeah. Um, so I'm now gonna turn to North Korea and maybe I'll ask you to weigh in on this first, Eric, but Tom and Jamie, if you wanna jump in afterwards, feel free. 
Um, so this question is, how significant is the failure to impose further sanctions on North Korea? And I, I assume this might be referring to recent Security Council efforts led by the United States that were vetoed uh, after North Korea's recent missile launches. And does the vastly diverging interests of the permanent members of the UN Security Council uh, mean that the, the costs of proliferation are now lower? And you know, could this perhaps, could this trend you know, drive further proliferation? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so on, you know, we'll take the, the example of the recent um, sort of fracture of the UN Security Council over the, the pr proposal that was put forward um, to, to increase sanctions on North Korea in response to the series of ICBM tests. I mean, on the one hand, uh, you know, I do think that is significant and that is kind of the, the first time that that's happened, I think, since 2006 where there's been, where uh, Russia and China vetoed one of those resolutions. Um, so from that standpoint, it, it's, it's, I think, an important marker and indicator of where things stand. Um, and I think uh, it certainly signals that uh, resolutions down the road are going to continue to be difficult and challenging for those same reasons. I think, um, you know, I think there was a, a comment by a Chinese official that said that the United States is, you know, unhelpfully forcing this discussion now um, because it, you know, it's sort of seen things through this lens of, of its conflict with China and Russia. I mean, there's probably an element of truth to that, but there's also, you know, I mean, it's kind of like look in the mirror, right, in this case too, because I think China and Russia are also viewing these dynamics through similar lenses. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm also, unfortunately, I'm, I'm a little skeptical that, you know, even if there was another nuclear test by North Korea, that you'd see, I'm sure you'd have another resolution, or I bet you'd have another resolution probably, you know, condemning the test, um, maybe some type of additional sanctions in, in place, maybe, but I don't think it's as automatic as it used to be uh, because of these, these new types of tensions that have cropped up in the relationship and that now pervade the, the Security Council. Um, so I think, I think that that's going to be a challenge moving forward. And, I, you know, is that going to mean that other proliferators will sort of take away that they can move forward without consequences? Um, perhaps. I mean, but I'm not sure that that is really going to be a determining factor about whether a future country uh, will or will not move forward, but it certainly doesn't help that calculus. So I should have apologized in advance if I butcher the wording on anybody's question. Um, I, I really thought if I read my father's handwriting, I could read everybody else's, but uh, a, a few of these have been a bit challenging, perhaps because uh, I've been so used to typing in the, in the virtual world of, of the pandemic. Um, but I want to now perhaps combine nonproliferation and the NPT a bit more directly um, for this next question, you know, which is what are the implications for the NPT review conference if the JCPOA uh, has not been restored by then? I mean, certainly we could see that as, as another flashpoint. Um, so I will open the panel to, to who might want to, to, to weigh in on that. dramatically significant. Uh, the review conference is not, has not been, will not be this time, uh, a place where the fate of the JCPOA and the strategic direction of Iran are decided. But certainly, to get back to the JCPOA, which should be in the common interest of everybody who does not want to see a new war in the Middle East. Uh, if we fail to get back to it, it will hurt the atmosphere. But does it dramatically change uh, an outcome document? I don't think so. Would either of you like to weigh in? I would probably agree um, and just, you know, get back to my point of there's a lot of challenges that are going to make for a difficult atmosphere at RevCon, obviously the JCPOA being one of them. Uh, but, you know, we're facing a lot. <laughs> uh, so I think there's, it's not, it's not going to be the end all be all. Uh, yeah, I'll just say, I mean, you know, the JCPOA, I think, you know, obviously it's, there's a lot of different views on that, <laughs> on the deal. Um, you know, in my mind, it, it still remains the, the least unattractive option for the United States when it comes to limiting Iran's nuclear program. Um, I, you know, I, I take the point of folks who say that 
you know, changes over time have made it, made it less useful, right? It's not quite the deal that it was in 2015. But when you look at the available alternatives that are out there, it still strikes me as the best among them. And moreover, if you are concerned about you know, all of these other nuclear challenges we've talked about, um, you know, North Korea, uh, if you want to prioritize China as the biggest challenge in the United States and you want to you know, pivot to Asia, uh, it strikes me that limiting, taking a deal that even if not the perfect deal, is nevertheless quite good at limiting Iran's program and, and adding a lot of transparency to that program, it strikes me that that is the best strategic choice. Uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of the way that I've been thinking about it. And, and I would agree with my colleagues' comments on, on, on the, the NPT uh, review conference. Um, the only other comment I would make, because this is somewhat relevant to Iran as well, I think you know, this idea of Iran sort of at the cusp of a nuclear weapon or this risk that there might be additional nuclear hedgers out there, I think that poses additional challenges for disarmament as well. Uh, and, and having to grapple with, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, that, that blurry line, right, between sort of purely peaceful and weapons uh, looks like, I think that could potentially be more challenging uh, to advance the disarmament goals that we have. So staying on the topic of the MPT, um, maybe, Jamie, maybe I'd ask you to take kind of the first stab at this question. Um, the question is, you know, will too much focus on the condemnation of Russia's actions create new dividing lines at the NPT, um, further undermining the prospects um, for its relative success? So I think, you know, we discussed a lot about why it's important to condemn Russia, but I think, you know, asking about the consequences is important. So what, what do you think? Sure, yeah, I, I think that that's a big possibility. Um, I certainly agree with the comments that have been made that there needs to be a clear condemnation of Russia's behavior and actions, again, against an NPT-compliant non-nuclear weapon state. Um, that said, you know, getting to my point of, it's really important to preserve the NPT. So I, I think we still do need to focus on areas for opportunity and progress uh, to ensure that, you know, RevCon doesn't, you know, implode the treaty, which, to be clear, I don't think it will. Uh, but to really safeguard our efforts and make sure that, you know, our progress isn't derailed, which, you know, touches on the point as well of making sure that the RevCon is kind of insulated from external semi-tangential issues. So, for example, you know, I think AUKUS could come up uh, from the Chinese delegation saying, look, you know, we have concerns that U.S., U.K., and Australia are challenging non-proliferation norms and things. Um, and certainly, you know, that's a topic of discussion, but I don't think that these external issues should derail the progress and focus on the three pillars of the treaty and doing, you know, a good faith review of the, of the treaty, as Tom mentioned. Yeah, if I could, two points on that. Um, first, um, I agree, and it follows also on what both Nina and Jamie have said, that yes, a uh, frontal assault on the key concepts of the treaty by the Russian Federation, uh, it makes everything harder, but it is also an opportunity. Uh, and I think it reinforces what most nations should feel, that the, uh, this is not just a routine review conference, one in a series. This is happening at a moment when basic tenets of the treaty are being actively undermined. And therefore, there is a greater need than ever to come to the defense of the treaty, to reiterate that it is not just relevant, but important and central to the global uh, rules-based order, uh, and that we are determined to strengthen it against all challenges. So uh, as difficult as Russia's war has made it, uh, it actually gives me a little bit of optimism that states are going to focus on that central goal of keeping the treaty strong, vibrant, and in the forefront of leaders' minds, rather than quibbling about whether we have done enough on this topic or that topic. The second thought about this question is, yes, Russia deserves to be condemned <coughs> for reasons, as I said, that go well above the level of the NPT. But there has to be clear in people's minds a separation in concept and in timing between condemnation of Russia and strengthening of the norms of the treaty. 
you should be condemning the hell out of Russia every place outside of the review conference and especially before the review conference, as I said earlier. But when you get in the hall and you are talking about a consensus document, that's not where you're going to write condemnation of anybody. Uh, you are going to write about principles, about strengthening norms. And you're going to do that without mentioning names if you're going to have a successful document. So keeping that distinction in concept and in timing between condemnation of what has happened and a positive program to help ensure it doesn't happen anymore is important. One more quick concept on AUKUS. Of course, we will talk about AUKUS at the NPT. China will raise AUKUS in New York, in Vienna, in Geneva, at the Climate Change Conference, at the Conference on Fish Migration. <laughs> they will raise it everywhere. They will hope, vainly, that we do not raise the facts about who has introduced more nuclear-powered submarines and nuclear missiles into the Pacific than anyone else. Uh, it will be an entertaining conversation, but it's also an opportunity for us to demonstrate, as Eric mentioned, that the three AUKUS partners are committed to establishing the highest possible standard for non-proliferation in the context of, of naval propulsion, uh, and that we will be utterly cooperative with the IAEA. So this next question sort of combines two questions from the audience, and I, I might direct this at you first, Eric. Um, to what extent should we be concerned about the actions that Saudi Arabia is taking, you know, given its nuclear threats in the past and its, its involvement with China? And is the Middle East WMD free zone uh, likely to be a contentious issue at the NPT review conference, and, and is that an option to counter proliferation threats that we might see rising in, in, in the Middle East? So, Eric, whatever part of that, all yeah. of that you'd like yeah, to respond yeah, yeah. to. to kick Great it question. Off. Maybe I'll leave the uh, the questions about the the review conference to my colleagues. But no, I mean I think you know when you look at the sort of the cast of characters, right, and where they rank on your concern, I think Saudi Arabia is certainly on that list um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, you know. One, as, as I think you alluded to at the outset of this, Kelsey, um, members of the Saudi leadership have openly talked about how they will develop nuclear weapons if Iran does. Um, and so as Iran you know, inches up uh, that capability ladder, I think that's one reason to watch. Although it's notable that they haven't said anything in quite some time, so perhaps they found those comments uh, not, not terribly useful, uh, uh, as they did at, at least at the outset. So there's the, the Iran factor and the, the, the statements they've made publicly that I think bear watching. Um, but of course, we've seen uh, reports uh, at, about Saudi Arabia developing um, a uh, indu uh, indigenous ballistic missile production capability, which of course is not nuclear, um, right? There's no direct linkage, but that is another, um, because of the potential future delivery capability and role that that could serve, I think it's something that bears watching. Um, and I think the other, the other issue that is concerning is I think the current um, uh, Saudi Arabia could certainly be doing more to provide transparency on its nuclear program. And I think the big thing there is rescinding the, sw the small quantities protocol and applying the additional protocol. And Saudi's been quite reluctant uh, to, to adopt the AP, um, uh, you know, and it's been quite reluctant to, uh, to limit and forswear um, in any capacity uh, enrichment reprocessing. And so I think steps on those issues I think would certainly be positive. And so those are the types of things I would I would, I would look for that would certainly provide some reassurance and take it further down that list of countries of concern. Thanks. So then on the, the Middle East zone, opportunity at the NPT Review Conference, flashpoints. I mean, I think you know, we all remember that in 2015, it actually was the Middle East WMD Free Conference, uh, or Middle East WMD Free Zone Conference that prevented consensus. So Jamie, Tom, do you have thoughts on how we might see this issue come up in August? Well, I'd say I think we can expect it will come up again, uh, but there has been some intercessional efforts since 2015 uh, to address the issue. There's been a dedicated conference meeting, I believe, in person before 
everything um, at some point. Um, but again, I would just reiterate, you know, I think we need to make sure that there's not one single issue that derails the conference uh, in the larger effort that we should be using, you know, August to really be strengthening the NPT and the broader regime. Tom? I do not expect it to derail the conference. Okay, well, a possible point of optimism. <laughs> uh, so we have just a few minutes left and I'm gonna end on this question and I'll, I'll give everybody a chance to, to weigh in. Uh, so maybe Jamie, we'll start with you and just work down the row. Uh, so Adam Scheinman was interviewed in this most recent issue of Arms Control Today. And he said that past NPT review conference commitments are political, uh, that only the treaty is binding and we should not lose time debating history. Uh, so the question is, you know, why should anyone care about NPT commitments? I'm so glad I get to go first. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, past commitments is another issue that is brought up a lot in the NPT space and I can expect will be brought up again at RevCon. Um, and just to kind of give more depth to the conversation, uh, so you kind of have, you know, some states uh, saying, you know, past commitments are important, they're very representative of the time, however, so we should be looking forward and seeing, you know, how can we implement the spirit of the treaty and, you know, those legal obligations. Uh, you know, and then on the other hand, you have states saying, look, if we aren't following these past commitments that have been reached by consensus, certainly we're undermining the NPT. Uh, so I think that's a very critical point of tension uh, that is honestly quite challenging to address. Um, and so, you know, I'll perhaps problematically just fall back on, you know, my area for largest ambition is, you know, looking forward and how can we collectively strive to, to strengthen this treaty. Hope I avoided that well enough. <laughs> Tom? Well, first, you should read Ambassador Scheidman's interview because he explains it, I think, better than I do. But the essential points are a treaty obligation. What is written, signed, and ratified is binding and eternal. A commitment made at a review conference is political, it is important, it is relevant, and at least speaking for the United States, when that commitment is made, it is sincerely made with the intent to carry it out. I have to agree that arguing about what we meant when we said this in 2000 is a less productive exercise than what we need to focus on in the next five years. And, uh, it is the business of diplomats to find the right wording that will reassure others. I, m myself, I think it's a little more of a theological and semantic exercise, but I also respect the fact that a number of states' parties feel very deeply about this issue, and therefore we have to address it, we have to find the right language that reassures people, but that also recognizes from the point of view of the United States that 2022 is not 1995. So I, I'm not a lawyer, nor an expert on international law, uh, and so as I've been reminded by people who actually are. Um, <laughs> so, but no, I mean, I agree with my colleagues. I mean, look, you know, political doesn't mean irrelevant, right? It's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a Correct. ding, right? It's not, an, it's not an insult, or at least I wouldn't perceive, perceive it as an insult. So just saying that they're political does not mean they're irrelevant. As, as, as Tom said, they're, they're quite relevant. So, I, but, I, but I also agree that you know, looking forward to the future is the most productive way, and thinking about, given where we are, what is the most productive way to, to strengthen the treaty is the, is the right approach at the end of the day. Well, I'm sorry we couldn't get to more questions, um, but thank you for yeah. submitting your questions. My thanks to the panelists for a very rich discussion. Uh, before we give them a round of applause, I have a few quick instructions. Um, so I'm gonna ask everybody after this panel uh, to actually leave the ballroom. We're gonna have some past appetizers out in the lobby, and that will give the staff a chance to set up for lunch. Uh, if you notified ACA that you had a dietary restriction, uh, you should have been given a card with a colored dot in it uh, behind your name tag at the registration desk. Uh, so I would ask you now to take that card out, uh, to leave it at your place at the table, uh, so the wait staff will know uh, what meal you're receiving 
Uh, if you didn't re receive a card, uh, that, that means you didn't uh, notify us of any restriction. Um, I would also just add that for those standing, for those sitting in the press area, you know, we do have some seats up front. Uh, feel free to come down and fill those. And we're also going to be setting up another table to make sure we have plenty of space. Uh, and then I would ask everybody to come back into the room uh, at 12.10 sharp uh, to resume the program. Um, so please now thank me in joining our panel and then hold for Daryl to give another announcement. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Uh, thanks to uh, that great discussion. Um, Tom, we will have a vigorous discussion at the MPT Review Conference about how to strengthen the treaty. Let me just leave it there. Um, we um, have received a, a message this morning that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, and I don't know, Brendan, if you're ready to do this. But um, so we're very pleased and honored to have gotten uh, a note, uh, a statement formal statement of congratulations for the Arms Control Association's 50th uh, anniversary that we received earlier today from a former speaker at one of our annual meetings in 1979, uh, a former speaker at the 2004 meeting, and now the President of the United States, uh, Joseph Biden. And so you see it there on the screen uh, for our online audience. Um, it's going to be tweeted in just a few minutes. Um, so as you can see, it is a substantive statement from President Biden, um, as you might expect. I'm just going to read a couple of quick excerpts um, that I think are quite notable. And, and the President says, throughout my career, I've championed arms control efforts grounded on our nation's firm belief that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. That's why I immediately, I acted immediately to extend New START Treaty for five years when I took office as president. He goes on to say that our progress must continue beyond the New START extension, even as we rally the world to hold Russia accountable for its brutal and unprovoked war on Ukraine, we must continue to engage Russia on issues of strategic stability. Today, perhaps more than any other time since the Cold War, we must work to reduce the risk of an arms race or nuclear escalation. Uh, he goes on to say that for 50 years, the Arms Control Association has educated citizens around the world to help create broad support for US-led arms control and nonproliferation achievements. Um, as you celebrate this milestone anniversary, may we recommit ourselves to upholding arms control and nonproliferation diplomacy for current and future generations in America and around the world. Here, here. And there will be some hard copies of that statement outside as you go uh, to take your break and have some hors d'oeuvres before we return back at 12.10 for the rest of the program. Thank you very much.
for at sige.
time for conversations, but we will have some more time this evening at the reception. So please take your seats when you can. Thank you. How to summarize 50 years of history with an organization um, like the Arms Control Association, uh, its connections to different people, different organizations around the world through the years on issues beyond nuclear weapons, uh, also involving chemical and biological weapons, conventional arms that pose a particular risk to civilians, and as we get ready for the lunches, which are now coming out, as we're getting ready for our keynote speaker, Mallory Stewart, uh, we wanted to ask you to s s sit down and relax um, and take a look at a short film that um, the staff and our uh, helpful consultants have put together to try to encapsulate 50 years of history with the Arms Control Association, which attempts to um, pay homage to those who have built this organization, uh, the founders of the organization, and uh, the organization that we're trying to continually improve upon um, today and into the future. So with that, let me ask um, Brendan to roll the show. Thank you. For more than five decades, the Arms Control Association has played a key role in advancing arms control and non-proliferation breakthroughs that have significantly reduced the threats posed by the world's most dangerous weapons. ACA serves as an authoritative source of information on weapons-related security challenges and remains a go-to source for everyone, from scholars to reporters to diplomats, students, and activists. Originally founded in 1971, as a project of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The Arms Control Association became an independent, nonpartisan, non-governmental think and do tank in 1972, under the leadership of William C. Foster, Gerard Smith, Herb York, Pete Scoville, and others. ACA has worked to shape the debate on nuclear weapons and arms control, and our experts are among the most trusted and widely cited sources in the field. To help deliver news, information, and ideas about reducing the threat of weapons of mass destruction, Arms Control Today debuted in 1974 as the name of ACA's monthly journal. Through the years, ACT has published thousands of articles by a diverse range of expert voices, including treaty negotiators, 
diplomats, senators, and some presidents, and has delivered news reporting that is relied upon by journalists, scholars, and the concerned public. In 1976, Arms Control Today conducted a Q&A during the presidential election between Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter, and since, the Q&A has become a regular feature of the presidential election process, allowing people to gauge a better understanding of where candidates stand on global threats. Since its beginning, ACA experts have teamed up with journalists and writers to highlight the existential risk of the nuclear age. In 1983, the post-apocalyptic television movie The Day After first aired on ABC. The film centers around a group of families in Kansas who face chaos as the country spirals into nuclear war. What many people don't know is that the film was inspired by a 1978 project between ACA's executive director Bill Kincaid and journalist Nan Randall. The movie boosted public awareness of the risk of nuclear war and put pressure on policymakers to take action. Through the years, ACA has served as an important training ground and launching point for dozens of leaders in the field. In the 1980s, ACA sought to address the renewed concern about nuclear conflict and the interest in disarmament, and it launched a new voices program for young scholars. In 1987, ACA was a key part of the Scoville Peace Fellowship Program that continues to this day to help bring young scholars into the field. In the 1980s and 90s, the organization was a leading voice against Reagan's Star Wars program and stood for further bilateral nuclear reduction and a nuclear testing halt. ACA helped to champion a new initiative to secure nuclear materials in the former Soviet republics. And Arms Control Today received the Olive Branch Award for outstanding coverage of international security and nuclear risk in the former Soviet Union. In 1995, ACA was intricately involved in the campaign for the Non-Proliferation Treaty, supporting the Accord's indefinite extension and strengthening state commitments to nuclear disarmament, including the conclusion of negotiations on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in 1996. In 2001, ACA's executive director learned of efforts to repudiate the U.S. signature on the CTBT and leaked information that led to reporting in the New York Times to help quash the move. As the Iraq War began to develop in 2003 amid controversy, ACA hosted a major press conference at the National Press Club featuring former U.S. intelligence officials and drew national attention to the Bush administration's cherry-picking of intelligence about WMDs as a way to justify its decision to invade. The event led to a 60 Minutes report featuring former intelligence official Greg Thielman, now a member of ACA's board. To try to jumpstart action on deeper nuclear reductions in 2005, the association published the influential report What Are Nuclear Weapons For? by Dr. Sidney Drell and Ambassador James Goodby, which called for steep nuclear reductions to 1,000 strategic warheads. Drell advised former Secretary of State George Shultz, who would later join Henry Kissinger, Sam Nunn, and William Perry to issue a call for peace and security in a world without nuclear weapons. Then, in 2007, ACA helped Senator Barack Obama draft Senate Resolution 1977, his Nuclear Weapons Threat Reduction Act, which served as a blueprint for his agenda as president. To highlight and celebrate the work of other leaders and institutions that have advanced effective solutions, ACA launched the Arms Control Person of the Year Award in 2007 by first honoring the bipartisan congressional coalition that cut off funding for a new nuclear warhead. Each year, the contest recognizes the diverse range of people at the local, national, and international levels who help advance meaningful arms control solutions for a safer world. With the election of Barack Obama in 2008, there was new political energy for nuclear risk reduction. An influx of new funding allowed the association to augment its research staff and launch new projects and reports with a focus on resolving threats posed by the Iranian nuclear program, as well as improving nuclear material security and reducing the role of nuclear weapons to solely deterring the use of nuclear weapons by other states. Lastly, it was crucial for ACA to secure ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, also known as New START. In 2015, 
ACA was a leader for support of the Iran nuclear deal, providing analysis and information and advocacy for its conclusion. ACA's policy team spearheaded a research and advocacy campaign that continues to this day to win support for this landmark agreement. In 2016, ACA, along with the Stimson Center, organized a targeted campaign to push the UN Security Council to adopt Resolution 2310, which reinforces the global norm against nuclear testing and calls for action on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. From 2019 to 2021, ACA renewed its legislative commitment to the cause, with mobilization on Capitol Hill for a five-year extension of the New START agreement. ACA has been central to many successes in reducing weapons-related dangers. But today, we face a dizzying array of challenges that put at risk practically every major arms control and non-proliferation initiative of the past quarter century, and the existential risk of nuclear conflict remains. We've accomplished a lot, but there's no room for complacency. The dangers we face today are as great as at any point in the history of the Arms Control Association. We need more arms control and disarmament action, not less. As our friend and the former veteran negotiator Larry Weiler once wrote to Arms Control Association members in 2018, we must remain optimistic. Larry wrote that in the dark days of the Cold War, when things did not seem possible, we persisted. If we could do it then, we can also find practical ways to tackle today's tough nuclear challenges. In the years ahead, you can count on ACA to smartly respond to the latest nuclear crisis, defend Keystone Agreements, and chart a path forward to a safer world. The work of the Arms Control Association is not finished. As we move forward, ACA will continue to play a key role in advancing arms control and non-proliferation breakthroughs that significantly reduce the threats posed by the world's most dangerous weapons. To learn more and support the mission, visit armscontrol.org.
just uh, note that you've only seen half of the video. Uh, we're having some technical difficulties, which is uh, it's kind of amazing given all the technical uh, features of this meeting. So this will be available on our website. There is history after about the year 27, believe me. And um, please enjoy your lunch for a few more minutes. And uh, we're going to get started with our keynote speaker momentarily. You never know what to expect up here. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Carol Giacomo, and I'm the editor of Arms Control today. Uh, I am delighted uh, to be the one to introduce our guest, our keynote speaker today, Mallory Stewart, who's the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance. These are among her first, her second, public remarks since she assumed the role. Um, and we hope that you will have take this opportunity to ask her questions. There are cards on the table. So feel free to please uh, write down your, your questions, and my colleagues will pick them up. Assistant Secretary Stewart joined the Bureau in 2022 after serving as Special Assistant to President Biden and Senior Director for Arms Control, Disarmament, and Nonproliferation at the National Security Council. Prior, prior to joining the NSC, she was the Senior Manager for Global Nuclear Security and Nonproliferation at the Center for Global Security and Cooperation at Sandia National Laboratories. From 2015 to 2017, Ms. Stewart was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Emerging Security Challenges and Defense Policy, also at um, ABC. Before that, she was, an attorney, uh, she was an attorney advisor in the Department of State's Office of Legal Affairs beginning in 2002. Among her signature accomplishments was her role as lead lawyer on the negotiations that led to the 2013 U.S.-Russian framework for the elimination of serious chemical weapons. And with that, I give you Mallory Stewart. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Arms Control Association for inviting me here. It's truly an honor. And congratulations on the 50th anniversary of this great association. As we just heard twice, you have very much to be proud of. Um, over the last half century, you have worked to develop and advocate for solutions to the most pressing international security challenges. And you have cultivated multiple generations of national security experts, both inside and out of government. 50 years ago, in 1972, few would have believed that the US and Russian inspectors would now be conducting on-site inspections of each other's strategic nuclear forces, that our efforts to prevent a cascade of nuclear proliferation would be more successful than not, that our US national nuclear stockpile would be nearly 23,000 weapons fewer uh, than they were in 1972, and that the tradition of non-use of nuclear weapons would extend for 77 years. None of these developments were inevitable. The combination of vocal and vibrant debate among civil society and the expert community, important attention from academia, shrewd diplomacy, and credible deterrence has helped us to manage the existential danger of nuclear weapons. While we should take pride in these accomplishments, we must acknowledge the setbacks and recommit to face the major obstacles to national security, strategic stability, and arms control efforts going forward. As we've all been witness to, and as you've discussed much today, these challenges continue to grow. Russia is waging a brutal war of aggression in Ukraine, and European security is more challenged than at any time since World War II. Russia has dramatically demonstrated its willingness to violate arms control obligations and security assurances, and nuclear saber rattling has featured prominently in Russian attempts to deter the world from assisting Ukraine. The People's Republic of China is rapidly building a larger, more diverse nuclear arsenal. The accelerating pace of the PRC's nuclear expansion may allow it to have up to 700 deliverable nuclear weapons in the next five years and at least 1,000 by 2030. 
This would exceed the pace and size that the US projected just two years ago in 2020. And this growth is made even more concerning by the complete lack of transparency of the PRC regarding its stockpile. More alarming, perhaps, is that through their actions and campaigns to disseminate disinformation, Russia and China seem to be actively working to subvert the rules-based international order and to construct a different reality, one more favorable to authoritarian governments. North Korea continues to prioritize its weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs over the well-being of its people, and we continue to work towards Iran's return to full implementation of its JCPOA commitments. Amid the resurgence of strategic competition with China and Russia, their efforts to weaken the international rules-based order, the continued development of North Korea's nuclear weapons and missile programs, and the stalemate in our discussions with Iran, many have understandably grown frustrated with the lack of progress in global nuclear disarmament. Although the size of the US nuclear stockpile is down 88% from its peak in 1967, there is no clear indication that Russia or China are ready to engage with us in good faith, either to enable deeper reductions in our collective strategic capacities or even to prevent miscalculations and reduce risks going forward. What's more, the appreciation and the understanding in the US domestic audience, political arena, and in the international community for what arms control can achieve has diminished somewhat. The understanding that arms control can strengthen deterrence and is often required to achieve stability has waned. But what I know and what this community well knows is that these obstacles are not insurmountable. We know that arms control, and especially nuclear arms control, is right now more important than ever, as we heard from President Biden. During international crises, when misunderstandings, mistrust, miscommunication, and arms races thrive, and when escalation is both intentional and unintentional, is when we most need the collective efforts and knowledge of this community. What we also inherently understand is that arms control can take many forms to work in many different contexts. These tools include attribution and accountability mechanisms, transparency and confidence building measures, reliable and credible channels of communication, joint statements, unilateral or reciprocal non-binding commitments, and of course, verifiable international agreements and treaties. These tools have worked, as we saw in the video, and will continue to do so. Even in today's complicated security environment, we see examples of arms control mechanisms reducing risk. For example, while the New START Treaty was indeed negotiated during a different climate of relations with Russia, its legally binding limits continue to constrain Russia from significantly expanding the number of warheads loaded onto its ICBMs and SLBMs. Continued compliance and transparency provisions in New START ensured that we were not surprised or alarmed when Russia conducted a routine test of its developmental Sarmat missile, despite Putin's attempt to cast the launch in an intimidating light. And even the Janu January uh, 2022 P5 statement from earlier this year on preventing nuclear war and avoiding arms races demonstrates the continued utility of our diverse arms control toolkit. In that statement, Russia, China, France, the UK, and the US affirm that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. The five nations recognize that nuclear use would have far-reaching consequences and express the intent, quote, to continue seeking bilateral and multilateral diplomatic approaches to avoid military confrontations, strengthen stability and predictability, increase mutual understanding and confidence, and prevent an arms race that would benefit none and endanger all. As a result of this statement, Russia is on the record affirming a set of principles that is now clearly violating. We must highlight Russia's disdain and marshal the support of the entire international community to condemn Russia for its reckless nuclear saber rattling. And, and China too appears unwilling to live up to the elements of that P5 statement, most clearly in its continued resistance to bilateral dialogue on strategic risk. Reducing strategic risk is an obligation that nuclear weapon states owe to the world. It is in all of our interests to work on this together. Unfortunately, some think that arms control is at odds with deterrence, or even national security as a whole. Indeed, some observers treat arms control and nuclear deterrence as separate and competing approaches to national security. Some even go as far as to describe them as opposing camps. I think we need to examine this.
This administration views arms control and deterrence as mutually reinforcing and overlapping. They represent two complementary elements within a single integrated strategy to prevent war, avoid arms races, and stop the spread of nuclear weapons. Our efforts to deter are more effective and more successful when we have greater clarity about the capabilities, posture, operations, and strategies of our potential adversaries. Our efforts to defend ourselves are most efficient when we are spared the pressure to buy and deploy ever-increasing weapon systems purely for the sake of matching or exceeding the other side's numbers. In our efforts to prevent unintentional escalation, and even to head off intentional escalation are only successful if we can communicate reliably and clearly in peacetime and in crisis. In contrast, accelerating proliferation, diminishing communications, and the absence of transparency is rarely a formula that results in greater security or stability. The mutually reinforcing rela relationship between deterrence and arms control is at the heart of the Biden-Harris administration's balanced approach to these issues. With our national security and the security of our partners and allies as the overarching objective, the United States will maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent and a strong and credible extended deterrent commitment. At the same time, we will continue to emphasize the need for strategic stability, seek to avoid costly arms races, and facilitate risk reduction and arms control arrangements wherever possible. We have an ambitious but achievable vis vision for the future one that will enhance the security of the United States, our allies and partners, and the global community. So how do we achieve this vision? With Russia, we have explained our goals for next steps in nuclear arms control, and those have not changed. We want to sustain limits beyond 2026 on the Russian systems covered under New START. We want to limit the new kinds of nuclear systems Russia is developing. And we want to address all Russian nuclear weapons, including theater range weapons. Expanding arms control to cover these theater range weapons is critically important since Russia is more likely to threaten or actually use these weapons during a conflict. And these weapons are presently not constrained by any agreement, nor does Russia have any arms control commitments or obligations to even provide transparency regarding its stockpile, which is on par or greater than the number of deployed weapons accountable under New START. Former US Under Secretary of State Rose Gottemuller once referred to theater range weapons limitations as the holy grail of the arms control community. And addressing these weapons certainly will not be easy. We are working hard within the interagency and with partners and allies to analyze the full range of complex issues at play. And I'm confident we will be ready with an effective and workable approach. But technical solutions and capacities are not sufficient without political will. And progress will be difficult without a willing partner in Russia. With China, though very different on many levels, we do face a similar political will challenge. Attempts to engage in bilateral and multilateral discussions on managing and reducing strategic risks have been met with stiff PRC resistance. China appears unwilling to engage while it is rushing to expand its arsenal. And now that that arsenal has surpassed the size of those of the UK and France and is on pace to be larger than both combined, Beijing's time to be transparent and engage meaningfully on risk reduction has come. The United States have been working with like-minded partners to highlight the benefits to both China and Russia that risk reduction and mutual restraint measures, improved crisis communications, information sharing, and guardrails can provide. 21st century strategic stability requires that we find creative ways to address each side's differing threat perceptions, but all sides must engage. Arms control cannot be a one-way street. We cannot simply wait for Russia and China to deem it in their interest to engage in good faith. Raising awareness about those countries' nuclear behavior is key to creating global pressure to choose stability over nuclear threats and arms racing. Building understanding of why arms control measures are crucial for national and international security is another way to encourage engagement on these issues. And we cannot hesitate to call both Russia and China to account. While we ensure we are prepared with credible arms control and risk reduction proposals when they are ready to engage. So I will end with a call to action from Joe Biden delivered to this community 20 years ago at the annual ACA meeting in 2002. At that meeting, then Senator Biden explained that in order to achieve our arms control and nonproliferation objectives, quote, we must loosen the bonds of ideology 
We must invent new approaches and foster new international cooperation to meet the changing threats. Then and to this day, President Biden continues to call upon us to work together as a team, national leaders, NGOs, academia, politicians, diplomats, military officials, governments of nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states alike. President Biden has asked us to put aside ideology and perceived divisions between our efforts to reach a world without nuclear weapons, to put aside different backgrounds and historical conflicts, cultural differences or assumptions, and build on our successes. We need to diversify our perspectives and be creative to explore how new technologies can help develop innovative approaches to verification and how new techniques or arrangements can ensure collective confidence and stability. We need to explore novel arms control concepts to better understand their potential and their effectiveness. And we need to value attribution and accountability mechanisms and maximize the utility of communication channels and dialogues. But we also need to clarify rules for responsible behavior to define what good behavior is in gray zone of conflict so we can clearly see and hold accountable when bad behavior occurs. We need to continue to grapple with the challenging and undefined world of emerging disruptive technologies, and we should use the rising tide of concern on this issue. Finally, we all need to break through the webs of disinformation and deceit to hold Russia accountable for its unjustified invasion of Ukraine and nuclear saber rattling, and to hold China accountable for rejecting good faith efforts to engage on strategic risk reduction but we need your partnership. We need you to help remind the domestic and international audiences of the importance of arms control. We need you to continue to support the administration's commitment to reestablishing a leadership role in arms control and nonproliferation efforts while working to modernize and replace New START when it expires. We need your help to hold all nuclear weapon states accountable for progress in arms control. And looking out at this august crowd, I know you will. Thank you very much. I look forward to questions. Okay. Well, you certainly have given us a lot to probe there. <laughs> the very same then senator, now president, that you quoted at the end also said on that, at that dinner that pursuing arms control is not a luxury or a sign of weakness, but an international responsibility and a national necessity. Now, we've hear, heard here today that strategic stability talks with the Russians are in the deep freeze for, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, under what circumstances would you consider resuming this dialogue? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an important question because when we engaged the final time with Russia in January of this year, um, we demonstrated our good faith in talking about each and every one of the articles in their proposed treaty. We addressed as seriously as we could uh, all of their issues, and we tried to propose a path forward on those that we could accomplish, and we tried to realistically respond on those that were not, not tenable and not really realistic. Um, we engaged in good faith, and we brought the interagency and our partners and allies to the same place in being able to respond and engage with Russia. We asked one thing, that they engage with us in good faith and demonstrate a uh, like-minded willingness to continue a dialogue and a conversation and not to invade Ukraine. They left that discussion and within a month had invaded Ukraine. And so it's very hard right now to understand how we can sort of acknowledge and accept that they would be willing to engage with us in good faith with such a demonstration of an inability to absorb what we were trying to work with them on and to respond to us in, in a way that demonstrates that dialogue and diplomacy had a chance. Um, I think if there was some way to indicate good faith on their side, if there was some way to indicate that the dialogue would be more meaningful than just another meeting in Geneva, we could consider something. But I think at this point, with their illegal invasion of Ukraine and their continued uh, horrific uh, you know, I think as, as, as Tom mentioned, you know, 17th century activities, it's very hard to figure out how we can sit and think that our diplomacy will be taken seriously on that side. So until we get some indication of good faith or some willingness to actually provide, uh, you know, assurances that they are, are 
willing to give diplomacy a chance. I just don't know how we can meet with them again on this. All right, so we're looking at a period where there's just an indefinite nothingness there. Um, does this make track two conversations more important? Is that something that you would encourage? I mean, I think track two conversations are always important. Mm -hmm. I think uh, regardless of the situation, it's useful to have the outside community talking, engaging uh, on both sides. Um, I will say that we are still implementing New START, as, as is Russia, and that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, I think that any way we can sort of inch toward continued communications, as, as President Biden said in his statement, now during crisis is when they're more important than ever. Um, but you know, again, with the SSD, which I, I care very deeply about, and I know that you know, uh, everyone at the State Department and our partners and allies care very deeply about that dialogue, it's very hard to convince you know, everyone to engage, again, without some legitimate you know, uh, willingness on the Russian side to demonstrate seriousness. All right, but even if one were to accept your point, your argument, um, you're facing a deadline mm -hmm. uh, with new start, mm -hmm. and and it's fast coming. Yeah, you know, to that time. Yes. So, what's your plan B with that? I mean, is there? Uh, do you see the possibility of uh, a unilateral U.S. Declaration that you would continue to adhere to the start new start limits um, as long as Russia did. I think we need to consider all of the available options going forward. Right, I'm I am not willing to give up on the ability to negotiate next steps beyond new start at this point. I think right now during this conflict, it's very hard to figure out how we do that. Um, and we just saw some communications from from various folks ac across the U.S. government about figuring out how we do this. Um, so my bureau is actively working to sort of figure out what we could put forward should the opportunity arise. Um, but you know we should keep all options open for what we can do moving forward. So I don't think we should sort of right now figure out what is the right path because I think there could be other venues or opportunities. But you know I think we should hope to engage at some point with a good faith interlocutor and try to achieve next steps. Um, one more for me, and then we'll go to the audience. Yeah. But um, the the nuclear posture review still has, you know, it's still classified. Yep. And there's a fact sheet that, of course, tells us that the president has canceled the nuclear slickum. Mm -hmm. uh, can you uh, explain the rationale for that? So yes, it was a whole of government decision. There was a, um, a very extensive um, Department of Defense-led nuclear post review working group that considered uh, across the board all of the existing systems or those in, in, in train and uh, collectively made the recommendation to the president that this particular system um, didn't didn't make sense to continue going forward. So it was, you know, several bases for that. I think we've just recently heard um, from the Department of Defense again that it, you know, was uh, a large amount of money. It was blocking out other capacities. It was mm -hmm. not seen as uh, useful um, in several contexts. So it was the recommendation to the president that he accepted. Okay. All right. So this is a question from the audience. How will the war in Ukraine affect the set of issues that the U.S. and Russia discuss uh, in the framework of the secure, uh, stability dialogue, if and when it ever happens. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think it will affect everything that we discuss. Um, I think it affects all of us um, because it is very hard uh, to argue in the arms control community that our that our dialogues have effect if, you know, if our one request that they're taken seriously is so easily um, overturned once our interlocutors leave the table. Um, so I think, you know, I think we need to really rebuild the understanding that these dialogues are in our interest, of course, um, and in, in Russia and others' interests. And so we need to establish that they are effective and that they can achieve something. I think the biggest challenge that I've seen in, in what happened after the SSD in January is some people using this phrase that makes no sense to me, that it was a dialogue for dialogue's sake. Right? There should never be a dialogue or engagement just mm -hmm. for the sake of engagement. You're engaging to build a relationship. You're engaging to encourage communications about your positions and your understandings and to explain what definitions mean to you and where your red lines are and where your challenges exist and what you need to work on. And so when this 
phrase dialogue for dialogue's sake comes back, which I find very harmful. I think that's a challenge to our entire community. Um, and so that, that will affect us. I think we have to start establishing, re-establishing the goodwill of interlocutors at the table early and often. Okay. Um, are there any other failures other than the war in Ukraine that have uh, stymied the dialogue? Or is that, I mean, that's the main reason, right? Well, I mean, that's the most significant one that I can think of. I think uh, um, the challenge um, of our relationship with Russia has become more difficult um, due to disinformation, due to ongoing um, positioning that has become more oppositional over the last you know, several years. Um, I think we have to address all of that. Ultimately, the challenges we face in disinformation affect everyone, including Russia. When you take down the rules-based order um, by trying to deny accountability, by hiding facts, or to create new facts that don't exist, ultimately the lack of rules will come back to bite you. I mean, that's just, it's gonna affect all of us. So these are challenges I think we all have to recognize and try to overcome as we, as we discuss with each other moving forward. Um, can the sanctions on Russia be used to press Russia to the negotiating table? on nuclear weapons issues, uh, including tactical systems. They, and the questioner asks, says, they seem open-ended enough for them to be possible. I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for sanctions, but if, you know, if there is a way to have the sanctions help us uh, engage in good faith conversations, then, then that will be a useful use of them, right? We've seen sanctions have some effectiveness in other arenas to do just that, to force uh, parties to discuss ways to change or lift or allow for some exception to, to sanction regime. So, you know, hopefully they can be utilized for a benefit in that way, but, you know, I, it remains to be seen. Uh, sorry, but I'm having the same trouble Kelsey had reading some of the writing. Um, to what extent has Ukraine's refusal to pragmatically withdraw its application to NATO contributed to the tragedy due to Russia's aggression? To what extent has re re Ukraine's refusal to withdraw its application to NATO contributed to the tragedy of Russia's yeah. aggression? I mean, I think from, from my limited perspective, it seemed like Russia was planning this anyway, right? The timing, mm -hmm. Right, the, the idea that there was any change in sort of Ukraine's NATO status at that time, February 24th, doesn't make sense to me. There was a, that we had seen as the US government had actively shared with others a buildup of capacity in Russia, a buildup of, of, of almost preparation for this war for some time. Um, I don't think that it's realistic to say that Ukraine's actions with respect to its application or non-application changed what Russia wanted to do in this circumstance anyway. Um, I think it was just uh, uh, one of the useful excuses for Russia to try to justify its illegal invasion. Okay. Well, there are many more questions, as one would expect there are, but I, apparently our time is up. So thank you very much. Please thank join you. me in thanking thank Assistant Secretary Stewart. <laughs>
and particularly recently played an important role with the community on New START in 2010 and the Iran nuclear deal in 2015. What I value about ACA is their dedication and commitment to, the, to this work and also making sure these issues are always at the forefront, whether if it's in the news or the media. And those are some of the things that I feel like that they contribute to the community of foreign affairs and international relations. You might not know this, but ACA was in fact Plowshares Fund's first ever grant. And we've been proud supporters for over 40 years. Over the past 50 years, ACA has contributed to bridging diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that's by ensuring that women of color are elevated in this space. And we greatly appreciate the work that they have began, and we're looking forward to another 50 years of continuing bridging this diversity gap. Their briefings, fact-based analysis, and reports make them one of the go-to sources for nuclear information, as well as arms control-related news. So congratulations to everyone at ACA on 50 years and thank you for your excellent contributions to our field. WCAPS would like to congratulate ACA for their 50th anniversary and we're looking forward and hoping that you can do another 50 years of this work. All right, good afternoon everyone and thank you again for joining in. I realize I have the panel that's the post-lunch like nap time crowd, so I will try and keep this, I don't think it'll be hard to keep this very interesting. Um, so my name is Shannon Bugis. I am a senior policy analyst at the Arms Control Association. I have the honor now to moderate the third panel of today about mitigating the dangers that new weapons technologies pose to strategic stability. The inspiration for this panel is a project that we began last year with support from the European Leadership Network called Arms Control Tomorrow. Over the course of this project, we have been, hosti we have been hosting workshops homing in on five particular new and emerging technologies that we see as posing the greatest threat in the near term. Those weapons technologies are new hypersonic weapons, offensive cyber operations, counter space capabilities, and artificial intelligence, and then relatedly to AI, but we kind of split off, is drones and lethal autonomous weapons. The concept of new and emerging technologies is a massive one, and so I want to emphasize up front that some of this tech is already present. So hypersonic weapons, for instance, have already been reportedly deployed for years, and we have seen them used in warfare for the first time in the war in Ukraine. Ultimately, the goal of this project that we're doing with the European Leadership Network is to identify and understand the risks that these technologies pose to strategic stability in the military sphere, and then part two is to take that knowledge and start to develop policy recommendations for decision makers on how to mitigate these effects through diplomatic norms and agreements. A tall order, especially when we're talking about such a massive field, very different technologies, and as you'll see today, Within AI, there's a plethora of different ways you can go. But we're going to try and tackle pieces of this. So for today's panel, we will be diving into the realm of space and AI with our stellar panelists who have been participating in some of the project's workshops, as well as a couple people in the audience we've dragged in to participate with us. So we have joining us today Victoria Sampson, who is the Washington Office Director of the Secure World Foundation. Victoria is going to be our expert on all things space. <laughs> And then Lindsay Rand is here. Lindsay is a PhD student at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy and a graduate research assistant at the Center for International and Security Studies at Maryland. Lindsay is going to break down advanced computing technologies for us, which involves quantum computing and artificial intelligence. And last but certainly not least is Michael Clare, who is a senior visiting fellow on emerging technologies at ACA. Michael will also be in the AI realm, but focusing more on unmanned systems and lethal autonomous weapons. So a few logistical notes before we start diving in with lots of questions for our, for our panelists. 
we will turn to questions from all of you at around like a little after 1.30. So I think 1.30 we'll start collecting them from you. Um, but just same process as before, you're experts at this by now. Write it on a note card, hold it up, someone will come grab it and pass it up to me. And as Kelsey said earlier, I apologize in advance if I butcher anyone's question as I try and interpret your handwriting. And we only have about 50 minutes for this panel, so I will be strict on time. As I warned our panelists beforehand, if I'm staring you down and pointing at my watch, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to provide a helpful reminder. All right, so let's get started. I have two rounds of questions for Victoria, Lindsay, and Michael. Broadly speaking, the first round of questions will focus on outlining the particular risks the panelists' respective technology poses, and then round two, we're gonna get to what are the potential arms control measures to mitigate those risks. So, Victoria, let's start with space. Let's. It's a domain that is far from new, but has been receiving more attention as of late with recent anti-satellite testing, creating a lot of debris. And we've seen that last year with the Russian ASAT test, creating, I think it was close to like 1,500 pieces of debris, still tracking, still seeing the effects today. So, a, a challenge in the new and emerging technology space is just terminology. And it is, all right, what term do we use to say exactly what we think the threat is? So, Victoria, what is encompassed by the term offensive counter space capabilities? Is that the right term to use in this domain? Is there another one? What's kind of the disagreement there? But for the course of this conversation, how would you define it and how should we think about it? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you, ACA, for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. Congratulations again on the 50th anniversary. It's awesome. Um, so talking about counter space capabilities, I think people tend to use them interchangeably with space weapons, with ASAT weapons, and, you know, I, I like counter space, and I'm biased because I'm a co-editor of a report that talks about global counter space capability, so that's the term of art that we have chosen. But the reason why we look at it is that um, really when you're talking space capabilities, there's three places where interference can happen. Um, there are the satellites themselves, there is the broadcast that they're doing, you know, uplink or downlink, and then you have the ground stations. And so anything that interferes with any of that leg, each of those legs could be considered a counter space capability. So it does not have to be placed into space, which I would argue a space weapon should be. Um, so when we're talking counter space capabilities, my organization, the Secure World Foundation, in a report, we have five different categories we look at. We look at what's called direct ascent, basically shooting a missile at a satellite to kinetically interfere with it, so to speak. Um, as, as was mentioned, Russia did in November. Uh, many countries, including the United States, have done as well. Um, then you have what's called co-orbital, where um, the missile goes, or the, the attacking interceptor gets into orbit, and gets close to the satellite and interferes with it there. Then you have directed energy, lasers, things like that. Um, you have radio frequency interference, jamming. And then you have cyber. So you can imagine, you were talking about things that are already there. Oftentimes when we talk about counter space capabilities, I think people's minds go to the things that go boom, because that's very sexy, you know, explosions, is what you think of. But radio frequency interference, jamming already happens. Cyber attacks already happen, and we saw that happen um, this a few months ago when Russia invaded Ukraine. They had an attack of Viasat's um, ground, uh, ground terminals. So, I mean, this is definitely something that's happening now. It's not just a theoretical construct that's happening in the future. Um, <clears throat> and uh, when we started, Secure World started working on this um, global counter space threat assessment in 2018, we did six countries. We did the US, Russia, China, India, Iran, North Korea. And then in 2018, we added two more countries. We added France and Japan. Uh, this year's report, 2022, we added three more countries, Australia, United Kingdom, South Korea. And I think probably next year we'll be adding a few more. And I bring that up only, not just to flag my report, but also to indicate, you know, th there's a proliferation of interest in counter space capabilities going on right now. And I think that speaks to how important space is for our daily lives, for national security considerations, for how our economies function. But it does indicate this is a problem that is not going away. It's getting increasingly complicated. Um, and so that's definitely something to think about for the future for counter space capabilities. So part two of a question yeah. for you, if you don't mind. So what are then the particular risks we should think about? You've laid out the different kind of pieces that fit into the counter space puzzle. Like for instance, like ground stations for me is something where it's like, oh yeah, like you forget when you, counter space also has those facilities on the ground and you have to look at the whole picture. So what are the risks associated with the weaponization or militarization, another terminology dispute yeah. of space? Yeah, pet peeves. So space was militarized in the very beginning. So if we were talking about, oh, we need to prevent the militarization of space, that ship has sailed. 
and that's not a helpful way of looking at things. About weaponization, I think, or counter space capabilities, I think that's much more important because there are ways in which we can stop or limit or mitigate that, and there are, there, there's room for that, but I think there are very real consequences, um, as you brought up, Shannon. So, you know, for example, if you create a large amount of debris on orbit, you, you, hit, you use your interceptor, you hit a satellite, it blows up into a bunch of pieces, um, you know, those pieces are up there for a while. Um, I was a political science major, so as I understand it, the grand scheme of things, the farther up you go, the longer the pieces are going to be around. And we're talking, it could be months, it could be years, it could be decades, it could be centuries. So imagine you have these pieces of debris, some of which you don't know actually exist because they're too small to be tracked, going around at thousands of kilometers per hour. I mean, that's a huge threat to everyone's ability to utilize space, right? Because your satellite can be interfered with. Debris is agnostic. It does not care if you have space capabilities. It, it just says, okay, if, you know, you're in my way or I'm gonna hit it. There's no way to, right, right now, we have no way to remove debris that's up there. So it's up there we're stuck with. Hopefully that's gonna have, you know, so there are processes being worked on for active debris removal. That's a whole other discussion, but for now, we're stuck with the debris that's up there. So you don't wanna create any more. So that's a concern. But as well, I mean, you think back, you know, this is an arms control group, and you're very well aware. And the arms control nuclear treaties, you know, there's always a cutout for national technical means to not interfere with because it was seen to be so escalatory to actually shoot down a satellite that's involved in nuclear command and control, it could lead to some sort of, you know, inadvertent conflict, nuclear conflict, what have you. Uh, that concern is still there, particularly since the proliferation of um, capabilities, it's also broadened in terms of, you know, military capabilities are often carried on non-military satellites. And so you can't say, well, we'll just agree not to hit the nuclear C2 satellites and we'll be good because, well, a lot of military communications are carried on commercial satellites. A lot of U.S. communications are carried on non-U.S. satellites. And so um, there's been a blur between all these different types of satellites and capabilities, which means, again, there could be the possibility of inadvertent escalation where conflict on Earth goes up in space or even worse, conflict in space goes back down to Earth. Thank you, Victoria. So we'll be moving to the world of AI, and I will say this is an emerging technology space I've only recently started to learn about. So Lindsay and Michael are definitely gonna teach me a lot today. So for Lindsay, let's start with you. When I first asked you to participate in this panel, my thought process was just generally artificial intelligence as it works in the offensive or in the military operations. But then through chatting with Lindsay, as she pointed out, given this kind of the, the scope that I wanted to have with this panel, the better terminology would be to talk about advanced computing technologies. So, Lindsay, for those of us unfamiliar with the involved technologies, can you break down what, what is meant by advanced computing technologies, quantum computing, as well as artificial intelligence? Can you kind of paint the picture for us? Yeah, so I like the term advanced computing technologies because it encompasses both hardware and software developments that we're working on right now. And the the interconnectedness between the two groups of technologies. So just because everyone knows about AI, it's a little bit more popular, but there are a lot of um, hardware developments occurring as well, such as quantum computing innovation, um, graphical processing units, and supercomputers. And the interconnectedness comes into play when we're thinking about improving past a certain limit. And so to some extent, you might need some hardware improvements to get better AI. And conversely, you might need better software improvements to be able to function advanced hardware technologies as well. And there's an interesting overlap where there might be a cascade effect where if you get some breakthrough in AI, you could be able to improve your quantum computing or uh, hardware technologies and vice versa. So it's really important to keep an eye on both the hardware and the software in the specter. And then also as well, um, it's a little bit more useful when we're talking about arms control to also talk about tangible and intangible things. <laughs> so it sets me up for later. Excellent. So part two of a question for you then is similar to Victoria, then what are the risks that Maybe we divide it up into what are they, like the hardware risks, what are the software risks that we should think about in the military sphere? Yeah, so for, for the sake of um, risks, we can think of them together, and they're often referred to as enabling technologies, which means they themselves are not the actual instruments of um, I don't know, interference or engagement, but rather they're improving capabilities such as speed or accuracy for the instruments of engagement. Um, and I find there to be about well, I think everything can fall under three categories of um, impacts on strategic stability. So the first is offensive cyber capability improvement. So advanced computing technologies can allow more prolonged 
or um, more brute force engagement in the cyber domain, uh, like prolonged capabilities could be afforded by software such as AI and hardware such as quantum computing can allow for more brute force um, disruption to our current cyber defense capabilities. Um, we can go into greater detail on that in the Q&A, but um, don't have time now. <laughs> Um, but they also allow you to limit your resources and capital that you're investing into offensive cyber. The second area is data processing power, which is something that people refer to as the weaponization of data. Um, and so theoretically, you could improve your ability to process data much more quickly to the extent that you could track or target or detect mobile nuclear technologies more easily such as ground, mobile ground-launched um, missiles or nuclear submarines. The caveat I will give here is that there's a lot of hype in this area, especially with respect to second strike capabilities. And there's a lot of people who want to use this to reinforce second strike capabilities. But I would just say that there is a very big distinction between what is technologically possible when you're considering this um, use and what is practically feasible because uh, you know, you can put up a bunch of sensors and process that data, but there is a deployment feasibility aspect of that as well. Um, that's what my PhD research on, is on, so definitely interested in that as well. And then the final area, which I will leave a little bit for Michael, is the increased speed that um, AI or advanced computing allow and the crisis instability aspect that this might introduce by pushing uh, for faster um, decision making or more automation just by introducing automation in one area. And then the final thing that kind of is overarching for all of these three areas is I think the hard part about these technologies is that right now as we've been, I guess this might be an overarching theme for this panel, but there's not great terminology or um, verification of like specific capability improvements. So there is a huge component of perception and signaling in this sphere where just because someone says they are applying artificial intelligence or quantum, I mean, what does that actually mean? And so that's something I, we can talk about in the arms control aspect. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. That is a very informative and detailed kind of rundown of how we should be thinking about all of this. And definitely terminology is certainly a tough point when it comes to new and emerging tech. So Michael, to bring you into the, the troubles here, so the technology I asked you to focus on is similar to AI, um, and that was not an accident. I did, part of what I wanted to emphasize with having two people in the AI realm is just how absolutely massive and expansive this is, and it's changing and adding. And so that's when you talk about artificial intelligence, there's a million different directions you could go in. So for Michael, we're going in the direction of drones and lethal autonomous weapons, laws for short, or killer robots. So first of all, again, terminology question, to define what, constitute, what constitutes a lethal autonomous weapon and how are laws different from drones and other unmanned systems. I think in a lot of uh, reporting or in some literature it can kind of get conflated into one big thing. So can you break it down for us into what we should be thinking about and how they're different? Okay, so uh, hello everyone. I'm, I'm pleased to be here and, and, and to be a part of such a distinguished panel. Um, and to be part of the 50th anniversary of the Arms Control Association. I was very proud of that movie we saw earlier, I must say, all the accomplishments of the organization that made me feel good as a long-term board member. So um, lethal autonomous weapons systems or laws is not a military term. This is a term invented by policy wonks and scholars and, and uh, diplomats. Uh, but you will not find a line item in the Department of Defense budget for lethal autonomous weapon systems. I've looked, they're not there. Uh, the term that the military uses is unmanned weapon systems, uh, uh, specifically unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs, unmanned ground vehicles, UGVs, unmanned surface vessels, USVs, and unmanned undersea vessels, UUVs. And, and that's what they are funding and, and quite aggressively in the new budget. By the way, an aside, uh, unmanned is the term that they use. There's, there's been some um, discussion of this as, because of its gender 
implications. There, there are some uh, of us who think um, that, that the term <laughs> excludes women from, from the conversation and, and the term should be uninhabited or uncrewed. Uh, but nonetheless, that is the term that, that you know, that, that's used and um, I'll refer to unmanned weapon systems. So what are they? Um, uh, unmanned weapon systems are combat devices that are enabled by artificial intelligence to sense their own environment, to maneuver in their environment, to identify enemy targets, and to shoot at them or to crash into them without human uh, intervention. This is uh, different from drones. Uh, drones are tethered to a human operator that uh, sees through a TV link, uh, looks at, uh, at, at the ground and looks for targets and then chooses to decide whether or not to strike a target. Uh, a unmanned weapons system has the ability to do so on its own without consulting with a human. And, and so I, I think this represents a new stage in the history of human technology uh, because it empowers software uh, with the power of life and death, uh, something uh, really new in human history. And this obviously raises a lot of moral, ethical, and legal questions that our community is struggling with. Uh, many ethicists argue and religious leaders argue uh, that the taking of a human life is an exceptional, a, a, a exceptional act that should only be done under exceptional circumstances and, and can only be done by humans and, and not by a machine because uh, humans can be held accountable if they do so in violation of human norms and human standards. And we indeed have an international criminal court where violators can, can be held responsible, but machines cannot be held responsible uh, to such standards. And so many ethicists believe they should not exist. They should not be allowed to exist. There are also legal uh, questions uh, that stem from the use. Uh, under the laws of war, uh, the Hague and Geneva Conventions uh, say that nations at war have an obligation to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants on the battlefield and to do everything within their, uh, everything they can to prevent unnecessary death and suffering to civilians in the war zone. And uh, many of us believe, many who study this believe, that machines are never going to be capable of making that distinction the way humans can tell who's a civilian and who's not. We just have that ability to do so. Now, advocates of these devices say that in time they will be trained, they will be capable of making this distinction. Uh, but if you look at the history of self-driving cars, they've been millions and millions of miles and, and millions and millions of dollars spent to uh, perfect them and they, they still are not capable of making fine distinctions on highways, not, you know, a combat zone. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of us who uh, fear that uh, machines are not capable of making um, those distinctions. So now that you've laid out some more of the terminology and you all are probably catching on to my, my process here, but can you name some of the risks then? So you wrote an article in Arms Control today about how unmanned weapon systems will play an ever increasing role in future military planning. I'm sure you saw that when you mentioned as you've been going through budget documents and seeing the sneaky names that these, these capabilities are nested under. So what are the concerns that the Defense Department should keep in mind as it's developing these budget proposals, as it's moving forward with these capabilities, and especially as we learned at the end of May that the Pentagon is updating its 2012 guidance on autonomous systems. And they're hoping, I think it was like end of this year, this fall, to have the, the updated 
uh, guidance out. So what would you say, going into that review, how should we think about the risks, and what should the Pentagon be keeping in mind before storming ahead with some of these capabilities? Well, this is what Lindsay Ray raised about strategic stability. And uh, strategic stability uh, assumes that a, a, it, if there's a pair of nuclear armed states that are hostile and engage, are, are in a crisis or in, in a, a non-nuclear conflict, that uh, neither side will have an incentive to use nuclear weapons first uh, because they know that the other side has an invulnerable second strike capability that could still inflict unacceptable harm, and that creates a stable situation. So the worry uh, that some of us have is that some of these devices that the Department of Defense and Russia and China and other parties are developing, ships and planes, uh, uh, unmanned ships and planes, will be equipped with extremely capable sensors uh, that will and also with the ability to operate in packs or in swarms uh, independently and will be able to track enemy uh, su uh, ballistic missile carrying submarines, SSBNs, or for example, mobile ICBMs. And Russia and China depend for their second strike capabilities, uh, vulnerable capabilities on these mobile ICBMs and SSBNs. Uh, and it appears that the US is developing uh, unmanned underwater vessels and unmanned surface vessels and unmanned area of aerial vehicles that will be able to operate in packs equipped with advanced sensors that conceivably could be used for the purpose, conceivably, used for the purpose of tracking these second strike capabilities. Even if it appears that that might be the case, that poses a threat to strategic stability because the other side has to be fearful of that and it might lead uh, the other side to adopt a la launch on warning uh, posture, meaning it would use its nuclear weapons very early in a conflict if it felt threatened. So. Uh, the big worry, and we'll come back to this in your next round of questions, is, is uh, can, uh, should uh, we permit, um, should we encourage the development of these kinds of unmanned systems? These are sort of not what has been the attention of killer robots, which, which, uh, which are striking humans, but the threat that this posed to strategic stability. Great. Thank you, Michael. So that was completing round one of what are, first of all, what are we really even talking about when it comes to some of these capabilities in the space and AI world? Um, but then what are the risks as well? So moving then to round two, my questions will focus more on drawing out ideas on, all right, so we've identified the risks. How can we potentially move to start mitigating some of these? So Victoria, back to you. We'll go back into space for a little while. A few weeks ago, the United Nations Open-Ended Working Group on Reducing Space Threats held its first meeting in Geneva. This working group was created in December 2021 in order to work to prevent an arms race in space. A month prior, um, excuse me, so a month prior to the meeting, the United States announced that it will not conduct, not conduct destructive direct ascent anti-satellite or ASAT missile testing. So these look like two relatively positive developments in the space domain. First, I'm gonna break my questions again. I'll ask you one question, then come back to a second one. But first, just wanna know, how did that first meeting go? How did the Biden administration's announcement on the ASAT test ban play out in Geneva? Was there a big outcome from the meeting or are things kind of still just moving along at a, at a slow pace? Right, thank you. Um, so just contextualize really quickly why those two things were such a big deal. Um, so when you're discussing space security in the United Nations, you discuss at the Conference on Disarmament. And as you all know, the Conference on Disarmament has not nailed the green agenda for the better part of two decades. So that's been an issue for moving ahead these discussions. But the other part is that um, there is not agreement among the major space powers in terms of what is the biggest threat to space security and stability. 
Uh, Russia and China and their allies have focused on essentially space-based missile defense as being the biggest threat, and they want to have a treaty. They proposed the PPWT, which has been in a dead man's slope for you know 15 years, going nowhere, but they keep promoting it. Um, whereas the U.S. and its allies have been talking about almost like it's an environmental issue. Space is congested, it's contested, and they focus on, well, we want to identify just because of the dual-use nature of space capabilities, we don't necessarily want to try and ban them, but maybe we focus on behavior and focus on what do we see as responsible use of space. And so you can see it's been really hard to have any progress if you can't even agree on what the threat is and how you want to handle it. Um, so this movement to create the open-ended working group was the idea that, the, um, that the, any country that was interested, that's the open-ended part, it does not last forever, it's, it's going to be for two years, can come together and talk about what do they identify as the biggest threats to space security and stability, what norms of behavior do they think are important, what do they identify as responsible use of space with the idea, maybe at some point having a resolution, you know, coming out of it, you know, just kind of getting the national community on the same page. And so for me, that was really encouraging. Um, I, had low, I had low expectations, i got to be honest. Um, before, I was just thinking, okay, if it happens, game on, you know. Um, but it happened, and there was actually a lot of good exchange of views, um, mostly productive. Um, some countries could have been obstreperous, and they were not. Um, so I think that was really encouraging. Um, having, and then, of course, the U.S. announcement, the commitment not to conduct um, anti-satellite missile tests. In the future was, came out uh, mid-April. Um, Canada also agreed during the OEWG that they would also commit not to conduct those tests. Uh, Brazil talked about the idea of, ban of not having any ASAT tests. Um, I would say probably about a dozen countries spoke favorably about this. So you could say almost there's a norm emerging that perhaps is some way you're going to go about doing it. So we'll see what, what ends up happening. Um, as I said, this is the, as we said, this is the first meeting. There's going to be three more. The second one is going to be in the September. And the second one's topic is going to be threat. And so that one, it could get a little, a little, a little rocky. We'll see what ends up happening. But you know, I think it's good to have these discussions. And no matter what comes out of the, um, these discussions, I think it's helpful because you can see you know, norms emerging in terms of what countries identify as a responsible use of space. And so even if there's no resolution, you know, I think there's two ways you can have success. Success of process, you know, where you have an agreed upon report but success of ideas. And I'm really holding on to that second part and that countries can come out of these discussions and say whether or not there is a report that came out of a resolution, you know, we saw these ideas of being responsible behavior in space and we want to be responsible space actors and we are going to do that unilaterally and whatever happens internationally, that happens. So we'll see what's coming out of it. Sounds good. So a quick follow-up question sure. before my other one. So at the beginning you had mentioned the conference on disarmament and for people unfamiliar with space, can you just speak briefly to why Kind of this open-ended work, working group is a moment of kind of optimism, I guess, inspiration that there's some new conversations happening given the deadlock in the CD. And then originally my second part of the question was going to be, so now where do we go from here in terms of potential pathways to continuing to mitigate threats in the space domain and pursuing space arms control? Is there, like you said, there's a norm kind of emerging? Are there other other ways of arms control that may be applicable in space? And I just want to say, especially in the new and emerging technology space, the traditional way of thinking about arms control, when you think of like US, Russian, um, like New Start, that is applicable, but also the new and emerging technology space is, I think in a way, redefining what arms control could be. Um, and so how, how should we think about space arms control? Is it different than what most people immediately think of when you say arms control and they think sure. like nukes? All right, so why is it such a big deal for the CD? And when you're talking space in the United Nations, you have two basically Four, you can do it in. You have the fourth committee, the Committee on Peace and Outer Space, that talks about civil space capabilities. Um, and they're, they're in Vienna. They're doing well, um, generally speaking. And then you have the first committee discussions. And that's you know, UN General Assembly. That's this conference disarmament, that sort of thing. And that has just been stuck, um, just having these circular arguments for decades about this. And, um, and in 2018, 2019, I got excited because they were going to have, the UN Disarmament Commission was going to have a discussion. Um, that didn't go anywhere. They were going to have a GG on um, space uh, TCBMs. That didn't go anywhere. Um, you know, so they had all these different options where they could have had something and just nothing was going on. And we weren't seeing any progress. And meanwhile, space is getting increasingly complicated. And so I think this movement to shift the focus away from traditional arms control ideas of you know, banning things you don't like to have out there. I think it's helpful because, again, um, 
for space capabilities, it's really difficult to determine you know, what is actually, I mentioned a counter space capability. It could be something that interferes with a satellite, interferes with the uplink or downlink, interferes with the ground station. So if you're trying to ban that, like what are you gonna ban exactly? There's so many things that are applicable and as well, so much for space capabilities, it's your intention. It's not necessarily the technology, it's your intention of what you're gonna be doing with it. And so that complicates things and that's where things like having transparency about your capabilities, about your policies, about your programs. That can demonstrate good intent by sharing information about responsible behavior. That can demonstrate good intent as well. And so I think that all is po are positive ways to look at it. And then just in terms of you know, ways to move forward, um, the idea between, behind the commitment not to test ASAT um, missile tests, that I think is gathering some momentum because it ties into a concern about not deliberating create debris on orbit, which, which everyone agrees is not good because debris, as I said before, can damage anyone, whether or not you uh, have a space, counter space program or not. Um, there's the idea of uh, like no, con um, no non-consensual close approaches. The idea you don't get up close to another country's satellite without their approval or their understanding because that's a concern as well. Um, the idea of acting with due regard for others, um, trying, you know, again, these, some of these ideas are in the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, but does not mean that it's still helpful and apl applicable. So, I mean, I think there are uh, ways forward in terms of, you know, sharing information, having points of contact for when there's possible you know, conjunctions or close approaches for your space capabilities. These are all good. And the last thing I'll say that's really changing is that particularly for arms control capabilities that are strategic, um, oftentimes they were seen as solely the provenance of geopolitical superpowers. You know, this is a U.S.-Russia thing. Maybe it's a U.S.-Russia-China thing. Okay, we're bringing India in because they had an ASAT test, but no one else, it's not really important. So a lot of countries, the G77, they just didn't see space, counter space capabilities as something that was relevant to them. But you know, uh, that, that attitude is changing because I think there's a growing recognition that every person on this planet is a user of space data. And so every person on this planet has an incentive to make sure that space is not interfered with, that it's not deliberately trashed, and that it's a stable, predictable, reliable domain. And I think countries around the world are starting to recognize this and starting to become more involved in these discussions. So that's where I have hope. Great. I like an optimistic note in the arms control space. I'll take it. Every so often. Yeah, we get it. <laughs> All right, Lindsay, over to you. So, or before I get to Lindsay's question, sorry, just a reminder that we're going to start taking questions from the audience. I have one more question for Lindsay and then Michael. Um, so if you have a question, write it on the card and we'll come around and collect it. All right, so Lindsay, now time for your question. So we have a fuller understanding after um, your answer in round one of what advanced computing technologies, quantum computing and AI technologies, what they are. So let's talk about potential arms control when it comes to these because I will definitely say when I think about, all right, how do we, how do we bring arms control into quantum computing and, and AI, what really does that look like? Because I think like we talked about with Victoria, it may not be the traditional way we think about arms control. So start there and then I have a follow-up question. Yeah, so um, I guess what I think of the two major challenges for arms control on advanced computing technologies are one, that they are dual-use technologies. Um, so there are civil, civilian applications in addition to military applications and somewhat different from space because there are, space is dual use, but it was largely started by the military. A lot of the innovation is occurring in the private sector for advanced computing technologies, um, which just means you would really have to engage those stakeholders and also make sure you're navigating uh, carefully in your, any, I mean, like we said, I don't think bans are really feasible, but like you're navigating your agreements so that you are not impeding civilian applications uh, that could be beneficial or economic, uh, potential economic gains. And then in terms of ambiguity of these technologies, um, this is just always gonna be a problem for the software technologies. Like what do we mean when something is AI, um, unless we really, really hammer down some terms. And in terms of hardware-based advanced computing technologies, this is really a challenge uh, because quantum computing is so nascent and a lot of these hardware technologies are kind of esoteric and uh, kind of being discussed in the technical communities. Um, but there is some movement on getting better definitions, which leads me into what I think the main areas that we need to work on. Um, I don't think that we can talk about arms control agreements per se when we're beginning arms control in this sphere because of the lack of clear definitions. So that seems like 
that would be putting a cart before the horse and you know we'd be making an agreement that might not be lasting or that might not be comprehensive so to lay the groundwork for that um, I think we can pull in different stakeholders and everyone has a role to play so first I think technical members of the community and legal practitioners can help uh, define what we mean by certain increments of application of these technologies as well as metrics and then um, for the security analysts and practitioners which is a lot of us in this room I think we can begin by looking at use cases that we don't find or that we find to be destabilizing that we might want to curb and then we can come up with creative solutions that don't necessarily ban the technology but that might ban either the target such as putting things off limits maybe space capabilities or critical infrastructure or that we put limits on the type of data that we can collect or analyze um, and then third I think policymakers especially for these really nascent technologies really need to begin to build networks um, there's just still a lack of clear leadership uh, or clear um, overarching strategies on these technologies and uh, so Biden has taken some stances and has said well he developed, developed the artificial intelligence research resource group which is kind of a funny name and then he also this May issued a memo on the fact that the US should have leadership in quantum technologies but what does leadership mean and are we sharing that with our allies or with the private sector is it leadership in uh, security relevant technologies or are we leading because we want civilian benefits as well and so I think defining a clear overarching strategy will really need to be to, uh, uh, an, an interagency process in the government which is something that is kind of picking up momentum right now but it's still not there and then we also need to engage the private sector as well as um, international members. Excellent. So then part two. You <laughs> said how an arms control agreement may be too far down the road, so some initial steps would be definitions, bringing in those stakeholders that you mentioned. So where does momentum currently exist towards those types of initiatives? And then secondly, where should we be having these conversations? So with space, with Victoria, we've been talking about the UN, but what's the, base spot, what's the best spot to talk about these capabilities, about quantum and AI? Is it, is it the UN, or there, should it start bilaterally within, between states who are in the game? Where should we start? Yeah, sorry, I realize I might have drifted into your second question. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there is movement, especially with um, these strategies and uh, uh, I guess like, interagency groups that are forming so the quantum economic development consortium is a big um, effort to uh, I guess kind of build consensus on quantum technology I'm not sure they've actually produced anything practical yet but that is the goal and then on artificial intelligence um, this is something where it's been around for a while and so it's a little bit confusing that we don't have more of a clear strategy yet but it is an issue that's being raised so the government accountability office just released a report in March about it identified seven objectives that we need to improve on in defense applications of AI and this is a major issue that's kind of reiterated through each of the points just that we need better strategy making about you know what we mean when we're going to apply it um, and like I said I think like a lot of this really does have to happen with private sector engagement because if we want these to be lasting policies and to be practicable then we have to make sure that we are getting um, private sector uh, stakeholder investment as well Great. thank you Lindsay all right Michael on to you so we're going to talk more about arms control but for lethal autonomous weapons and unmanned weapon systems so the UN Secretary General has joined calls in recent years for a total ban on any lethal weapons that do not require human oversight. But countries that include the United States have not necessarily been open to that idea. So for instance, last year at the UN, a US representative balked at the prospect of a legally binding agreement regulating or banning laws. Instead, the representative was promoting the idea of the development of a code of conduct. So can you talk us through what the what the options are for arms control for laws and lethal and excuse me unmanned systems why is there that tension similarly in some ways I think to space where there's countries coming together to discuss this but then they have different priorities so what are those different priorities and what are the arms control avenues that we can potentially take to handle some of those concerns so uh, 
as I said er earlier, there, there are two sets of concerns. Mm -hmm. There's the legal and moral concerns about taking a human life uh, and the laws of war. And there are also the concerns about escalation and strategic stability. So I'll, I'll just, I want to discuss those separately. You could ask me about that. Uh, the first set of concerns has been the subject of serious arms control discussions uh, in Geneva by, under the auspices of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. That's a funny, funny title, uh, the, the CCW, Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. This is a framework treaty, uh, which is to say it doesn't specify everything that it's trying to regulate, but it, it creates a framework for the parties to the treaty. The US is a, a party, Russia, China are all parties to this treaty, can agree to add protocols to ban or regulate certain specific weapons that are considered especially injur injurious or uh, put uh, civilians at particular risk. And protocols have been added for things like blinding, blinding lasers and anti-personnel landmines. So for the past five years or so, there has been a process underway under the auspices of the CCW uh, to, uh, to, to create a protocol that would ban, or prohibit, regulate uh, the use of lethal autonomous weapon systems. And uh, groups of governmental experts, as in these other fields, have met and have come up with a, you know, a kind of treaty language, what that would look like. However, the CCW operates by consensus, as many of these bodies do, and Russia and the United States and several other states have refused to accept a prohibition on, on these weapons. Uh, the US says uh, that uh, th they perform a useful military task, that the US will always abide by international law, and that Russia and China can't be trusted to do so. Uh, that's what the US says. Um, and therefore, uh, the process underway in Geneva is viewed as deeply flawed. Um, it is, pr it is pr proceeding. The group of governmental experts continues to meet, but many of the groups uh, that have participated in this process, uh, including a grassroots campaign, a civil society campaign, the campaign to stop killer robots, and an, a group of states led by Austria and New Zealand, among others, are looking at an alternative process of going to the United Nations General Assembly uh, where a majority can vote. Um, so there is a process underway that would look at actually a treaty banning these weapons altogether. Um, that, so that's possibly in the future. Um, Thank you, Michael. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Thank you. So now we'll turn to questions from all of you. And Victoria. Well, wait. wait, wait. Yeah. Uh, um, there's a f the follow up question is what about the other dimensions of these devices? Is there any other possible way of addressing them, particularly the strategic risk? And uh, there's no conversations about that. Uh, this was to be a topic that uh, was hoped would be brought up in the strategic stability dialogue that the US and Russia were about to, were in the process of holding. And as we've heard from Tom Countryman, that process has now been suspended. Uh, but the hope is that if that process is re uh, configured, uh, re-established, re that uh, discussion would be held on, on strategies for limiting the use of devices that would threaten the safety of uh, uh, non-nuclear, that is conventional devices, autonomous systems that might threaten the safety of 
second strike retaliatory capabilities, in, in other words, to protect strategic stability. So that's something that we would hope if conversations with Russia are resumed, that that would come up in such discussions. A and if there are ever such discussions with China, that that would also be on the agenda. Gotcha. Thanks, Michael. So we're turning to questions from all of you. Victoria, we'll start with you. I'm gonna try and combine two here. So first part, novel technologies seem to emerge and develop faster than policy can keep up. Given that, would you, ad would you advise emerging tech in the space domain to be included in future nuclear arms control treaties? If not, should they get their own treaties? And then I kind of want to add on to that a little bit because I think a question that often pops up when it comes to the space domain is just, what's the role then of the outer space treaty? How is that setting up potential future space-related treaties? And then the second question comes to verification. So what type of verification will we need for an agreement that is covering cap space capabilities? Because I think there, there's some tensions between, or there's tensions in the discussion about verification over will it be easy? What are the, what are the challenges? How is it different from verification we've seen thus far? So over to you to tackle sure. all of that. <laughs> in like a minute, because I know there's probably other questions we're running out of time. Mm. All right, so really quickly in terms of treaties. So the Outer Space Treaty is from 1967. It's a foundational document. It's nine articles long, but a lot of them are still very relevant today. Um, it's just, how, how do they apply to an evolving space domain? There's a couple other treaties that came out of it. The Astronaut Rescue Convention, the Liability Convention, and the Registration Convention. Uh, the Moon Treaty is there as well. I don't count it. Very few countries have signed it. I don't think it counts as customary international law. Um, but anyways, even if we count the Moon Treaty, I mean, the last treaty that was really done on space stuff was 1979. The time for treaties for space is over, at least right now. And we'll see, maybe we can see some, maybe something coming out of this process with OEWG. But I think it's not a helpful way of looking at things. Um, and so I, I think it's important to bring space capabilities when you're discussing arms control in general, because I think oftentimes we tend to have it in its own silo, which is not helpful. But um, I think in terms of saying, well, we'll, just, we'll have our own counter space treaty. Again, it depends. I think it's, if you're going to be looking at behavior, that might be an option. But if you're looking at banning or preventing the proliferation of technologies, it's going to be really challenging. Um, and then in terms of verification, I mean, uh, thank you for asking that question because I was going to bring it up and I forgot. But the main idea is that space situational awareness is how you verify actions on orbit. And the idea you're using you know, telescopes, radars to keep an eye on things and track them. Now, SSA is good, but it's not 100%. Oftentimes, if things are too small, you can't track them. But it is a way in which you can try and identify you know, what's standard behavior, what's abnormal, identify you know, if someone's acting in an irresponsible manner. You, know, you can do that. And it used to be the US military was the only one sharing this type of information. And it still is. But there's a commercial SSA sector that is very good and very helpful. And I think they provide an, a good alternative or complementary capability. So it's not just US military saying these things are happening. There are other you know, actors without maybe with different stakes in the game that can be part of the conversation. So I think SSA is going to be a, a crucial part. Uh, but finally, the idea is that it's not just, you know, SSA just identifies what's happening. It, it, the humans have to identify patterns. And so that's, again, where these discussions for responsible behavior are really important, because that's when, you, that's when you know, the national community comes up with ideas, what patterns of behavior they like, which they don't like. Thank you. So the one follow-up question. So a, a concept that comes up with, uh, with SSA is space traffic management as well. Can you describe the differences between those? And it seems like your overall point, and let me know if I'm misquoting you here, is just SSA will be useful, but it's not all we need. So we need to potentially add on extra pieces to this for, have, for the human element of, all right, what is the good or the bad behavior in space? Right. So I mean, the SSA, again, it's the idea of identifying actions or activities on orbit. Space traffic management is all different. You know, it's kind of a, a comprehensive, holistic picture. Um, and so right now, there's no one really in charge of space traffic management. There's no space traffic director for the world. Um, you know, it, it isn't there. And there are different concepts between the US and its allies in terms of what kind of space traffic management they'd like to see happening. So I think it, it's part of a broader discussion for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of what we need for verification, SSA is a tool in the toolkit, but it's not the only one. And again, the idea of maybe you can have, you know, you know, borrow from other ideas from arms control, the idea of having pre-notifications, of, of sharing, you know, transparency in terms of policies, in terms of, you know, explaining what we can be doing ahead of time. Um, I think those are all ways in which you can help verify um, good behavior and verify responsible use of space 
in addition to the technical capabilities. Great, thank you. So the next question we have from the audience will be for, I'll ask for answers from both Lindsay and Michael. So very succinctly, do emerging technologies present any opportunities or challenges for advancing nuclear arms control? So this gets to a question that I want to end with later, so maybe I'll have to scrap that one. But essentially, how, how does, so when we're talking about AI, or Lindsay, when we're talking about quantum, so how, what's the intersection between quantum and nuclear arms control? Is there any intersection there um, that we could start to address through arms control? Or do you see these as very, we, we should be starting to tackle it a little bit separately? Yeah, I mean, so that's why I got interested in these technologies in the first place. I do think that they provide impetus for arms control on nuclear technologies because I think handling these technologies will require a lot of resources and adaptability, and I don't see us having the capability to respond flexibly to these new technologies and the strategic risks that they could entail unless we, we begin to reduce the resources we're expending on nuclear. And so I really do think that this is an impetus for nuclear arms control. Um, the problem is, is that when we overemphasize hype and the risks of these new technologies, which we all need to be really careful about if we really want arms control movement, is that if we over discuss the risks and if we don't parameterize it with what is technically feasible, then we might be urging people on to um, create more robust nuclear infrastructure. And so I think that it's really a challenge between trying to be very clear about the limitations of what these technologies will bring, but also using it as an impetus for nuclear arms control. Thank you. And one more follow-up question for you, Lindsay, before we move to Michael. So, Lindsay, would you say that this panel is kind of hyping up the risks, or did we... Okay, I did not like the name. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> are, we, are we contributing to that, or so, if so, what are, what's the caution we should have when we're thinking about this? Yeah, this is something I found from my dissertation research. I just think, like, people are talking about emerging technologies with a lot of good intentions, but if we are hyping it up too much, then you know, the things we produce might be being used to explain why we need more nuclear weapons. So I'm always trying to be careful about the caveats that I bring in when I discuss these new technologies, and maybe we shouldn't have said the risks of emerging technologies, but I mean, I wasn't going to be nitpicky, so it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Michael, over to you. So uh, this is a very interesting discussion. So are, are, is, are we hyping, over-hyping the threat? Uh, I, I think no, because um, I think it's clear that these new technologies pose a challenge to arms control. Uh, they don't fit neatly into the existing arms control regimes in many cases. Uh, you can't count uh, uh, artificial intelligence and, you know, and categorize them how many, you know, th throw weight and uh, how many warheads and the like. So they, they, it does, it, they are new challenges, they do pose new risks, and they pose risks to arms control. So it is forcing us and the program you're leading uh, to think about arms control in new ways. And I think that's a very healthy development. Uh, we've had to stretch our minds and, and, and to think, uh, uh, are there new approaches to arms control that will be necessary to address these these new challenges, and and I and and uh, we're making some progress, but I think we have a long way to go because uh, we we're only beginning to understand the threats that they pose. So I think it, we have to we have to identify the risks that they pose uh, that that are many of them unprecedented in human history. So I want to take a question that was given to Victoria and apply it to the AI realm if I can. So the question about uh, verification in space. So now verification in the AI realm, or is that way too far down the line? What, what would that really look like? So Lindsay, if you want to start with you, and as a reminder, Lindsay is our quantum computing and AI tech person, and then Michael is drones and law. So we'll see, see how if verification is something that can be easily applied in that domain, or do we have to kind of scrap the idea and go with something else? Yeah, I mean, verification is <laughs> to the heart of these definitional questions. Um, so I think it's extremely hard on software capabilities. Um, but that's why, you know, it can be useful to rope in some hardware capabilities and then potentially provide 
they provide tangible objects for verification, um, but the, then you get into the distinction of how much of a software can you use before you need an iterative hardware improvement. Um, so, I mean, that's a very hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, do you have, a, that, have an answer to that well, question? Uh, you know, people are putting their minds to this. Now, one of the programs we didn't discuss on this panel, one of the emerging technologies is hypersonic weapons. And that's an area where, uh, where, where the new technologies would be very useful, I believe, in advanced sensing and computing, would be very helpful in verifying a, a treaty or an agreement limiting hypersonic weapons if that were to come to pass. So we, we could talk about that at, at, at some other point when, when we discuss hypersonic weapons. Uh, but in the area of AI, uh, what I've learned is that a lot of the dangers occur uh, be before things are actually put to military use in the training of algorithms, in the developing the software, the, the uh, risk of, of um, d data, data poisoning, data bias. We've learned a lot about data bias with AI. Um, and, and there could be standards adopted, international standards adopted uh, of, of, in the use of a AI and these technologies. It, it, not as an arms control, but kind, kind of in, in the field of technical standards. Um, the way professional organizations adopt them. And, and there would be ways to um, ha have in international um, standards bureaus that would test and verify that, that the, the standards of, of accountability of algorithms uh, is, is, is held to, to the pledges made. Gotcha. Thank you. So I have one more question for Victoria, and then we have time enough to do a quick, quick rapid round of for a final question I have for all of you. So Victoria, I am impressed by this person's uh, recollection of numbers. So let's see if so. I know. So we'll test you too. So currently, about 3,200 active satellites and about 3,000 inactive. SpaceX plans to spend 42,000 total, more than 80, 800 times this year. What does the privatization of space mean for the domain? Um, Let me know if you need to look at the numbers. No, um, <laughs> actually, those numbers are kind For of out of uh, Actually, there's, um, it keeps changing because SpaceX does keep launching satellites. But there's roughly 5,800 active satellites currently. Um, but SpaceX is not the only one doing a mega constellation or has plans for mega constellation. I mean, yes, they're, they're planning on doing 42,000 more. Um, right now, I think they've launched about 2,200 just in the past three years. So you can imagine, over the past three years, one actor, it's not even a country, it's a commercial actor, has about, you know, what, 40% of the active satellites in space. That's a huge change. Um, but if you look at the various proposed mega constellations, we could see, it just it depends, like really and truly, we could see maybe 100,000 more. Um, you could see Rwanda wanted to, uh, they asked for 350,000 more satellites. I don't think Rwanda even has one satellite currently. Um, so we're, we're, some of this is kind of speculative. It's a spectrum grab, that sort of thing. But I mean, by the sheer dint of things, you know, a certain percentage of the satellites will be launched. And that does change things because space is going from a domain that's primarily the, the, where nation states are the primary actors, where commercial actors are. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it, it shakes things up. And one of the biggest challenges we run into, particularly from a security perspective, is that, you know, when you have a, a, a shared security concern, where do you go? You go to the United Nations. You discuss this in a multilateral format. Uh, SpaceX does not have a seat at the United Nations. In theory, um, the United States um, is, uh, Article 6 of the Space Treaty says that countries have to provide continuing supervision for activities of their citizens. So in theory, the United States would be representing it. But still, you know, I mean, it's difficult. And so that's a real challenge to be, how do you bring in these commercial actors? But more importantly, if they're the ones to be the, pro the predominant actors in space, they need to be on board for what's considered responsible behavior because they're oftentimes setting the norms. They're out there doing this. They're not waiting for the UN to come to some form of agreement. They're just doing their thing and saying, well, you guys catch up when you can. So I think that's a real challenge in the future to be able to bring them in, uh, particularly since a lot of countries see the commercial space sector, um, they don't want them involved in these conversations because they see it as you know, the, the West trying to double dip, you know, trying to have 
more votes and that some countries don't recognize private space sector or they don't have the ability to have a private and a commercial space sector, they just have one. So that, that's been a real challenge as well is how do you incorporate non-state actor perspectives in these international discussions when a lot of countries are highly suspicious of non-state actors being part of the conversation. Thank you. So we have a little less than five minutes left. I'm going to ask a question that is expanding the discussion out a little bit more. Um, and so, Victoria, we'll start again with you. I'm sorry, we're putting you in the hot seat every time. Right. So we've covered a handful of technologies today that have already changed or will change the pace and the weapons used in warfare. So I've asked each of you questions about your respective technology. For, I, would ask, I asked you questions about the, the particular, whoa, words, technology that you focused on, but I'm curious as to what those lines of intersection may be between all these different technologies we see in the massive new and emerging technology space. So for instance, the US-Russian Strategic Stability Dialogue has had a working group that's focused on space, so we see that inter intersection of nuclear weapons um, and arms control and space being brought increasingly in, as well as there's a working group on cyber. So the question for each of you, and try and keep your uh, answer short, which will be difficult with a broader question like this, mm -hmm. but are there options for arms control that encompass more than one technology other than the one you focused on today? And if so, what technology on like your dream list would you say overlaps really well and that you would want to package together into one agreement or some type of arrangement? It doesn't have to be legally binding. What's kind of like your ideal picture if you're just like, all right, the risks between space and something else are pretty similar, so we can tackle that with one arrangement. Victoria? I don't think you can, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Uh, no, right, easy. <laughs> moving on. Um, no, I mean, it's challenging because, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of like for space, the, I mean, with the benefit from space is information, it's data, and so you can see, okay, that maybe has an interwoven connection with cyber, or even, you know, AI, if you're talking, you know, computing and that sort of thing. But it's challenging because I think oftentimes, at least in my experience, um, some of the more exciting topics get precedent, and so you, so you do a cyberspace dialogue. It becomes a cyber dialogue, and then like, oh yeah, we probably need space included in the issue. So I'm, I'm reluctant to combine things. I, I, I think it's important to make sure that you have maybe input from various actors, but if you really want to get down in the weeds and really you know, focus on the issue at hand, oftentimes it can be uh, overwhelmed by a more exciting topic, so that's why. I'm a standalone tech person. <laughs> space only. <laughs> space, space all the way. Lindsay? Yeah, so I mean, I guess this might get at the trend we identified, which are we moving away from controls or agreements on the technologies themselves? And if so, I mean, I definitely think if we are controlling the technologies themselves, these are just really different technologies and you're, then you are undervaluing the technical character, characteristics of each. But if we are moving away from that, then I suppose there might be a world in which we could identify controls on you know, end uses or targets that we would not allow um, uh, infer interference on, such as critical infrastructure. Maybe that is a place to start. Um, and then I would just respond to Michael. I definitely think we agree about the hype thing. So I, I'm only saying we just need to be careful when we're talking about the hype regarding the impact on nuclear survivability and nuclear inf infrastructure. And I guess my main point is I think we definitely undervalue the risks of arm racing instability when we are looking at the technologies. And that's why I have a, a bone to pick about height. But <laughs> we Thank agree you. on that. Thank you, Lindsay. Michael, to you, and you're bringing it home for us. We're at time. So I'm sorry we left you with little time to respond, uh, but over to you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by this question. The, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. You know, it, it does come back to the strategic stability talks, be, dialogue, because I, I, I think we have learned that, that, the, that the old threats that we understand and we can control, uh, you know, ICBMs and, and the like are now being supplemented by a whole array of other kinds of systems that, that, are, that are exceedingly dangerous but don't fit under any, any of our umbrellas for control. And the only way that's going to change is when the major powers begin to discuss them and the professionals from each side meet. And, uh, and so what you really need to have are technical working groups of Russians, Chinese, and Americans uh, who have the technical expertise in these fields 
to sit down with one another and, and to work out uh, how you can um, a, a develop a regime to, to control them. And, and, and so we must have conversations with those countries. And it's, uh, how we get to that is hard for me to see. But um, you know, that's what our conversation today has been about. How do we get to that point? But we, we, need to, we need to work back from, from where, where, I don't know if I'm doing justice to what you said, but to work back from where are the dangers to stability, identifying the dangers to, st to stability posed by these new technologies, and how can we diminish those dangers? Thank you. I know it was a broad question, so thanks, for, thanks everyone for taking a stab at it. So before we thank our marvelous panelists, just up next, we have another guest video from Friends of ACA, so stay tuned. And other than that, please help me in thanking our panelists. Hello, I'm Don Beyer, a member of the US Congress. And I just wanna congratulate the Arms Control Association on 50 extraordinary constructive years of advocacy, thought leadership, and just movement on trying to make the world safe from the, the, the existential threat of nuclear weapons. Thank you to Daryl Kimball and all those people on the board and the, all the givers and all the participants um, for, for trying to help us deal with the deepest and most existential threat that we have. I know we worry deeply about climate change, which will affect the lives of billions, but we don't really fear that climate change will end human life. Uh, arms, an, an unrestricted arms race could in fact do that. The world gets ever more dangerous with uh, Chinese silos and North Korean rockets and even this recent Russian rocket um, we have to be absolutely committed and vigilant to continuing the conversation, realizing that the only possible way forward is political solution, political agreements that will make the world uh, have ever fewer nuclear weapons and make us ever safer. So thank you so much for all your leadership. You're doing the most important work on this planet. Let me just let everybody know that in just a few seconds, we will begin with our second keynote speaker. So please get settled in again. Thanks, everybody. We're about to get started once again.
Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Randy Rydell. I'm a member of the board uh, of directors of the Arms Control Association. And I'm proud former employee of the UN's Office for Disarmament Affairs and current advisor to mayors for peace. It is my pleasure today to introduce Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu, who is marking her fifth anniversary as the UN's Undersecretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs. <laughs> Building on her extensive UN work in humanitarian assistance, she developed the Secretary General Guterres' disarmament agenda and its related plans and has diversified disarmament's base of support. Her office's key missions remain conventional arms control and the elimination of weapons of mass destruction. Together, in Dag Hammarskjöld's words, the UN's hardy perennial. If time permits, you may submit questions on available three by five cards, and I will pose as many as possible. Ms. Nakamitsu, welcome to our own happy anniversary. Well, thank you very much, Randy. So I'm only five years old and you guys are 50. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, obviously I want to start by congratulating the Arms Control Association on its golden anniversary. You know, for half a century, ACA has been providing the world, not just the United States, but the world, with advocacy, analysis, an awareness on some of the most critical topics of international nuclear uh, peace and security, including on how to achieve our common, joint, shared goal of a world free of nuclear weapons. And ACA uh, has also been, more importantly to me, a good friend to the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs. And I must say, friends like you uh, are needed more than ever um, as we find ourselves in a, a very dangerous and very troubling times. Now, the UN Secretary General Guterres has described the war in Ukraine, which started on 24th of February uh, this year by the Russian invasion, as, and I quote, an absurdity in the 21st century and, and simply evil. The world has shaken the international system, the international order, and weakening the guardrails against the use and, of course, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. But it is, in many ways, the culmination of multiple trends that have been festering for years. We see openly hostile relationships between nuclear armed states where distrust has replaced dialogue. Armed spending is at historical levels. Cyber and outer space have become potential new domains of conflict. Game-changing technologies have uh, been repurposed, I must say, to create new generations of conventional weapons with strategic capabilities. They have also lowered the barriers to WMD acquisition, especially uh, in case of biological weapons. The taboo against chemical weapons, as we all know, uh, has been repeatedly broken. So this global uh, disarmament and non-proliferation regime has achieved remarkable results. I think we all need to remember that in shielding, uh, shielding the international community from the horrors of WMD. But the cracks in the facade were beginning to show even before Ukraine. Expensive modernization programs, coupled with expanding roles and dangerous rhetoric, illustrate clearly how nuclear weapons are trending in the wrong directions. Regional conflicts are fueling proliferation drivers. 
The conflict in Ukraine, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, has promulgated the false narrative, I would say, that nuclear weapons provide the ultimate security guarantees. Meanwhile, the disarmament machinery is a um, miasma of dysfunction. Very sad. Divisions over the pace and scale of um, disarmament have widened into chasms. The Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, for so long the bedrock of the entire regime, faces, I must say, unprecedented challenges. Now, the use of chemical weapons in the Syrian Arab Republic and elsewhere has undermined the historic achievements of the Chemical Weapons Convention. The failure to hold the perpetrators of these horrific um, um, acts accountable would really imperil the entire regime, and we are very concerned about that. Now, turning to another WMD, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the global lack of preparedness and demonstrated the disruption uh, that could be caused or if biological agents were to be used as a weapons of war and terror. Yet while it remains a pillar of international peace and security, the Biological Weapons Convention's lack of mechanism to verify compliance severely limits its effectiveness. Now, I would like to come back to these issues of CWC and BWC later because these are extremely important. So, this is really not a pretty picture, as you can see. The guardrails against WMD use and acquisition are simply eroding. The war in Ukraine, which is veiled nuclear threats and near daily allegations regarding chemical and biological weapons has placed a spotlight on existing damage. The question therefore is, what can we do and what should we do? When it comes to nuclear weapons, current events have highlighted two urgent near-term objectives the development of measures to reduce the risk of nuclear war and the reinforcement of the norm against use. But clearly, this is not enough. For our collective security, we need to reverse course and take practical steps along the path to a world free of nuclear weapons. Arms control and disarmament efforts are instruments for our security and not an idealistic dream. None of these objectives can be achieved without dialogue and engagement. Although the current situation makes it difficult, we all know that, the United States and the Russian Federation need to return to dialogue at the first available opportunity, if only to ensure the efficacy of crisis communication. Even during the hottest moments of the Cold War, that is the previous Cold War, these states were able to engage in dialogue. New START will expire in four years. Time is running out to negotiate a successor and that obviously this cannot happen without dialogue and engagement. Now, I hope this doesn't sound too strange in this audience, the world's top arms control experts. After a major crisis, there will always be windows of opportunity uh, for engagement and negotiations in arms control that will open up. Because it is necessary for our security. So, I guess now is the time to, um, in this context, now is the time to identify key issues and prepare ourselves for that day so that the, the moment the window of opportunity opens up, 
we will be able to immediately start substantive negotiations and engagement. And in that regard, I cannot stress enough the importance of the five MPT nuclear weapon states, P5 also, and five MP5 engagement. In an increasingly multipolar co uh, world, coordination amongst these five is essential. They carry special responsibilities. This brings me to the NPT and its 10th uh, review conference taking place in August, just around the corner from now. As I said, the NPT faces unprecedented challenges. Even before the war in Ukraine, Issues like regional proliferation crises, uh, submarine uh, propulsion technologies, and, and diversions on disarmament threaten the consensus outcome. Despite all these, I hope that states' parties still will do their best to strengthen the NPT and, by extension, the regime itself. The treaty, this treaty, is simply that important. The um, absence of consensus would not necessarily undermine the regime. What will jeopardize the MPT and the tangible benefits it provides is if states parties do not approach the review conference with a willingness to listen, negotiate, and compromise. A review conference wrecked by division, um, divisive actions will endanger the central role of that treaty and we don't want to see that happening. Now having said that, I believe there are several areas in which this review conference will still be able to make progress to reinforce disarmament and non-proliferation guardrails. First, all states' parties can reaffirm their commitment to the norm against the use of nuclear weapons. Even under the current circumstances, the P5 or N5 should reaffirm their January joint statement. States' parties should also reaffirm their commitments to strengthening the norm against proliferation and also testing. Second, states parties should reaffirm the commitments they have undertaken as parties to the MPT, especially under the, um, the famous article, that is Article 6. They should engage in dialogue about accountability for the implementation of these commitments. Third, states parties should agree to a set of measures to reduce the risk of nuclear war, including at the nexus between technology and nuclear weapons. These could include transparency and confidence building measures or doctrinal changes. Fourth, the positive impact of peaceful uses is growing, including on the achievement of the sustainable development goals ensuring access for all states parties to these benefits I think would be a clear success. Fifth, the conference should strengthen the safeguard system including through universalization of the comprehensive safeguards agreements and ensuring the IAEA has necessary financial and human resources. Now, 2021 saw the entry into force of a new guardrail, and I speak under the authority of Elaine, of course, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The TPNW's first meeting of states' parties later this month is an opportunity for this instrument to demonstrate its complementarity with the um, broader regime and to strengthen its important focus on the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. The TPNW membership base uh, remains relatively small still, 
And I think even the, the most ardent supporters would agree that its implementation will take some time. But I have been impressed with the pragmatic and principled way states parties are working uh, towards these uh, goals. Now, I said I will come back to chemical and biological weapons issues, so let me quickly talk about what I see as key issues. The scourge of chemical weapons should really have been consigned to history, yet the last decade has seen repeated use of these heinous weapons. 25 years after its birth, the CWC remains one of the most important achievements in disarmament. Through the verifiable destruction of 99% of global declared chemical weapons stockpiles, the CWC has made the world definitely a safer place. However, the norm against chemical weapons has been subjected to repeated challenges driven by failures of compliance, the rise of non-state actors capable of acquiring and using chemical weapons, and developments in science and technology as well. Perhaps most disheartening has been the inability so far, because I haven't given up on that, to hold the perpetrators of chemical weapons use accountable. Such profound viola violations of international law cannot continue to go unaddressed. Recent challenges to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, technical authority, and to the professionalism of the technical secretariat, not only undermined efforts to eliminate chemical weapons, but also the entire disarmament and non-proliferation regime. So let me take this opportunity once again to thank the OPCW's uh, technical secretariat for its professionalism, impartiality, and dedication. And I know that these sentiments are held by vast majority of CWC state parties, but they need to be um, openly demonstrated, um, this support, especially uh, regarding the investigation into and identification of perpetrators of chemical weapons use. I guess ultimately, uh, the only way to reinforce the taboo against chemical weapons is for all state parties to the convention to strictly abide by their obligations. But the Security Council needs to do its job as well by uniting to end the crime of use of chemical weapons with impunity. Now, next year, the fifth review conference of the state parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention will be an important milestone in the life of this treaty and provides an opportunity to strengthen the norm um, against chemi uh, chemical weapons use and also set a um, strategic direction for the OPCW for the next five years and, of course, beyond. So my call is, let us start working together um, to restore fully this very important convention called the Chemical Weapons Convention. Now turning to BWC, the Biological Weapons Convention. As I noted earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic brought into stark relief the need for a fully operationalized properly institutionalized and fit for purpose, if you will, BWC uh, in the 21st century. We should be grateful that no country today professes a desire to acquire biological weapons, nor um, a need for such weapons for national security reasons. But as recent events have shown, we cannot take this for granted. The erosion of the taboo against chemical weapons, I think, sets an alarming precedent. This year, the BWC states parties will hold the convention's ninth review conference, November, December. The review conference is an ideal opportunity for states to unite and strengthen 
this vital convention. The states parties could consider a range of different options, but today let me just uh, mention four um, issues. First, states parties should operationalize the convention by giving teeth to its provisions, supporting peaceful scientific cooperation, enhancing transparency in research, and promoting beneficial applications of new technologies. And states should also establish mechanisms supporting national implementation and investigation and responding to alleged violations. The second area, states should institutionalize the convention, providing it with the necessary human capital to oversee its many functions. Regimes against chemical weapons and, of course, nuclear proliferation and testing already benefit from organizations that engage in outreach, training, and capacity building, and as a result, have larger memberships and higher levels of implementation. Third, the governments must adequately fund the convention, please, ahead of the review conference. They should prepare for a significant increase in the convention's budget. Currently, most of states parties pay less than $1,000 a year. Finally, states should explore how to verify compliance with the Convention's obligations. This issue has, was last explored over 20 years ago, and much has changed in the meantime, of course, both the threats and the technologies to ensure adherence to the rules. So, you need to think about those things. Now, as we seek to strengthen the BWC, we should remember that member states of the UN also has another tool, which, it comes, uh, which when it comes to investigating the use of biological weapons. And this is the uh, United Nations Secretary General's mechanism for investigation of alleged use of chemical, biological, and toxin weapons and this is not related to the BWC. And its mandate relates only to the investigation of alleged use and nothing else. Nor is the mechanism a standing body. It relies on the generosity of member states to maintain its roster of state-nominated laboratories and experts that can be called upon to conduct investigations at a very short notice. However, the UN SGMs um, is currently the only international mechanism for investigation of alleged use of biological weapons. In the absence of the BWC verification mechanism, it is essential, we believe, that the UN SG SGMs independence is preserved and its preparedness strengthened. I want to stress that there are many arrows in the international quiver for dealing with the threats posed by WMDs. Those arrowheads really uh, need to be kept sharp and ready for use. And let me conclude today with my final message. The rapidly evolving geostrategic environment also demands a reassessment of whether the international community has everything it needs to confront the dangers of WMD, whether existing structures should be adapted, and whether we need new tools. In other words, should we not have a new updated vision for arms control and disarmament? And we heard a lot of interesting conversations in the previous panel. In his report on our common agenda, Secretary General of the United Nations stated, and I quote, the risks to peace and security are growing. The world is moving closer to
to the brink of instability. In response, he called for a new agenda for peace that will include, and again I quote, a renewed effort to agree on a more effective collective security responses. And this new agenda will also serve, again, quote, to update our vision for disarmament so as to guarantee human, national, and collective security. This update will need to address many of the challenges that I have mentioned, as well as new elements regarding ungoverned spaces such as missiles or non-strategic nuclear weapons. It should also support efforts to place guardrails around areas that do not have them, from cyber to outer space and artificial intelligence, and we should also look at linkages between these new issues, new areas, with the traditional weapons of mass destruction. We have to also look at responsible behavior, capabilities and qualities, not just quantities and specific types of weapons in silo. Finally, it should seek to ensure that disarmament and arms control take the rightful place as a pillar of the international peace and security architecture. So obviously we have much work ahead of us, so I'm counting on you. Um, I know that um, with the necessary political will and readiness to engage, our goals are indeed achievable. And I look forward in that regard uh, to working very closely with the Arms Control Association and all of its members uh, to this end. I thank you very much and looking forward to some exchanges. Uh, I would like to begin with just one question um, that, that's been on my mind as I look over your resume. Uh, your vast uh, experience working throughout the UN system on humanitarian issues. Starting with the 90, 1996 International uh, Court of Justice advisory opinion, going through the 2010 NPT review conference, and culminating in the 2017 the Ban Treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, one common theme in all of these has been the need to focus on the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of using these weapons and above all, the importance uh, of, the, of the full implementation of international humanitarian law. Given all your background in this, in this area of humanitarian uh, approaches to, to global problems, to what extent will humanitarian law provide a guardrail for future uh, or work in our field of disarmament and arms control in both conventional and WMD? I think it is one of the critical um, guidance that the international community has to receive. It's, you know, the, the arms control and, and disarmament efforts have um, its origin um, from humanitarian efforts. I think, you know, when I talk about the chemical weapons, um, it's very clear that it really in was initially addressed through that lens um, that people, both the civilians and combatants, do not have to, to have unnecessary pains and, and suffer. Um, so I think these humanitarian principles and IHO, international humanitarian law in general, covering you know, the spectrum of disarmament efforts um, from nuclear to, I mean, from weapons of mass destruction to anything else, the heavy weapons being used in populated areas, I think it is probably one of the core uh, directions that we have to remember. And that's why I, you know, uh, really uh, commend the, the TPNW um, states parties um, to refocus this issue in the first uh, uh, conference of states parties. Um, you know, I think one of the, the shocking impact of the, the war um, against Ukraine was that veiled threat 
uh, and, and that really refocused um, you know, potential conflict, uh, consequences of the, the actual use of nuclear weapons. So all the elements are there for us to actually really focus on the humanitarian approach, humanitarian uh, principles. Um, and um, what we have to remember is that it will benefit all of us. It will have a security benefit to all states parties. It will have, of course, you know, the humanitarian benefits that we must uh, maintain and retain. Okay, I'm, I'm informed we have time only for one more question. Oh. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes. <laughs> I, a lot of speakers have uh, address the issue of the training the next generation. And I know that the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs, one of its uh, core missions has been to try to promote education, disarmament education. I wonder if you could say a few words about uh, some of the uh, uh, activities of ODA and disarmament education and also some of the, the challenges that you face ahead. Right. I think you all know the, the famous uh, fellowship program that has been there for so many years that have actually trained so many of the actual negotiators of those disarmament uh, agreements. Um, but building on that, we have now been expanding much more in the education and, and learning training uh, area of our work. Um, you know, number one, of course, uh, in the, the era of online learning, uh, we are preparing and also updating the content uh, of uh, learning materials so that they will be more, um, you know, access uh, accorded to wider group of people who are interested uh, in pursuing these areas. But also, uh, we have created uh, new uh, activities, very much focused on the youth. Um, we've um, uh, created um, um, sort of a youth fellowship program it's not as long as uh, six weeks, uh, but um, the youth um, champions that we you know, select from around the world with diverse backgrounds, uh, very young people, I think um, only up to the university age, um, they um, you know, uh, do the online courses, um, they engage with us, and then they, is, they, they, they have these uh, opportunities to visit the key disarmament locations like New York, Geneva, but also Hiroshima. Um, so it's, um, we've only done it once and then we would definitely continue uh, to, um, uh, to create uh, you know, the, the younger next generation of people who will carry um, our movements forward. What is important is that they bring new perspectives. Um, because I'm only five years old in this job, I think one of the things that we need to do is to bring in new perspectives, things that we have never thought about. And that is very much needed, and I think it was very clear in the previous panel discussions on emerging technologies. There are challenges and security threats that did not exist when those important disarmament achievements, agreements were made. So um, we need new talents, diverse perspectives, people who can you know, talk about what disarmament means in their given local communities and create new movements, why this is important for their security. That way, I think we can empower the, the younger generation with diverse uh, profiles and also create um, you know, a cadre of uh, next generation's negotiators. Uh, I would like to say on behalf of the association, uh, speaking for all of us, the congratulations on your fifth uh, uh, anniversary. <laughs> and also best wishes for the success in all of your work across the entire spectrum of missions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much Thank for coming. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, High Representative Nakamitsu and Randy Rydell. I feel like we should start a GoFundMe uh, page for the Biological Weapons uh, Convention preparations, but we can talk about that at the reception. Um, once again, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, hear from a couple of special friends of the Arms Control Association who lead two important international organizations uh, holding down the work of two important regimes. Uh, and after that, we'll have our fourth and final panel, um, and then a final keynote address from Senator Jeff Merkley. So take a look. It is, 
It is my great pleasure to congratulate the Arms Control Association, the ACA, on 50 years of success in promoting public understanding of and advocacy for effective arms control policies. The ACA has a long history of leadership on public education and outreach. I commend Daryl Kimball, the Executive Director of the ACA since September 2001, and very auspicious start date, Daryl, and the dedicated ACA team for continuing to provide invaluable reporting and analysis on salient arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation issues. Over the past five decades, the ACA has excelled in being a source of timely and authoritative information, analysis and commentary. Through its engagement with policy makers, the press and the general public, ACA has played a pivotal role in informing arms control policy debates in Washington and beyond. I'm particularly grateful for the ACA's project for the CTBT, which was created to sensitise policymakers and the public on the history and the issues surrounding the CTBT. Daryl, I'm ever so grateful for your unwavering and passionate support for the CTBT and its entry into force. Your dedication uh, to achieving a world without nuclear testing is a shining example of the, the championing that we need to finally see the CTBT cross that finish line. As we celebrate the CTBT's 25th anniversary year, I continue to be inspired by the strong support we're receiving from our supporters and champions all over the world, particularly among civil society. We welcome two ratifications in March this year, the Gambia and Tuvalu. I'm delighted to report that we are well on our way to reaching the goal that I set of achieving five or more ratifications during the treaty's 25th anniversary year. By partnering together to promote the signature and ratification of the treaty, we are succeeding in reinforcing the taboo against nuclear testing and reaffirming the key role the CTBT plays in the nuclear non-proliferation regime. ACA has been an instrumental part of this success. The current international security situation, including putting nuclear weapons onto high alert, has underscored the urgent need to strengthen the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation architecture, of which the CTBT is a core element. In this crucial moment, ACA's role becomes ever more important. I wish ACA great success as it continues providing vital contributions in support of effective arms control policy around the world. Thank you. It is a great pleasure for me to address you on this occasion to mark the Arms Control Association's 50th anniversary. On behalf of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, I wish to congratulate you for reaching this historic milestone. This is also a momentous year for the OPCW. We mark the 25th anniversary of the entry into force of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Looking back over the past five decades, the disarmament and non-proliferation field has changed significantly. New treaties, agreements and commitments have been negotiated and adopted to limit, prohibit and eliminate the world's most destructive armaments. Regrettably, we have also seen a considerable number of these instruments weakened or abandoned. Throughout this period, the Arms Control Association has been a reliable source of independent knowledge and a strong advocate for global disarmament. Your advocacy has also been indispensable for chemical disarmament. The Arms Control Association has been a champion of the Chemical Weapons Convention as far back as its negotiation in the 1980s. As such, the Arms Control Association has been a valuable major partner for the OPCW and its mission by raising awareness about the dangers posed by the barbaric weapons of mass destruction. 
in recent years, the international norm against chemical weapons has been placed under increasing pressure. This brutal, abject, absolutely prohibited weapons have been used in multiple countries in the last few years. And this can neither be ignored nor tolerated. Civil society leaders in the field of disarmament, such as the Arms Control Association, have a vital role to play in preventing the erosion of the norm. It is crucial to raise awareness about the new risks we have to face and the Chemical Weapons Convention. Persistently promote its objectives and forcibly condemn their violation. Recent global developments have demonstrated that the gains of disarmament cannot be taken for granted. They must be safeguarded with courage and decision. As a non-partisan voice in the disarmament and non-proliferation field, the Arms Control Association is well placed to continue that defense. For its part, you can count on the OPCW's ongoing support in our collective endeavor to prohibit the use and threat of use of chemical weapons. I thank you for your kind attention and I wish you a fruitful annual conference. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Chris Wing. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Arms Control Association. I have been for quite some time. It's quite an honor. Uh, ACA, in case you haven't noticed, has an excellent staff and it's really a pleasure to be on the board. At the moment, I'm acting chair uh, temporarily and uh, I'm very pleased that I got, got asked to help uh, moderate this panel because in this panel we're moving to a really difficult question but it's not right in the heart of the policy it's not in the heart of what happens in washington so much we're talking about the question of nuclear abolition actual nuclear disarmament and in particular we're talking about given how many things are changing in the world uh, but given the long history of some success on, on addressing nuclear disarmament, addressing abolition, um, where, where, how should we be thinking about popular movements in support of nuclear ab abolition? How should we be thinking about moving toward nuclear disarmament right now? And um, part of what pleases me about being asked to do this is we have a really excellent combination of people. We've got Denise Duffield, who is actually works at a, at a local level. You are co, your associate director of Physicians for Social Responsibility in Los Angeles. Daryl Kimball, who I think you know, have probably met before. Um, and so I'm not gonna waste any time. We've got a short time uh, to introduce him further. Joan Rolfing is the president and COO of the Nuclear Threat Initiative and has been for, gee, 10 years now or so, Joan, longer? Or so. <laughs> a few and, more. And, 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 with, and, and also with solid government experience before that, which is very important. And Ziamian is um, co-director of Princeton's program on social, on, on science and, and science and global security. Yes, yes, I got it. Um, I, I have known that program for a while. I should know the name by now, but it keeps going. Um, Zia is, is one of those um, people that it, it's, it, it's, that's very valuable to the kind of work that we all do because he really does function as a scientist and a researcher, but also is very involved in the community of people who work on these issues. And so this, this panel really will pull in together every sort of work on these questions from many different levels. And um, as I think you'll hear from people, and you will also hear, and, and you will hear from me, I think that any movement ultimately to get rid of nuclear weapons means we're working on every level that we can. Nothing happens only in Washington. And obviously we're gonna be talking, I mean, I should say obviously, we're gonna be talking about the experience. These are all folks who work in the US. We're talking about experience in the US um, especially. 
I just wanted to say two things before introducing people to, or before asking people to, to respond to a couple of questions. Um, we actually collectively have a lot of experience working toward nuclear disarmament, but the moment we're in is very different than the one that many of us, anyway, have worked in before. And there are really two things. I mean, we don't yet know what the global security situation is going to look like. I mean, there's this sense, we have a sense, I think, that things are coming apart. Are, are, are going to be different. They're different now and they're going to be different in a year, perhaps, and further. We, just, but we don't quite know the, what that will be like. And our domestic political situation in the U.S. is profoundly different than it was, or it is obvious to us now that it's profoundly different than it was in ways that, you know, back when I was working, um, you know, in doing freeze work or working uh, in the disarmament movement, or in, in, since then, in, since the 80s, it was one thing, 90s another. It's been, you know, the negotiation of the treaty over the last decade and so on. But once, but we're in a very different moment now. Draws on activist time are substantial. Um, so it's, it's, we really need, we probably need more than 50 minutes to try to figure out what to do. <laughs> but this is how we're going to proceed. Again, I have a couple of questions. I'm going to ask people to respond to them as, you know, briefly. We'll go through once and then we'll come back with a second question. My first question is really, what have you learned from the work that you've done on nuclear issues over the last, um, you know, 10 years or so? Um, what have we learned about um, what, what it takes to have engaged, popular engagement in, in affecting nuclear policy? So that's really the first question. I think we have a lot of good experience to draw on. Before turning to all the difficulties, I wanted, we wanted to hear some about what people think works. So I was going to start with Daryl, then Denise then Zia, then Joan, so, if we may. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And you know, this is uh, the tough question I think that we all need to, to think about, is how we engage the public, um, how we motivate um, ourselves and the organizations that are part of the nuclear disarmament movement um, in effective actions that, that move us out of this very dangerous moment. Um, so uh, let me just mention, um, in my 30, or 30 years of experience, uh, since I was, uh, and even before when I was a, a, a student uh, nuclear disarmament campaigner in the early 1980s, I mean, there, there seem to be several key things that um, are necessary ingredients for uh, putting in the recipe to cook up success on nuclear disarmament, the breakthroughs that have made a difference that we've been hearing about through the course of the day. Um, but before I go through that, that quick list, I mean, I think one of the things that we have to remember is as difficult as things are, um, we have to remember, uh, to coin a phrase from a guy who was also in the White House, yes, we can, because we have in the past um, collectively put together uh, effective campaigns um, with these right ingredients that have made a huge difference. And, because we have done that in the past, despite the problems uh, that we face today, you know, if we're smart uh, and we work together, I think we can, we can change the course of nuclear history once again. So as I said, there are many ingredients that constitute an effective um, uh, nuclear disarmament movement um, uh, that have to be cooked up in the right way, that have to be cooked up in the right time to produce uh, meaningful success. And in the American context, I mean, the way I think about it is we need to have widespread public concern and awareness about the dangers of nuclear weapons and arms racing in a sense that personal uh, engagement, personal action can somehow make a difference. Uh, we need to have bold and smart leadership from the president, not just nice words. We need actual action and commitment uh, and some political risk taking uh, to move the ball forward. Um, we need uh, uh, to, to achieve success, ideally, bipartisan leadership from enough members of Congress. Um, and when we have a coordinated and focused um, and socially and politically diverse set of organizations and networks in Washington, across the country, working together, uh, you know, we can uh, focus public pressure and attention to push policymakers to take the actions that make, make, make a difference. Um, we need the right ideas, and, and there are a lot of ideas out there right now um, about how to move the ball forward. There's not necessarily agreement in what we think of as the movement, um, and I think that's part of our challenge, is how do we come together around a focused set of key ideas that engage the public, 
that are effective and that are achievable over the next five to 10 years. Um, and so, you know, success is also um, requires coordination amongst some of the key organizations and leaders of, of organizations like ACA and NTI and others um, to be working collaboratively rather than competitively. And I think there, there is a lot of collaborative spirit, um, but we don't necessarily have the organizational capacity right now to align our strategies um, within the organizations that work primarily in Washington, but also across the country. And we need to work harder to develop that. And then, of course, success depends on a whole lot on luck, historical circumstances. Um, you know, Mikhail Gorbachev coming on the scene in 1985, 86, 87, that changed the course of history. That's not something we can plan for. But we can plan for, um, as High Representative uh, Nakamitsu said, we can plan for the moment when the engagement between the great powers resumes, when there is an event that focuses the public mind on the problem, just as we've seen over the last few weeks. We need to be ready to um, move forward together uh, to push for the actions that are necessary to, to, to reduce nuclear risk and to move towards the goal of, of uh, the peace and security of the world without nuclear weapons. So those are some of the key ingredients. I think we have to keep that in mind as we, we talk about and think about how we work, work together. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Denise, from where you sit, what have, what have you seen that, that you feel is, you know, help, will help guide us uh, uh, forward? Well, um, for the last four years, I've been deeply involved in a campaign called Back from the Brink, bringing communities together to abolish nuclear weapons. And what this campaign is, it, it is a campaign for nuclear abolition. Um, we organize around a set of uh, a policy platform. We call them policy solutions. But really, it's about making clear that nuclear weapons are a local issue mm -hmm. and that local communities have and must have a say in nuclear policy, which many people don't know that, they, that there's something that they can do about it. Um, the campaign um, also is heavily focused on um, getting, approaching municipal governments and state mm -hmm. governments mm -hmm. and asking them to adopt resolutions that support our policy platform. And that those efforts are led throughout the country by, um, by grassroots activists. So even though there's a, a, a steering committee that, that coordinates back from the brink, it may be Pax Christie that's organizing a resolution in one city. Mm -hmm. It may be Veterans for Peace that's organizing that for another, in another city. Um, many different groups that get involved. What's even um, more exciting is when these groups can build coalitions and, and sort of break down the silos that we're in. Because I'm a local organizer, I worked a lot on the cleanup of the San Susana Field Laboratory. I know how the city politics works. I know how the state legislature works. I have relationships with environmental justice groups, with racial justice groups, with climate groups. So when it came time for the Los Angeles resolution to happen, we could draw on that. We could bring together Habakasha. We could bring the faith community in. We could bring veterans in. We could bring students in. And we did. And what we're finding is that on this local level, this is intended to influence decision makers. Members of Congress have asked us, um, look, I go, I have town hall meetings. I don't hear anything about nuclear anything. We really need you guys to do this. They're not going to make any of these policies a priority if they're not hearing it from their constituents. And so more and more, we want to be able to say, these cities in your district, this, this, this state that you're in, these organizations. The, now we have um, state and local elected officials who are also coming on board. So this is um, you know, Boston, Minneapolis, Tucson, Salt Lake City, Washington, DC, Los Angeles, of course, Baltimore was the first major city to adopt a resolution. These resolutions are also sent on to members of Congress. They're an extraordinarily powerful organizing tool, not just at the municipal level, but also with you know, talking to, to um, other organizations. And so trying to really you know, build our capacity mm -hmm. that way. And again, this, um, we really, really, particularly at this moment that you mentioned, with so much on the line, when, when children are being slaughtered, mm -hmm. when people can't go to church or the grocery store in certain communities without being at risk of losing their lives, that we talk about security in terms of human security mm -hmm. um, and not what, is, what we think is possible, what we know is necessary, and that is the abolition of nuclear weapons. So I'm very excited about this campaign um, and the lessons that we continue to learn as it grows and as it evolves, particularly this uh, distributed organizing model we're doing. And I would say also on the national level, another thing that we're doing also to break out of the silo is we're really, we're, we're partnering with the Poor People's Campaign. Mm -hmm, um, right. They had their moral march coming up on June 18th. And this is, um, they refer to a, a moral fusion model of organizing. 
and it's been incredibly powerful to be in some of the planning meetings and have, you know, um, you know, reproductive rights activists with labor, with environmental, with, um, you know, uh, income inequality, with the faith movement, to have us all together, mm -hmm. because I don't, I think where we're at as a country right now is, single issues are not, <laughs> I, I can't see us having a big win somewhere and all these other things. I think we need to come together. Mm -hmm. So everybody brings their expertise, everybody sort of stays in their lanes, but we join together and we support each other at moments when it counts. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm And what so it's I'm not either about. or. You're not sort of no. saying to, to, a, to a local activist, you know, either you got to work on, on, you know, what no, we're going to do about democracy. No, or we show up for government. each other. So yeah. maybe you're going to, you, maybe you're going to pass a resolution or, or a state legislature bill, and another group is coming there with the housing, something mm -hmm. about housing. We'll stay and we'll, 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 we'll always support on that, yeah. and we'll build the relationships that yeah. we need to move forward. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's a that's a great start. Uh, Zia, what's on your mind? <laughs> <laughs> Failure. I know. That, yeah. All right. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know. One has to accept the inevitable fact that, you know, we, we're celebrating 50 years of the Arms Control mm -hmm. Association. So as people have mentioned, this was also when the first strategic arms limitation mm -hmm. agreement mm -hmm. was signed, mm -hmm. capping the number of mm -hmm. strategic nuclear weapons and the signing of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was said to be proof of the victory of arms control as a way of thinking about national security in the United States. It's also when Nixon went to China. Mm -hmm. It's also the year when the first Stockholm Conference on the Environment took place and made environmental issues a global issue. And look where we are now. We're still here, mm -hmm. the Arms Control Association. The ABM Treaty has been gone for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happened to the proof of the victory of arms control as the cornerstone of American national security mm -hmm. when even the Kissingers and the McNamara said it would be a disaster mm -hmm. to undo this? And Washington undid it mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. As they were told, the expansion of NATO mm -hmm. after the Cold War would be a disaster, and they did it anyway. And the Stockholm Conference We've had thousands of scientists pour their heart mm -hmm. out with explaining the terrible consequences of what we're doing with our fossil fuel economies. Mm -hmm. And yet, here we are. We still do not have anywhere close to the kind of action that would actually address the real problem. And you know, we could go on, we could talk about Roe v. Wade, we could talk about racial mm -hmm. justice, we could mm -hmm. talk about gun violence. So both at the domestic level and at the global mm -hmm. level, we actually have a crisis of the legitimacy of the institutions that govern the world mm -hmm. and yes, this country. Do. Yes, we do. And for me, we have to start with that fact. Mm -hmm. In a funny sort of way, that was also the problem in 1970, 71, 72, because of the Vietnam War. People in America mm -hmm. and many people around the world saw a crisis of responsibility. Are these people and these institutions fit to be responsible for managing our societies and our lives? And when you go back and read the histories of that time, you realize that that sense of a crisis of the legitimacy of how things are managed and who's in charge and how they manage things was central to the politics of that time. And I think we need to reclaim that as a central element of what we're doing now. And I say this with great respect for everybody in the room and who've done so much work, but as the American political scientist Robert Dahl pointed out a long time ago in his book about controlling nuclear weapons, there were these two models, the model of guardianship, mm -hmm. where there is a small group of elite experts, both inside and outside government, that talk to each other and tell everybody, you have to trust us to manage this because we are both reasonable and prudent mm -hmm. and we're doing it in everybody's best interest. So morally, we are you know, okay. And then there is the democratic control issue. And Dahl said that in the United States, you know, the guardianship problem is actually acute. Mm -hmm. And one thing that has happened in the past 50 years in a variety of issues, not just ours, is that we have become part of the structure of guardianship. 
The structure of? Of guardianship. Guardianship. Right? right? Here the professionalization mm -hmm. of dissent mm -hmm. and contentious politics on nuclear weapons and on many other issues has meant that many organizations and ways of thinking are now part of this inside-outside process of people going into the government and coming out to an NGO or a think tank, people writing policy papers for each other, making sure that everybody accepts what is reasonable. And that domestication of dissent limits the kinds of things that we are possibly able to imagine and do with these existing structures. So I'm in a very privileged position that, you know, Princeton is not in DC, it's far away. I sit in a university. So I don't really have to deal with that, all of that aspect of it. But I think it also gives a perspective. And so I think for me, one of the things I've learned is that we actually have to rediscover some of the more difficult challenges involved in contentious politics and actually be much more focused on our own relationship to the structures of power and authority and how they limit what we think is reasonable to talk about and ask about. And here I think that you know, we have to remember that it wasn't so long ago that you had almost all the conditions that Daryl quite rightly outlined. You had a president who talked about the moral responsibility of the United States to give up nuclear weapons the first president of the United States ever to go to Hiroshima. And yet, what changed? And so I want to kind of just conclude by this, that if you wanted to look at an example of things that worked, mm -hmm. I'd point to two things. One is that you look at the success of an organization like ICANN, mm -hmm. right? which was founded based on an idea by a Malaysian doctor taken up by a group in Australia with an agenda that was unthinkable in nuclear weapon states, by and large. Just let's just do zero. No step by step, let's just do zero. And they worked with people outside the United States with great success. And so one thing we might want to think about is that if we can't manage our own governmental structures, perhaps it's time for the United States to ask for help. Right? Hey guys, we are really stuck. Please help send the cavalry. Right? Yep. Please send Elaine Gomez White. Please send <laughs> you know, lots and lots of activists and diplomats and experts yeah. from yes. where you do have experience in how to make fundamental change and help bail us out. And the other thing is you look at the kind of work that 350.org and others mm -hmm. have done. What it took to stop the XL pipeline mm -hmm. and all of these things is those are the kinds of things the peace movement used to do, yeah. Yeah. right? And I think that's the last comment, and I'll stop here, is we need to think about how to reimagine ourselves, not as the nuclear security community mm -hmm. or the nuclear policy community, but ask ourselves, are we a peace movement or not? Mm -hmm. And what is our relationship to the movement and what kind of movement, and where are we with relationship yeah. to that? So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, and I have a feeling we're not going to quite get to the end of the whole conversation here. But, um, but one of the things I wanted to say just before going to, to Joan is that this is the value of having these four folks on the, on the, uh, up here because we're all working from, and if you, and, and, and from different, I mean, what you're talking about, Zia, what, what Denise is doing is, is fundamental to, to, to answering some of the questions I think that you're raising, and we can get to that later. But Joan, so here you are. In Washington. So, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, alas, I might say <laughs> most days. It's pretty hot. Uh, yeah. But I do love it here. Um, so there's way more to say than we have when time we have for. Time. Let yeah. me try and, and hit a couple of key points. And Zia, thank you for your critical assessment. I agree 100% with it. Um, and I would say I think one of the most important things we need to do when we look at our our lack of success, our lack of strategic success over a multi-decadal period is to do a deep dive examination of the, the nuclear system mm -hmm. and all of the elements that hold it in place. What are the key dynamics and behaviors 
that are trapping us in a cycle that we can't seem to get out of. And one of the observations I would make about the system is that it is undemocratic mm -hmm. at every level, right? Power is held by a small number of elite in a small number of states, and yet the consequences of nuclear use affect all mm -hmm. of humanity. And so we do need to find a way to democratize nuclear weapons, to make them more accessible, to reach more people, to make nuclear issues relevant for our political leaders, to make it necessary for them to respond, to learn about these issues, and to help build the political will that we need for change. So I'll make another observation about how do we do that. I think, by the way, I would also just mention, Daryl, that there hasn't always been consensus. There still isn't consensus in our community. We're not monolithic. We are pretty diverse. But there hasn't been consensus around the importance of a social movement. And mm -hmm. so we've, we haven't coordinated well. We have thrown our energy into doing that at, at points in our history. But um, many of us, particularly those of us in Washington, have been playing this inside, what I call an inside baseball strategy, thinking that if we can only persuade you know, a few key decision makers, we can crack the whole nut. We can solve the whole problem. And as you point out, Zia, even having helped bring to the presidency Barack Obama, there were limits to what he could do. And that's what has driven us into a deep dive around, well, if he couldn't do it right, what are the other aspects, behaviors, and dynamics of the system that need to be disrupted? Mm -hmm. um, the, the lack of a social movement is only one. I think mm -hmm. there are entrenched financial interests. There mm -hmm. are entrenched. Uh, institutional interests, there's a very deeply entrenched way of thinking about nuclear weapons that is deeply rooted in a belief in nuclear deterrence. And as long as we remain deeply committed to nuclear deterrence forever, we can never, I mean, it's a circular logic that traps us in having to have nuclear weapons forever. We're never going to be able to reach the end point of a world where nuclear weapons are, are prohibited. Uh, so what, what can we do on the social movement side? I think that must be a priority. And, and NTI, in order to better understand how we can help build a social movement, have done a couple of rounds of deep research, not traditional polling, but a kind of deeper sort of cultural audit to understand how the American public thinks about nuclear weapons. And there were just, I'm going to mention, two top level takeaways from that research. First is that 75 to 80% of the American public is already bought into a world without nuclear weapons. We, we don't really have to make the sale on that. I mean, of course, it would be good if there was more nuance in understanding how bad it might really be. But people already want that world. There is a high level of despair about the multiple crises that we find ourselves in. People are living with a high level of anxiety and despair about the future. But only half of the population, roughly 50%, believe that a world without nuclear weapons is possible. And an even smaller number, about 30%, believe they have any agency at all mm -hmm. to affect that outcome. And one of the biggest obstacles, the biggest roadblock standing in the way of people believing that they have any agency is um, no one has given them a hopeful, feasible vision of what a future without nuclear weapons would look like. So, you know, for me, I think the number one thing we need to do is to be better as a community about conveying the hopeful vision. Let's give people kind of more uh, uh, fidelity about what that vision looks like and, mm -hmm. and help them understand that it's possible. It's not some not in my lifetime pipe dream. I think that's really crucial. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, because okay. I know we want to go to a next phase of the discussion. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't, it's hard to jump right from here to talking about, OK, so what can we do in the next five to 10 years? You know, because actually, we're putting very big questions on the table, I would say. Um, in terms of, of what Joan was just talking about, I mean, this is something that, that permeates our politics. And actually, it's not just recent in terms of there are many things to which 
75 to 80 percent of the people in the country would say, yes, I agree with you, but the, the political, but the decisions made in Washington have resolutely gone against that. It's not just on nukes. It's not just on, on abortion rights. It's not just on gun rights. It's, um, so there is something in the political process that, is, that we cannot actually ignore. Um, and so part of the question, I guess, um, and starting again with Denise, from, from where you sit and, and from working locally, you're describing a situation where you feel that there's energy. And so how do you respond to the things that, that to, the, to, to Zia, the way the, the discussion, the, the points that Zia and Joan have made about the difficulty? Um, because you've been working locally and at the state level. That doesn't yet make it to the federal level. But, oh, but it does. <laughs> but it, 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 it does. It you know, we, 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 for example, I would talk about this, but we, when we met with Adam Schiff to talk about co-sponsoring a no first use bill, mm -hmm. we were able to talk about the resolutions. We were able to bring a very diverse, in terms of arenas, group of people to mm -hmm. talk to him. Um, and, and it's meant, that's what it's meant for. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more with Zia. Um, I don't have an answer for how we fundamentally <laughs> change the government right now. Um, all I know is that all social change movements have dealt, have been, a, have had at their base, at their root, organizing. Mm -hmm. Organizing, organizing, organizing. We work from the bottom up, and that's what we're trying to do, and fuse that with other folks that are also organizing for a better future, for a more ho hopeful future. We have groups like 350, we have um, Sierra Club, we have, other, we have over 400 organizations that have endorsed, endorsed the campaign that we too can call upon, especially the ones that have chapters in different areas. And what, what I think, where we, what we lack the most is capacity. The grassroots is, which the grassroots, which I think holds the key to the kingdom in terms of actually real change, is, is enormously under-resourced. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and we are putting out many fires, which is why I think this coming together um, that's happening in a couple weeks here is, is so important. Mm -hmm. You've seen for the Women's March, for the March on Science, you'll, you'll see signs for everything, immigrants, right? You know, everything in the world you won't see, mm -hmm. peace or nuclear disarmament. Well, we're changing that and mm -hmm. sort of entering into what may eventually at some point need to be <laughs> quite, um, quite confrontational in terms of uh, how our government is structured and true participatory democracy. So I know. Well, and so, but so, Zia. So, what do you what do you think about um, what do you what? Where is your where will your focus be over the next six to twelve months? At, on the assumption that you put your time and energy into things you think are, you know, have some promise. <laughs> um, if only one had the privilege of focus. Given uh, the state yes, of the world, I, yeah, that's a good point. It's, uh, but let, I mean, let me kind of try and follow on from what Joan and Denise just said. It seems to me that what I'm trying to get at, you know, however incoherently, is that for a long time we've thought about nuclear weapons and many other issues as issues of policy. Mm -hmm not as issues of democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I would make the case that right now, all of these different stand, strands of contention, the single issue causes movements, groups that we've mm -hmm. seen struggling in, in, in so many ways um, in the United States and more broadly, mm -hmm. um, do reflect an increasingly shared sense about what I was saying, it's a legitimacy crisis about democracy, mm -hmm. about yeah, people's agree. ability yeah. to shape their lives and the conditions of their mm -hmm. lives. And in that respect, I think that one of the things that as a community, with all our differences, as uh, John rightly points out, and also all the other organizations mm -hmm. that Denise you know, mm -hmm. is working with and, and others are working with, and as I said, you know, uh, folks around the world who are working on on their issues is to think about how to have a conversation about democracy. Because, you know, thinking about, you know, what can we do to move this member of Congress and mm -hmm. get a piece of legislation through a committee, et cetera, et cetera, we've realized how vulnerable all of that is. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, once upon a time, it was assumed that we would go step by step through one arms control treaty after the next arms control treaty. And that, but each one was seen to be an anchor on, you know, a foundation on which we would build the next thing. And it turns out that the rug can actually be pulled out from under your feet. They were not as solid as we had ever imagined them to be. And in the larger scale, the entire world system is going through a profound transition, mm -hmm. which was never imagined in the ways in which many of these agreements were set up. The United mm -hmm. States has moved from a position of parity to hegemony now to being defensive mm -hmm. about the future. And you know, so we have to keep all of those things in mind. Mm -hmm. But I think that we actually need to have a conversation about the need to build anti-systemic movements, mm -hmm. right? go back to the another world is possible kind of ways mm -hmm. of thinking, but relevant to our time now, and actually ask the questions about you know, all of these social movements that we have, all of these policy crises we have, actually are the rise of authoritarianism in many countries and populism all speak to an issue about democracy. And so we have to think about how does the peace movement, the anti-nuclear movement, everybody have a conversation about what kind of relationship do we as people want to have Mm -hmm. about democracy mm -hmm. and the role of democracy in managing mm -hmm. societies. Mm -hmm. That may actually lead to new kinds of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think that would be where I would look okay. for mm -hmm. resources for hope and action. Th though I had told Daryl that I didn't think I'd call on him in the second round, I'm going to because he looks like he has something to say. <laughs> uh, yes, I, well, thank you, Chris, for <laughs> indulging me. You've heard a lot from me today. Let me just let me <laughs> offer a thought in, 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 uh, to build on what Woods is saying. So. You know, we've had a little bit of discussion earlier today in our previous discussions about what the, the war in Ukraine, um, what questions it brings up, um, how we should respond to, to Vladimir Putin's threats of nuclear use. Um, and so when, if we're trying to in, uh, catalyze a conversation about uh, democracy and the lack of democracy in decisions about nuclear weapons, I mean, one of the key issues I think we need to be driving on and asking questions about is um, the, the issue of nuclear deterrence and how sustainable is this concept of international security. Um, if you've been reading Arms Control today, I've been writing uh, about this in the, the post-Russia-Ukraine uh, war situation. But that is the fundamental question that this crisis raises that we need to begin thinking about. And so. Uh, over the next six to 12 months, I mean, this is one of the, the, the fundamental questions that I think we as a quote unquote community, and a community is used with a small c in a broad sense, need to be asking questions about. Um, it is a five to 10 year long strategy we need to be pursuing. That's just, that's one aspect, but I think it's an important uh, aspect. And then finally, you know, just a quick note, as Zia says, the arms control institutions that have been, and, and, and regimes that have been built up over the years that we've been talking about all day, that we're celebrating away, yes, they are vulnerable. We cannot take them for granted. Um, and you know, every generation, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Coretta Scott King, every generation needs to fight for uh, justice and freedom. Uh, every generation needs to uh, uh, win their victories. And, um, you know, so we, we are going forward. We need to think about how we rebuild some of those um, those arms control, disarmament, and not proliferation institutions. Um, we need to build them better, um, but uh, we need to recognize, as you said, Zia, that these are not etched in stone, and we're not necessarily going to be able to build on them step by step. Um, and one of the elements is the TPNW. Uh, another element is the taboo against nuclear weapons, which we talked about this morning. And another element, I think, is the simple idea that nuclear armed states must continue to pursue uh, their legal obligation to negotiate uh, on ways to end the arms race and achieve nuclear disarmament, which is Article 6 of the NPT. So these are some kind of fundamental things that I think can bind us together to try to tackle some of the huge issues that we're talking about here over the next, whether it's 6 to 12 so, months or longer. So Daryl is in some ways is saying that there are actually also some sort of substantive or policy issues that we don't know, that we haven't yet Defined. thought through. Right. So, Joan, for, for you and an organization like NTI, is that a useful, a useful notion that maybe we don't, <laughs> that maybe we haven't figured everything out and there are things that, in addition to your concern about how you 
you build and shape popular opinion. Are there things that in the last 12 months you have come to think, you have come to focus on substantively more, for example, about deterrence? I mean, are you? Oh, we're deeply invested yes, in that yes, right so now. Yes, talk a little about so what you think. totally, it, over the yeah. last several years, yeah. we've been really critically examining and challenging this deeply held and deeply entrenched belief system. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Daryl. Do you see that as an elite discussion? I mean, no, who, who do you no, see as it's, it's, it's not at all. Mm -hmm. at, at the moment, it's more of an internal dis discussion and a, and a discussion in a, in a few small forums mm -hmm. where we find people interested in engaging in this. I mean, I, I agree with you, Daryl. I think it's crucial for us to ask and answer the question about how sustainable is nuclear deterrence. And the smart ass in me would say <laughs> it's, and it's perfectly sustainable. It's like a self-replicating virus. It is so resilient, right? It just keeps coming back and back and back. Uh, but humanity is not resilient yeah. in the face <laughs> of a system which is premised on mass annihilation mm. and therefore has risk baked into its DNA. And when the system fails, and I say when because I think, you know, just mathematically, it's a matter of time before the system will fail and we will uh, have to manage a, a, a global catastrophe. Um, it's possible and shame on us if we cannot as a community um, develop a better system for managing nuclear technology, one that is, uh, when I say nuclear technology, I mean both peaceful and nuclear weapons technology. We're not going to uninvent that. We have to figure out how we can live with it as humanity in perpetuity, but in a way that it doesn't threaten us. And, um, and I think we're lucky to live in a period where for, for all of the challenges that we're confronting today, we have many new tools available to us that we didn't have before in terms of technological tools that can enable us to do detection and monitoring and verification of the non-production of nuclear weapons and that can get us on the other side of this equation to a state of, of nuclear prohibition at some point. So we're investing a lot of our time and energy in um, not only understanding the dynamics that hold deterrence in place to be smarter about how we can disrupt that and get us to a better place, but then also envisioning and developing um, the roadmap, not just the, the roadmap, how we get there, but what does that end state look like? Let's, mm -hmm. let's define it with way more fidelity than just an expression of, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a world without nuclear weapons? And many of us, if not Maybe all of us in this room might agree with that destination, but we have to do more than just uh, state the end point. And I wanted to just say, um, also very briefly come back to the coordination point, because I think it's really crucial that, uh, you know, as a small um, community that's under ex extreme stress at the moment because of the loss of, of funders, um, we have to leverage our time and our effort and our resources by being much better coordinated with each other. So I wanted to footstop that observation by Daryl. I also would say that the, the role of, of organizations that are that are advoc I think of I think of an organization like like ACA as an advocacy nonprofit in Washington. It, when there's a lot going on in the country, then that pulls the advocacy groups into a different relationship with, with policymakers, mm -hmm. and, it, and they serve a different role in relation to, to organizations on the, on the ground. And um, you know, ideally, we will be, at, again, at some point in a situation where, where there is more of that communication, where, where it's... Um, uh, the, where the where the work that's going on locally is connected in a and I know you all talk I yeah. don't mean that there's no connection but it's not yet or it hasn't been for a while that sort of I, I think that the the it's very easy to it's there are important things for nonprofits in Washington to do even when there's not a big huge gr grassroots organization but the strength really lies in being able to link not just with each other in Washington but also 
with each other and with people working around the country and with, and with researchers. Um, I think that uh, you may have noticed that we didn't ask for questions, and the reason was that we had 50 minutes for this panel, and it did not seem realistic. 50 minutes, four speakers, and I was crabby, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I wasn't going to call in Daryl a second time, because I figured he's got lots of chances to say, to say what's going on. But we actually, believe it or not, even though we have just started to scratch the surface, I think we are pretty much winding up. And um, I, wanted to, if, I wanted to give you all a, an opportunity, but not a requirement, if you want to sort of make an, one, one final sort of, of comment. I'll start down at the end with Zia, because he's had to be quiet for a little bit. No, I mean, you just I haven't called, you, you haven't, yeah. It's, sometimes it's good to be quiet. It is sometimes good. Yeah, um, yeah. Abu Camus, Camus famously said that sometimes the only thing you can do is be silent. That's right. That's um, absolutely true. But I think that the issue for me fundamentally comes down to that organizations and groups working in the United States need to rethink their relationship of power with the rest of the world. Yes. And begin by putting ourselves in a position of humility and say, we made the world in large measure the mess is our doing, we can't fix it, mm. please come help us figure mm. out together mm -hmm. how to try and fix it. Mm. Doris Lessing wrote a book along these lines many, many years ago. <laughs> how about you, Denise? Do you have anything you would like to add? I, I, just, I think I'd just like to stress the importance of, of leadership in, mm. in moments like this, mm. leadership mm. Um, on on, on all levels, mm -hmm. you know, some of the um, city uh, councils that we've approached to have people that want to be involved, that want to mm -hmm. be leaders. There used to be a city council member we had named Alex Padilla. He became a state senator, a state legislator. Now he's a state senator. It, it matters, you know, when we're talking to and developing leaders that can be in force multipliers in a good way and hoping that that will also lead to what we really need, which is leadership in Congress. Mm -hmm. People who, like in the freeze movement, took this issue on and made it their issue. And so I think, um, again, this, things seem to be falling apart at the seams, and maybe they will, and something better will emerge from the ashes. But in the meantime, right now, mm -hmm. I think that, that there's a crisis of leadership, mm -hmm. too, and that um, our group is trying to foster that, mm -hmm. to, to be that, but to, to foster that back from the brink, again, at all levels, from community leaders mm -hmm. to uh, elected officials uh, on up. That's great. Joan, do you want to say anything more? Yes. Uh, Please. Which is, you know, we've been talking about really difficult issues during a really difficult period, and it's easy to feel hopeless. And so maybe uh, I will offer a word of hope, uh, dare yeah, I say, yeah. uh, which is, and, and this might sound um, like I'm in denial. Daryl and I were talking about earlier how we get our jobs done because we can tune out the rest of the world on many days. But um, I really believe our community is positioned at a point of significant opportunity mm -hmm. right now. And, it's, and we're at this point because of the multiple crises mm -hmm. that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because of the pandemic, because of the Ukraine crisis, people waking up to uh, you know, how fragile the world is and how endangered we all are. Um, we also see technological trends mm -hmm. that are giving us new tools. And the fact that our field is in crisis is forcing us to rethink our mm -hmm. strategy mm -hmm. and to collaborate in ways that we haven't had to in the past. And so I'm actually very optimistic that we may be on the verge of some very significant mm -hmm. change um, and, uh, and, and that we can mm -hmm. collectively make some significant mm -hmm. impact mm -hmm. in this space. Yeah. So I wanted to share that. Thank you. Daryl, do you have anything you want to now, I think that's a good note to end uh, on, yeah, Chris. Yeah, I do too. I would like to end there. And um, I have been asked to announce that we're going to have, um, don't go anywhere, because we have a special video, video that we really want to share with everybody. So is that right now, Kathy? Where are you? Or somebody? Is that going to happen right now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So we sit here. Do we stay here? Yeah. We get down. We come down. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>just a very quick introduction to the video you're about to see. I don't know if you know that what you're going to see. Uh, maybe I don't. OK, maybe I shouldn't say anything, Brendan. All right, we'll just watch the video. Thank you.
congratulations, Daryl, on 20 years with the Arms Control Association. I so appreciate how it has flourished under your stewardship and leadership. Um, I recall Daryl, uh, I recall first meeting Daryl at a, at a national meeting of the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability. Must have been at least 25, more than 25 years ago. Um, we were both young. Um, and um, Daryl had just gotten a position with Physicians for Social Responsibility and was representing them in the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability. And from the other side of the room, I spotted Daryl as smart. I spotted Daryl as good humored, um, as somebody I wanted to get to know and work with. And nothing in the last 25 or 30 years has changed that impression. Well, I first knew Daryl when I was at the W. Alton Jones Foundation and I funded his work at Physicians for Social Responsibility. So that was before he came to ACA. And then when it was announced that he came to ACA, I thought, terrific. He's a great leader, and this would be a big chance for him to shine. And he, boy, has he done that. He is tireless. He is relentless. And he is always doing what he's doing, not out of personal ego, but to make the world safer. And I think we're all very lucky to have had his service for all these 20 years. When I first started my role at WCABS, it was a great transition and I would like to say that Daryl was one of the first people to reach out to me to want to schedule a meeting when the world slowed back down because of course we were in COVID and those moments represent true leadership. I just like to to again go back to um, you know what an amazing job I think you've done over your time at ACA in um, building trust in kind of the next generation and in young people who want to enter the field. Um, you know I think something I, I look back on and I'm really grateful for is that even when I, I came to ACA, I think I was, you know, just turned 21. Um, you know, you always respected me and, and gave me an opportunity uh, and never let that be an issue. And uh, yeah, I think as a young woman in the fields, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of leaders of organizations who will, will give you that credibility and take you seriously and um, talk to you about the issues. Uh, and, you know, one, I think one of the proudest moments in my career, um, you know, I think was when we were having lunch uh, in DC after I had gone on to ICANN uh, and you, you know, you said to me that you saw a bit of yourself uh, in me and that's, um, you know, the greatest compliment I could, I could ever ask for. Uh, and I hope that one day I can, I can look back on a, a career like yours. Congratulations, Daryl, for 20 years at ACA. It's an incredible accomplishment, and the ACA has been such an asset to the field during your tenure. While I was working at ACA, Daryl would often tell people that he was meeting with uh, once he was uh, done speaking with them that you know, they were now off to, to help save the world uh, because they were important people involved in, uh, in arms control processes. Uh, well, one thing that, uh, uh, that I think Daryl should keep in mind is that if with his 20 years at the helm of the Arms Control Association, uh, Daryl, you're also helping to save the world. I really appreciate how Daryl has taken forward in his career um, his understanding of the U.S. nuclear weapons complex even before he got the job at Physicians for Social Responsibility, he was involved in nuclear weapons complex issues in his home state of Ohio. Um, I do recall a story about um, Frisbees for Peace, I believe it was, um, his, his college team and an action um, uh, at an Ohio nuclear weapons site that, that I heard about at our first meeting. And um, that understanding, that very broad um, perspective has permeated his work at the Arms Control Association. It adds depth, it adds nuance, um, and it's a very holistic understanding that he has. And I think that both ACA and our sort of broader collaborative efforts as a community have both um, 
prospered uh, and 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 done great work together because of that holistic understanding that Daryl carries. I remember at one of the early Alliance for Nuclear Accountability meetings, um, Daryl using a, a a pithy little expression to uh, talk about our collaborative work together. Um, all of the groups in A and A, he called us the forces of good. And um, Daryl, I need to tell you that I love that. And for I don't know, 30 years, however long it's been, I have occasionally used that expression. And every time I say the forces of good, I think of you and I smile inside. Your work in the nonproliferation field is a, such an inspiration for people like myself to tackle on such bigger issues. Congratulations, Daryl, on 20 years. Uh, so Daryl, congratulations on 20 years uh, with ACA and to 20 more. Daryl, congratulations on 20 years leading the Arms Control Association. Uh, the organization's become 50 uh, this year and it's becoming even more important uh, as the world faces uh, an even more dangerous time. Uh, and it, uh, the organization couldn't be in better hands. Congratulations, Daryl. 20 years. I don't think any of us thought when you began uh, that any of us would be in our jobs for 20 years, and now you've done it. So congratulations. So, as I know you're fond of saying, onwards. Well, I am very humbled, and uh, I really appreciate that. That uh, was a surprise, if you didn't notice. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to my staff for that surprise. So I, honestly, I'm a little lost in terms of where we are in our program. <laughs> uh, obviously, I was not supposed to introduce my uh, tribute video there. Um, I do believe we have a... Uh, a keynote address from Senator Jeff Merkley, uh, who is one of our good friends and who is the co-chair of the Nuclear Weapons and Arms Control Working Group on Capitol Hill. Uh, so he has an important message, and we also have a short message from another friend of the Arms Control Association, uh, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. So please watch while I report from Hello, and congratulations. and congratulations to the Arms Control Association for celebrating its 50th anniversary. It's a milestone that's well deserving of celebration, and I wish I were there in person to take part. The ACA has been a source of information and network for me since I was a young scholar working on issues of arms control, disarmament, and nonproliferation. I was especially honored to receive the 2020 Arms Control Persons of the Year Award along with the organization I founded, Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security and Conflict Transformation in recognition of my efforts to diversify the voices heard and expertise in the areas of peace and security. I also had the pleasure of funding the great work of ACA back when I was a program officer of the Ford Foundation and later serving on the ACA board. It has always been a pleasure. I am so very glad to see the ACA continue to be a leading organization focused on arms control, nonproliferation, and disarmament which are all areas I continue to have a strong commitment to. I know you will continue to impact the future of peace and security for another 50 years. Once again, I extend my heartfelt congratulations to the ACA, its leadership, and best wishes on your forward journey. Greetings to everyone attending the 2022 Arms Control Association Members Conference. Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley here. And over the past few hours, you've all heard from experts and leaders about the state of the world today and the powerful need for nuclear arms control, more urgent now than it has been in a long time. So thank you all for being a part of this conversation, which is so critical to the future of our planet. Years ago, decades ago, I worked at the Pentagon and at Capitol Hill in nuclear arms control policy. I chose that line of work because I felt 
that the threat of nuclear war was the greatest threat facing humankind. It was possible that escalation of a conventional conflict or a misperception could lead to a missile launch and it would have the potential to bring about unimaginable global destruction. I thought about what President Kennedy said to the United Nations in 1961. He said, every man, woman, and child lives under a nuclear sword of Damocles, hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation or by madness. Thanks to the work of so many over many years, leaders and organizations like the Arms Control Association, we came to a point where it no longer felt like that sword was over our heads. It felt like we were on a path towards reducing the number and threat of the weapons of mass destruction. Yet here we are in the year 2022 and it feels like that sword of Damocles is back. Here are some of my thoughts. One, Russia is carrying out an unprovoked illegal war in Ukraine, and that's changed the context of the risk of nuclear weapons. Back in March, Vladimir Putin raised the possibility of using nuclear weapons when he ordered his country's nuclear deterrent forces to be put in a heightened alert state, a move I strongly condemned with the other co-chairs of the Nuclear Weapons and Arms Control Working Group, because it threatened to escalate an already perilous situation. More recently, the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, warned the Senate Armed Services Committee it was possible that President Putin might consider using nuclear weapons if he thinks he's about to lose the conventional war. Think how things had come so far since uh, January, because in January, Putin joined other leaders of nuclear armed states in saying, quote, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Meanwhile, China is growing and evolving its own nuclear arsenal. It's estimated that they have more than 200 warheads today, but could have as many as 1,000 by the end of the decade. They're building several hundred new silos, missile silos in the Northwest. They're investing in systems like road mobile ICBMs and better submarine launch ballistic missiles. They tested a hypersonic glide vehicle last year. And then there's North Korea, which has continued to pursue its weapons program launching at least 16 missile tests so far this year, including their first long range ballistic missile since 2017. There's also the potential of other nations joining the community of nuclear armed nations. Certainly, we have to pay a lot of attention to the Middle East where both Iran and Saudi Arabia have the potential to develop materials to produce nuclear warheads. So we find ourselves again in the middle of a tense and frightening moment in world history a moment rife with dangers that could end in unspeakable horror through accident or by miscalculation or by madness. Fortunately, not all is doom and gloom. Not all hope is lost for us to move back from the nuclear brink. Take for instance, one of President Biden's first accomplishments in office, negotiating and finalizing a five-year extension of the New START Treaty with Russia. And, Putin's war crimes have solidified united the world against him, potentially leading to the thing he feared most, a unified, reinvigorated, and expanding NATO acting as a stronger deterrent against the use of nuclear arms. And the Biden administration is working hard to restore the JCPOA. When President Trump pulled us out of the JCPOA, it, well, decreased the amount of time in which uh, Iran could put together the nuclear materials to make a bomb. It made the risk greater. Hopefully, restoration of the agreement can reduce that risk. And to, to accomplish that, we need Russia's cooperation. Of course, that's difficult in the current uh, moment, but President Biden is doing all he can to get to that goal. And I applaud his administration for pursuing the negotiation. We also need to work with Russia to negotiate a follow on to the five year extension of START. After all, how can we ask other nations to forego their nuclear ambitions if the United States and Russia are hell-bent on new deployments? We also need to work with China to establish communication and dialogue, to build confidence building measures so we can minimize the risk of misunderstandings and misinterpretations. Collectively, we can walk ourselves back from the brink of nuclear disaster. Collectively, we can reduce that risk to humanity, but it's going to take all of us 
leaders and policymakers and government working alongside advocates and organizations like the Arms Control Association to find and create practical solutions to these challenges. This is a scary moment in history, but with your help and your advocacy, we can move towards better days. We've done it before and we can and will do it again. Thank you. All right, well, we are uh, very near the end of today's program and I wanna thank everybody for uh, being with us here in the room and online. And um, I just wanted to close with a few brief thoughts, um, uh, closing thoughts and uh, some words of thank you uh, for a number of people here. As Senator Jeff Merkley just said, we've accomplished a lot, but uh, there is certainly uh, much more to be done. Our work is certainly not finished. and. I hope, as you've seen over the course of the day, we've surveyed a lot of uh, key issues, not just for next week, next year, but the years ahead. Uh, the challenges are daunting, they're unnerving in many ways, uh, but as the old slogan from my days before I met Marilea Kelly um, says, um, we must not mourn, we must organize. We must see this as uh, a moment uh, to rededicate ourselves to the work that we've been uh, undertaking, uh, we've got to find uh, new ways as an organization to increase our capacities, uh, to expand our ability to reach new audiences, and to work in collaboration uh, and, and cooperation and in partnership with a diverse range of partners and allies in Washington, across the United States, and, and around the world, because it's going to take uh, all of that to, to, to address the, the deep, deep challenges that we're, we're facing. Um, so we don't have any more time today to go into some of the things that we as an organization hope to be doing over the next five to ten years. We're not going to talk about 50 years, uh, God help us, but over the next five to But you will be hearing more from me and from our team uh, over the course of 2022, our 50th anniversary year, uh, about some of those ideas and plans uh, about how we're going to uh, do even better going forward in the future. Um, and um, you can uh, trust that so long as the board of directors entrusts me with the role of leading this organization, uh, we'll see if it, it's another 20 years, hopefully not. Retirement has to happen at some point. Uh, you can count on all of us to be responding to the latest crises, defending keystone agreements, uh, trying to build on the existing agreements and improve upon uh, the arms control, non-proliferation, disarmament ideas, uh, so that we can achieve those breakthroughs that we're going to need to uh, to move towards the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons and other WMD. Uh, so finally, let me just uh, take a moment to do a few name checks here because a meeting like this in April of 20, uh, or, in, or in June actually, in June 2022, after two years of a devastating pandemic um, that has kept us away from another, uh, taken many lives, um, uh, set us back uh, in many ways. It takes a lot to pull all of this uh, together. And I really want to thank uh, our highly professional team uh, here in the room and beyond. Uh, this was a, a team effort. It takes um, a, a, a real team and a village, uh, an organization to do all the things that we do uh, here at this meeting and, and beyond. Um, so in particular, I want to um, uh, thank Kathy Crandall Robinson, our COO, who has been uh, driving force behind this event, our communications and operations director, Tony Fleming, our graphic design and production editor, who's a real guru on these things, uh, Alan Harris, uh, our longest serving Arms Control Association member, this is a, a, an important factoid, Merle Newkirk, Newkirk, our finance officer, who actually remembers meeting the founders of the organization from back in 1972. Um, and um, I also want to uh, thank Amanda Levin, who's our, uh, with the Capital event, who has been serving as our meeting coordinator, our videographer, Brendan Kaunaki, who has done a fabulous job with the videos, um, including the surprise video that I didn't know about. Um, and all the wonderful people here at the, the National Press Club, which is a lovely place uh, to hold this. And also, I want to thank all of our Board of Directors members who have been uh, really pitching in a great deal with their personal time, their pocketbooks, 
their Rolodexes uh, to, to help um, bring this meeting together to, to, to find the support necessary um, to finance and organize uh, today's very important meeting. So I want all of you who I just named to please take a moment and stand up and be recognized. And it is, it is the honor of my, my professional career to work with such fabulous people. And also, thank you for, for all of you here um, who showed up on what is turning out to be a slightly rainy day, but it's going to get better uh, for this uh, event. And all of you watching online, uh, we really do appreciate the interest. Uh, and concern and, and engagement. And I also want to thank, in particular and finally, uh, the group of more than 60 plus uh, 50th anniversary sponsors listed in the program book uh, who stepped up uh, their level of support at this critical time to help make this um, more robust than usual annual meeting uh, possible. So our work really does depend on your support. Um, and um, we appreciate that from the, from uh, the, the bottom of our hearts. So we will see many of you tonight at our uh, reception uh, beginning at 6 p.m. Uh, in honor of the some 200 people who have worked for the Arms Control Association over its long history. Uh, directions to the event are on the table in the back by the registration table. Uh, and so with that, let me um, say stay healthy, uh, stay energized, Stay safe. Our 2022 annual meeting is now adjourned.